Well, welcome um, to our final review. I'm at this point, it's, I guess, used to seeing all of these familiar faces on our screens. It's yeah. a little bit sad. <laughs> um, Hi, everybody. <laughs> we will, um, we'll get, we'll get going. Whenever you didn't miss anything good, we just got started with our live stream. So we just had Tomi in. I think she left right as you were coming in. So mm -hmm. um, we've just been catching up. Um, all of our students are, have managed to log on, which is great. And we have all our reviewers. So, so far, so good. Um, well, you know, we have some obvious potential for technical hiccups today, but <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I was sat on some review yesterday and Rhea, we sat together on a review together and um, it was great. So I think that's, it's a different interface certainly, but um, I think a lot of students, you know, everybody was really still able to get some really good feedback on their projects. So I am looking forward to that. Um, if I have a couple of slideshows to get us into the content for the reviewers, just to get them quickly up to speed. Uh, I don't know if you're able to read my email. I'm sorry, it was so long, but um, I will, it'll be largely re reiterating that maybe with some images and graphics to really get you up to speed. But before I do that, I would love to introduce to the students, our three reviewers for this morning for our first session. Um, so joining us today um, is uh, Professor Nerea Feliz. And so she's um, part of the interior design faculty here. And um, and so I'm sure you've you've all had her now, right? Last last semester? Yeah, last semester. So um, we're happy to uh, catch up with her and show off all of your accomplishments from this semester. Uh, we also are joined also from the University of Texas, Adam Miller, who is um, uh, joining us. And I think that you're, you are here in a fellowship on gender and equity. Is that right, Adam? Is that? Um, it's, uh, yeah, that's right. It's called the Race and Gender in the Built Race Environment. And, right. Fellowship. So, so we have um, an interesting proposal to put in front of you, Adam. I can't wait to hear your feedback because we are dealing with this like, completely, at least to me, very foreign portion of society at the World Economic Forum. So um, it'll be really interesting to see, oh, uh, hear your feedback today. Um, joining us from lovely, not lovely Chicago, <laughs> is Michael Bodak. I think perhaps most of you are familiar with Michael. Um, he has a long history here in Austin, the University of Texas in the School of Architecture. I've known Michael for quite some time. Um, he is a good friend and a great colleague to have in the field. We've worked together and we've talked together um, and I've never been, um, uh, you know, not impressed by his, his contributions uh, both in practice and in um, academics. So I was so pleased that he could join us today. He completely abandoned all of us in Austin. So he, now is living resolute in Chicago. So and Chicago is not that bad today. It's terrible. Chicago's terrible and and, and he should come back. So that's a, that's my final position. <laughs> so um, without further ado, let me switch over. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. You'd think after six weeks of doing lecturing online I could have this down. Okay, so this semester um, we are looking at the, this is the Design 6 and Technical Studio. Um, I guess it, it, in years past it's been called Sound Building uh, for those of you who have been around UT for a while. Um, the point of this studio is to really take, as I said in that email, to sort of coalesce all of the uh, both practical and theoretical um, aspects of studio that you get from previous studios from design one through five and be able to apply them now with the knowledge that buildings come with building systems, mechanical, plumbing, electrical, all of those good things. Um, and just really piece by piece, figure out what it means to create a set of construction documents and how the design shouldn't necessarily just come first, but becomes integral to that um, 
development. So that in the, the sense of the whole phase of design development being something intrinsic to building assembly knowledge. So those two things coming together then um, in this technical studio, the primary output for the studio is really for the students to develop um, a set of construction documents or you know working drawings really because they're not actually being constructed. So um, in addition to that, the students this sem semester also created a job book, something kind of unique to interior design where it's a, you know, a, a booklet of all of their fixtures, uh, furniture fixtures and other kinds of equipment that they selected for the project. So it was really sort of putting the icing on the cake there that they were able to bring all of that to completion for this, um, this semester. So this is just a slide looking at um, our schedule for today. This morning we'll be hearing from three different groups. The students were able to form firms, pseudo firms, and um, most of the undergraduate students all teamed up and then our graduate students were given the option to work independently. And um, so we'll be hearing from two undergraduate groups today and then one graduate uh, student during this first session. Okay, our topic of study, um, what we use for our case study um, is a pavilion. And then the pavilion is um, a, a pop-up pavilion that's used uh, annually that appears at the World Economic Forum, um, which is held in Davos in Switzerland um, every year in, for, I think it's the, about the third week in January of this year. I think it was the 22nd to the 25th of January. And this image here on the left is just a view out. This is out from the outskirts of sort of that downtown area. Uh, Davos itself is a very, very small ski town. It's a resort town in Switzerland um, of a general population of about 3,000. And uh, when the WEF comes the here in January, um, population grows, but they expect usually about 15,000 attendees. So what actually happens is most of the inhabitants of the town leave uh, they rent out their apartments. It, it's, a, it's actually a huge economic gain for uh, Davos uh, when the WEF comes. So um, the town is completely transformed. Very few of the buildings that they use for the World Economic Forum remain throughout the year. Um, there are a few. So one would be this, um, this uh, the Congress Center. And this is this building here on the right. And this is really this enormous uh, convention hall, essentially. And you'll see the main talk. So if you ever uh, have watched any of the talks that come out of the World Economic Forum, the big speakers, um, Greta, our, uh, the uh, activist, and even our own president came and they, he, they spoke here. So this would be that main forum. Um, other pop-up buildings happen around and they kind of, or they take over places and they um, will give talks and, and workshops and things like that throughout the, um, throughout the convention. Um, and then everything goes back to normal afterwards. It's like almost as if it didn't happen. So if you look, our site is just off the edge of this image here. And so our site is actually just to the left of this building. And I'll get to that in just one second. But the main thing to know here is that this is called the promenade. And the promenade is the main street that runs through um, the World Economic Forum. And that is largely cut off to cars. Um, and so the only people who, who you, you only get foot traffic along that street. And so 100% of the, uh, the foot traffic coming from the large talks leave this building. They come out and they walk along this way. Everything else is cut off to um, pedestrian traffic in this direction. So all of the foot traffic comes right past our building, um, which is, um, so you can see here, this is, would be that center forum here. And then all of those people come along here, and this is exactly where we are. And you'll see in the satellite image that this is, as I noted in my email, it's this sloping hillside. Um, so there is a complete grade change from this promenade down to this level right here, a full story's worth um, of grade change that happens right there. So this is what it looks like for most of the year. They actually have a railing up alongside because of the steep drop off. And there are a couple of residential um, uh, apartment buildings right behind. And then this was that building I pointed at and that satellite image in the center of uh, the Center Congress as well. So this is our site right here. And then this is the building that was built just last year in its place. So you can see how those two things come together. This was the same building 
that was built in 2017. So year after year, the same building is put up. Um, you can see that the fenestration is repeated. It becomes the building itself is a kit of parts. It goes up in the course of six to seven weeks, depending on whether if they can get started in mid-November, they do. Otherwise, they really can't start till the end of November. The month of December is about getting this place dried in, and then they have a couple weeks to finish out the interior. So it's a rapid assembly. The building itself, the shell, is made out of uh, SIPS panels, and then this exterior skin is largely decorative, and so they can do different things with it. It's very much a kit of parts. They have a certain number of windows that go into storage every year, and they are reused. They have the same door. They have the same awning. They, even this fenestration, or this, uh, this wood panels in the exterior um, is reused, and they just I oriented them in a different direction for the for the year. You'll see here, this is the, the drop off here that happens So this hillside that slopes down here, but they it is the sidewalk is even held up with a retaining wall. And so the understructure and uh, of the, the pavilion, um, this is a nice overhead shot just to show how it actually holds off from that sidewalk that retaining wall edge. This is the underbelly of our building. The students themselves did not deal with any kind of structural issues outside of um, what was happening on the internal components of the building, but this thing is really held up with scaffolding. Um, it's, it's really impressive. So all of these flat packed um, piers are sent are dropped on the ground on the grade leveled and then the uh, scaffolding goes up above it and then the rest of the structure is then constructed. Um, Some, just to give you a sense of what we're dealing with here, some of the other players um, that are at the World Economic Forum, uh, most technology, the big names and technology firms are all there and they have their own pavilions. Um, and so the Facebook pop-up pavilion, this is from this past year. This is the Google pop-up pavilion. Um, Amazon Web Services, had they took over an interior of a building and, and completely redid the, the interior fit, finish out. And then even William McDonough, um, for this was this past year was this fourth time where he built this what he called the ice house as an example of the notion of the assembly and uh, disassembly, the pop up pavilion built right on top of an, an existing building in the town. This happened directly across the street from the Palantir Pavilion. So um, given with this slide, one of the reasons why Palantir was a really interesting case study is it actually is one of the major technology firms alongside Facebook and Google and Amazon. Um, the reason why it's not in the news is that it doesn't really have a major public interface, but what they do is they really focus on like system optimization. And so they work with both in the public and the private sector. And uh, I gave Michael Bodick a little bit of an insight into that. Um, they have a nasty reputation for data mining. Um, but what they actually do is they sort data. So the company itself was founded by some of the founders of PayPal who looked at this need of there's this metadata out there that if somebody properly sorted it, they could do a lot of good with it. Um, and so I guess you can translate what good means. But what they their first translation was, we can find terrorist cells in these secret Facebook groups and we can see their, their tracking with their moving their money around but we don't have access, legal access to that data. And so what they did was they would partner with um, companies or the government um, and show them, say, we have this product. Basically, it's a user interface. That we can sort data, give it to the users who own the data already, and then they can do things with it. So the government was actually able to do a lot of counterterrorism work and, and sort of weed out all of these um, terrorist groups uh, on a, at a global scale to avert any kind of um, terrorist attacks. It has been applied at a, a myriad of levels. Other private sector, um, you know, applications where they were able to optimize the distribution of shampoo for a company in Germany. I mean, so they were they can uh, they can strategize whether it's from the production or the distribution or even just um, any other means thereof. They also have a lot of work with NGOs and they are working currently to develop. Um, pick up some of the losses, say in homelessness. So a lot of homeless people, they have tracking numbers and they go and they check into different shelters, but none of that data is linked. And so they've partnered with all of these um, homeless shelters and they're able to then find these people so they don't get lost. They, are, have, they also work in the public health sector now and they have been before, but now they're 
almost entirely pivoted to focus on working with all of these research uh, entities that are happening around the world. The NIH is having their hand in a bunch of different things, uh, but try to just track what's happening with COVID. So what's the data? That There's data out there, but it's really messy and very hard to interpret. So one of the things they're doing is they're providing their product um, to the NIH and they, from there, the NIH is really be able, being able to um, sort more effectively where they should be funding and how where the information is coming in. So they do a lot of good, but because of the black box nature of their product, like they get slammed in the press. Um, not all of it is, you know, undeserved. Um, one of their founders, Peter Thiel, is quite outspoken about a number of controversial things. He's not really an active person in the firm. The CEO is actually Alex Karp, um, who you'll see over here on the right. Um, and he's the, so he's the person who's in Davos and he's the executive in Davos who as um, he can be kind of a, a nut, like he's a super fun person um, in there. And um, so there's, we've sort of designed and built this executive suite around, he comes in, he comes into meetings, he leaves meetings, he goes skiing, he's in a ski garb, he's, but he's also just a, a real professional. And what he's doing is um, in the pavilion, he's out there and, um, you know, talking to clients and trying to make all of these clients meet each other. So he'll come out into the lobby, making what they're calling trilateral connections. So if they can get one client to meet another client, they can just be a catalyst and to make all of these other uh, uh, processes for data for good more effective. So um, this is just a really quick, um, the bare bones of the essentials that went into the building. It's roughly 400 square meters, um, which translates to about 4,300 square feet split across two levels. And so we'll see all of the different pieces um, that went through for each project. Um, and then one very important thing to note is that all of the codes that we used were to US IBC building code standards and then layered on top state of Texas and city of Austin. So that means Texas accessibility standards, all of the local uh, amendments applied for um, electrical code, plumbing code, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, and so given that the potential dry nature of reviewing construction documents for a final review, I asked the students to actually prepare their presentations um, in more of a um, uh, experiential format. So they grabbed the information that they had from their construction documents and immersed that with sort of um, other kinds of experiential presentation renders or et cetera. You'll see other different kinds of formats. But really fundamentally today, I was hoping we could spend more time thinking about how each of their projects really has exemplified uh, the means of using building systems as a design tool. And then at the beginning of the semester, each of them set out a programming statement um, that, that verbalized their design intent for the client. So just at a very basic level, how well have they met that, that initial goal that they established? Okay, I've talked too much, always. So, That was, that was fascinating, by the way. <laughs> we I'm actually spent, really glad you talked all about that. <laughs> we spent a lot of time um, doing research at the beginning of the semester. Um, and so I wanted them to be fully aware where this isn't just a, like a, a pop-up. This is not a study of a pop-up mm -hmm. pavilion. This is a study of branding. This is like the only thing. Yeah. Um, they get slammed in the press. And this building is the way that they, they've just decided, like, we're going to invest all of our branding and marketing in this place. And we're going to one on one talk to people because that filter of just putting it out there, they find to be ineffective. They're like we value privacy. So we're going to evoke that. So if people want to know more about us, they should come to our pavilion, have our amazing coffee that they serve, and we'll talk to them. And so they, they generate a lot of um, business and understanding, really. At the, at the World Economic Forum and versus you know, trying to get published in the Wall Street Journal because you don't know how that will be controlled later. Um, so it is an interesting thing to know a lot about the client. I think Ivy, uh, she did a lot of the client or she did, hosted the client presentation research and she was pretty wide-eyed while she was doing it, <laughs> seeing some of the stuff that was out there. Um, because they do have a lot of power to do things. But one of the things that they're, they're actually very transparent about is they say like our number one goal is we, we value privacy. We value our clients' privacy and we care, for, we care about privacy in general. Um, and so we really take that seriously. And so that's 
that's one of their big fundamental um, core pieces. But okay. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I really, I'm, I'm, I didn't know any about this, anything about this. It's, it's really fascinating from many perspectives. But then, just for us to get a sense, it's so then who, what kind of people are coming to this pavilion and what do they do there? Um, so that's, <laughs> that's drinking. Excellent, <laughs> excellent question. So the, the, the pavilion serves as a very public face. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, um, anybody on the street can come in. You don't need a badge or anything. And they mm -hmm. are met at the reception desk. And all that they ask is they say, if you just leave us a business card, we invite you in um, and to go get coffee. And it's just their own way of filtering who's there to figure out who's there. Um, but um, go get coffee, they serve amazing hot chocolate. And so it's one of those things, they have this open lobby and people, it's actually written up in like, have you had the coffee yet? And so they are known to have the best coffee at the World Economic Forum. Um, but then they do host client meetings and then they don't necessarily aim to get new clients. Um, so they were, you know, I was, I actually got to be there and just kind of quietly observing the pavilion and the activity. And the human use patterns were amazing to study um, what was happening. And, you know, you'll have a team of four or five people, and it's usually one executive. And it's all sorted at the World Economic Forum. So the executive would have a white badge. And then all of their team would have green uh, badges. And those are all their executive assistants and support staff. And so usually, usually it's one executive with about four support staff, um, you know, usually older white male there were a few women they usually wore capes as Megan and I laughed about like um uh so they come in they sit they might be they come in for a meeting and they would come in probably like an hour before their meeting and they would sit in the lobby and have coffee and they would prepare for their meeting that they would be having with Palantir and what's nice about that was say like Amazon was there um Amazon Web Services and then another potential client comes in for another meeting that might be having in a different conference room and they ske can schedule those so that they're specifically going to meet up in the lobby. So you see, um, these are not just random tourists. The, you know, you need a badge to get into the whole town. You can't even, like if you're, you can't even drive through town. Um, they have lots of armored vehicles. I saw more automatic weapons than I've ever seen in my life. Like it's almost like entering a war zone except it's like a protective wall. Yeah, yeah, so I got to go this past January to witness it. Wow. Uh, and this is not, I guess this is not like South by Interactive where there's a lot of hangers on that just kind of come in that are not executive level or whatever. Not executive level. There are some people who do not have badges and they're usually support staff. Um, okay. But they are, um, I mean, there are two ski resorts that, that the bottom of the mountain meet in this town and they, they don't even have anyone skiing because the people aren't allowed in the town, period. So the town is really closed down except for the World Economic Forum. So you see sort of armored vehicles around, parked, and then helicopters coming in and out or private planes um, is really what you see. And my understanding is kind of the, the main people are, they're CEOs of major companies and major political uh, both activists, or I'm sorry, mainly politicians like presidents, et cetera prime ministers. And then there's a, they usually invite a range of celebrities, uh, political activists, whatever that they want to interact with in that kind of tripart, that tripartite connection. Correct. Idea. That, that is correct. And so there are some celebrities, usually those celebrities have ties to some sort of NGO entity. So you see a lot of NGOs. So I was able to sit, you know, there are a lot of um, discussions. So there was the power of purpose, the idea of what is it, the, the, how do we define purpose in the new economy or this next year's economy? How to use tech for good, uh, the role of gender, promoting gender, um, mental health support and wellness in, in the economic field. Um, these, these are all big um, themes, but yeah, I mean, Sheryl Sandberg is yeah, yeah, there exactly. and um, Julian Huff was there too though. So Right. Brad Pitt's been there before, I think, because of his New Orleans stuff. Uh, did a uh, is there an overall theme for a year, or is it there is not? there that so this past year was the um, that was the really the AI and tech for good okay. was a big one, um, and so the those are published by the World Economic Forum ahead of time. 
And so what's nice about the pavilion is it, the timing of the announcement of the themes falls quickly in line with um, how you can create the theme um, within the pavilion itself. Did so, you take the theme into consider? Did anybody take the theme into consideration in their designs? Or was it a, a level above that, I guess, uh, more abstracted? Uh, we didn't have the themes for next year. So we used a lot of the themes from this, this year. We, what we did was they were able to interpolate by looking at the themes from years previous. And they are pretty broad. So okay. there's a way there's, there's usually something about the environment, climate, something about gender, something about tech. And so they were able to, to integrate that um, as a general sort of projection into 2021. Of course, you know, I think it was maybe a week ago, a week and a half ago, I threw it at them. I was like, hey guys, how do you design this pavilion in the age of COVID? And figure so, it out in a week. Figure it out in a week. So I can't wait to see what they came up with. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I think that's actually fair discussion uh, for what we are um, looking at today, because I think that this this idea of projection, like what are our, what are our future applications, um, is a completely fair conversational point. So, um, did we lose Adam? Adam, are you here? I, I don't see him. I think he left. He was done. He said it was interesting. <laughs> he left. What did he say? Um, let me turn, do you have any more questions? I, I'm hoping throughout the presentation, just you'll be able to ask the student questions as well uh, because much of the same rules apply. It, being a relatively tight building, um, they were able to get into a lot of detail, um, but they know, they know their client and they know this place and they know their building very well, so. Uh, I, I missed the part where you said how big it was. I know you said it, but I didn't, I didn't it's, catch it. It's a fun, so pertaining to code, we kind of skated in nicely underneath that 3,000 square foot range because it, it is a multi-story building, but it really is about a, a kind of a private business level down below. Only the um, Palantir employees are allowed downstairs. Um, and, and so that would be anybody helping. So the production team would, is sort of the back of house team that helps the building run. The kitchen staff um, and catering people, they will be going up and down the stairs to the coffee bar, to the kitchen, to the catering kitchen below, and then the, um, the Palantir employees, executive assistants, et cetera. Um, so we are able to separate that. So we're just under 3,000 square feet on the top floor, which helps us a lot for um, protection means uh, for fire and egress. Um, and, but it, and largely the first floor is really a set about assembly type rating. And then below we could, we could achieve a business rating downstairs um, in some in some discrete areas, and so we're about you know thirteen hundred square feet on the lower floor, roughly three thousand on the, the upper floor. Okay. I hope none of you forgot the co uh, to highlight the coffee. It sounds like that needs to be highlighted. The coffee in the was so good. It was so good. It really was good. And I learned a recipe for mushroom tea when I was there, which I shared mm -hmm. with the class, which is fantastic. So <laughs> I'm back. Wow. Uh, my internet dropped. Now, That's, yes, we saw you I'm left us. My cell phone. You were offended and <laughs> then you took off on us. Um, Sorry, I'm back. Just, you know, okay. Joy, if you leave and join uh, as soon as you can, that would be great. So um, we will be getting, be starting today. Um, so if we have, sorry. I'm ready to hand the screen over to Ivy and Lauren um, to get started. I'll share my screen. I think you should be able to share your screen now. Um, and the only thing you missed, Adam, was I just told them, um, you know, if you have any more questions about this, the students know the place at the building and the client very well at this point. So um, yeah. feel free to keep asking questions about that. So. Okay, thanks. Okay, so Ivy and Lawrence, all yours. I'm going to mute myself and you're up. So as Professor Gaskins mentioned, Palantir is working to build a future in which public institutions, commercial enterprises, and nonprofit organizations can use data to function as they were designed to fulfill the mandates with which they've been entrusted, to deliver value to customers and to distribute aid to those most in need. 
Their presence in Davos helps build their, custo their customer base from a business development standpoint, as well as promote their global brand. Palantir's design goals were to refresh the brand, enable su substantive bilateral meetings, engage with leverage existing customers, and set a tone for how brand can scale at other events throughout the year. Lotus Studio, a partner firm created by Lauren and I, intends to engage users through the implementation of sustainable yet engaging systems. Spaces composed of seemingly simple colors and materials have the ability to transform with the application of complex lighting strategies. In our design, we wanted to address Palantir's concerns of educating the public about the good that the company does, as well as expanding their client network by promoting trilateral connections. The main tool employed to address these issues was lighting. Lighting is used not only as a wayfinding tool to guide clients and visitors throughout the pavilion, but also as a technique to engage occupants and shine a light on all the good that Palantir does. We intend to create a space that leaves visitors with the knowledge that Palantir is focused on connections and security. A quote from last year's forum that we used to design our pavilion was, we want attendees walking away feeling like they're in on the secret. The power of data comes from an ability to collaborate with it. So looking at this slide right here, this is the floor plan of the A1 level, which is the main level. Here, visitors enter through the front vestibule where the floor is made entirely of a scraper mat material to help control the tracking of mud that um, persists throughout the building, which, is was, which was an issue in past pavilions. Then the user is greeted by the receptionist here who will take their coat and temporarily store it in the coat room right here. As the user progresses, they enter a more open space here with opportunities to collaborate and establish connections. Here, there are adjustable seatings to accommodate for various size clients. And within this space, there are opportunities for refreshments as well as the coffee bar that Allison or Professor Gaskin mentioned. Leaving the mix and mingle space, there is a corridor here that leads to the restroom. Here, there is a large open hallway that serves as a space to enlighten guests about the company from the presentation, from the, I'm sorry, from the presentation space here to the demo wall here and the winds wall here. Rectangular lights along the floor guide visitors to each of these areas. In the demo space here, clients are given the opportunity to learn more about the company by the projection of interactive videos on the wall. The linear lights on the floor gradually grow in length until they reach the entrance of this space here. The space located here is a presentation room where visitors learn more about the company's mission and their success stories. Across from this presentation room is a winds wall where Palantir showcases their successful partnerships. This faux concrete panel wall here functions as a privacy wall that establishes a, di a division of space between the more open and public spaces here on the left side of the floor plan and the more private collaborative rooms here on the right side where the executive office and meeting and conference rooms are located. The conference and meeting rooms are enclosed by a deep blue sandblasted glass. And this glass addresses a common concern amongst Palantir clients of wanting to be seen, but not heard. The glass enclosement creates a moment of transparency while still establishing privacy through the material's subtle opacity with the sandblasted treatment. Furthermore, the sliding doors of these meeting rooms and office spaces give visitors control and clients control of how private they want them, their meetings to be or how much of it they want other visitors to see. Next is the reflected ceiling plan for the ground level A1. Lighting was used not only as a way to engage visitors with the space, but it was also used as a system of wayfinding. In a similar manner as the linear lights on the floor previously mentioned, the lights on the ceiling are present and above, as well as gradually grow in length in areas intended to be heavily populated or highly engaging. So here you can see that the lights hover above the front reception space here, and they grow in length to guide visitors to the mix and mingle space here where they can establish trilateral connections. In the, collabor in the collaboration spaces, however, which are located here, this method of lighting changes, and these spaces are instead lit by suspended rectangular lights that are sandwiched in between suspended felt panels that provide acoustic absorption in these meeting rooms and conference rooms. So in the lower level, 
Immediately after climbing down the stairs, a visitor approaches the open workspace of the pavilion. And this workspace is adorned with spots for employees to either work along the, the counter on the right side or in the cluster of lounge seating and coffee tables located mainly on the left side. At the bottom left of the plan is employee lounge where Palantir employees can relax and recharge. Above this is the restroom. Right next to the restroom is the private phone nook. And in this nook uh, provides the employees the ability to make private phone calls without interruption or acoustic disturbance. The production office is located on the top left of the plan where the production team can work to keep the form running smoothly. And then to the right of that is the kitchen. In the reflected ceiling plan for the lower level, lighting essentially is provoked by the use of the space. So the rectangular LED lights are populated in the production office, the lounge, the kitchen with the high concentration in the open workspace for the employees. And pendant lights above the stairs gradually lengthen as the users descend the stairs, which is which will be shown in these sections in the next slide. So the first section is a longitudinal section which cuts through the mix and mingle space, the stairway, a small meeting room, and the employee workspace downstairs. It also shows the soffit above the coffee bar and mix and mingle space. And then in the second section is a transverse section which cuts through the restroom and the mix and mingle upstairs and then the workspace and employee lounge downstairs. So to control the copious amounts of mud that is heavily tracked on the floors of the pavilion from the snow outside, the flooring of the front vestibule is composed entirely of scraper mat that prevents the spread of mud to the rest of the building. And this is shown on the left side of this render. After exiting the front vestibule, a visitor enters the front reception area where a Palantir logo made of an acrylic and lit by a sconce light decorates the wall behind the receptionist desk. Behind the reception desk is the coat room where the reception, the receptionist checks in and stores the visitor's heavy winter outer wear. Outer wear. To the left of the reception desk is the mixing mingle space. Here is where the trilateral connections can be made with the modular and movable seating that allow custom configurations for various company sizes and groups to talk not only amongst themselves, but also to those around them. The open nature of the space presents moments that could also result in these connections via the proximity of clients waiting in line for coffee or grabbing food at the food bar. In the next slide, if you hover your camera over the QR code located on the left center of the page, you'll be prompted to enter a round me link. Through a series of panoramas, you can experience the user's point of view of entering this space and sitting in the audience of this presentation room. Um, can you can we wait for just a second so we can do that? I think mm -hmm. that so we we did a couple trial runs with this, and if you take your if you have a phone, if you do. If you turn your camera on, mine's, mine's struggling a little bit. Is there any way you can zoom on that? Oh, I got it. A lot of them will have like an interactive piece where you can then, uh, it, Adam, you're gonna struggle with this one, but uh, you should be able to look around and um, you'll, you'll be able to kind of get a feel for being in the space. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, do you want, people to look around or do you want to wait or how would you like do you want to proceed or it's working for me just so you know okay so but what do you do you take a photo of the iq first so you don't take the photo just hold your camera up to that little qr code and mm -hmm. then your phone will probably prompt you and say well you know, do you want to open this in safari and then you can click on that um and then it will put you in the space and you can kind of move around uh, so i'm in the the main meeting room is that right audio uh, the, the presentation room. Presentation room, thank you. Uh, now, me too. I, I can't do it because <laughs> I'm using <laughs> my phone as a, uh, uh, um, a Wi-Fi hub right now. <laughs> but I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's really good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so 
The wavy profile and the light sandwiched in between each wall panel of the presentation space draw visitors toward the space. These panels are made of glass fiber reinforced concrete, which not only allows the panel to have its curved form, but also is lightweight and easy to install during the short, the short construction time. Recess. Uh, uh, Lauren, one, one cl question for clarification. Mm -hmm. Is it, um, uh, so are you preserving the existing pavilion or is this a totally new pavilion? And then these panels, are they on the inner face of the pavilion or how, how is this? I, I missed this part. Oh, this is the existing building, but like uh, new interior walls and then so mm -hmm. it's a high density fiber board and then um, these little panels, these curved panels are sandwiched with lights in between and like placed on as a surface treatment for the um, HDF. It's all artificial light, what we're seeing and even when yes. it's in the perimeter. It's, yes, yes. Yes, Nerea, so the, the building itself is, uh, it's made out of these six panels and so it's really modular construction. So the wind, I let them move the entrance around and then the windows around and they just had a tally on what they could use in different places. And so the shell itself is presumed to be the same or very similar. Um, and then the interior is completely, uh, you know, carte blanche for them. Great. Recessed rectangular lights stretch across both sides of the room, making it appear as if the lights on the wall and the ceiling are continuous. In the next slide, um, in homage to a quote from a, the previous World Economic Forum, which was mentioned earlier, the first wall a visitor encounters once they walk through the glass doors that lead to the collaboration space includes the quote, the power of data comes from collaboration. This message is written in the neon tubular lights that emphasize the quote's power. There are uniform ceiling and wall treatments in the meeting rooms, as well as executive office and conference room. Either gray or blue, the felt patterned wall treatment is essentially comprised of two simple linear patterns, which are repeated and rotated. Acoustic felt panels are suspended from the ceiling of these rooms where LED lights are also suspended and sandwiched between the felt panels. The render on the bottom, bottom right shows how the rectangular lights and felt panels on the ceiling, as well as a felt panel wall treatment, all provide a linear quality that complements the wooden slats of the exterior building. This render shows the open working environment for Palantir employees to exclusively work without the presence of guests. And this space is located downstairs in the A0 level. And that is our presentation. Thank you. So I think we'll just open it up to the reviewers if you have any um, follow-up questions or if there's an, another slide that you'd like them to land on for in, uh, to start the conversation. Um, maybe, uh, Ivy, if you could go to the, just the first floor and... Sorry, the first floor. The entry level plan. Um, first of all, I'd just like to commend you both on uh, just actually producing like very detailed um, uh, design development sort of <clears throat> almost construction level. I mean, they are, they are, uh, they are construction uh, detailed drawings and they, they're really um, thoughtful. I, I appreciate that you're actually using the language of, or you're using material lang materials that are real and are actually used for like um, pop-up type uh, designs and like exhibition designs. So like you're using like GFRC, which is like very commonly used for um, applications like this. So it's like a very sophisticated understanding of like this this particular genre of 
of, um, I guess you could say building design is kind of in between a building and an exhibition, um, which I think is really fascinating. And I, I commend you on that. And it was very clear in, uh, anyway, I was, I wanted to just in on the sort of core space that takes you to the stairs down, um, because like, I, I think as a formal move, the, the idea of, of um, these, uh, these fins coming out from the wall is, is, is definitely the strongest, I guess, like s space maker potentially, that is um, not just like a rectilinear wall. Um, and so I was wondering like, when you were talking about putting that, that faux concrete separating wall between the conference area and the reception area, I was wondering, you know, why not, like, it seems a, a bit redundant when you already have developed um, your own language for uh, potentially like filtering people and filtering them into a more private area. So like, um, I think th those fins basically could do that for you. like. Maybe they take you around a turn. Maybe, um, I mean, it already is compressing and expanding, but I feel like um, that wall simply could have been sort of replaced by some more fins, which started to sort of take you around a turn potentially, um, uh, rather than it just kind of like stopping at a wall. Um, I, I think you could kind of imagine them almost like a, a labyrinth I mean, you don't have that much space, but like, if you um, if you started to use the fins as like a way to kind of uh, control views as well as like just like um, having like a formal presence, I think that would be a way to to give you the privacy that the uh, the concrete wall is is doing. I don't. That's common about those fins. Adam, I think that's a, a really excellent point. Uh, it also relates a little bit to the staircase to the private area downstairs. Like you, you have a good step, you have this clarity that you wanted to have a public space and a semi public space, which is where the meeting rooms are on the main floor. And then you've got the private space downstairs. And I appreciated that idea. But the staircase uh, access point is a little bit odd in that situation because it's in the more public area. And I don't know if there's a door there or any sort of way that you're supposed to hide that or if people can just get there by accident. But I think to follow up on Adam's point, you could easily, not easily, but you could begin to use this language that you have set up to begin to shelter that staircase or maybe change that access point a little bit so that it becomes not so uh visible uh and so so people could get down there by accident let's say i have one quick question that i wanted to ask where is the word wall it's located right here so it's on this wall and is your intention to have people see that that would never go to those meeting rooms or would that uh or, or i mean is it a highlight it it, it was your most on brand message, uh, as I understood it, uh, that was going to be visible to everybody. We intended it for it to be one of the first things you see as you enter in this space. So from afar, you could see the words, but for those that are walking inside, like clients that are walking inside to use the conference rooms, they're greeted with that message. The one other observation I had on that, and uh, take this with a grain of salt, because you know I'm just seeing this for the first time. But it was also interesting to me that you used the the different neon light on that word wall. But you have a lot of this language of, of of let's say horizontal lights and the floor and the ceiling, uh, and then this one in particular in the image that I saw earlier, the light kind of just stops within the wall. There was like I think there was a vertical member um, in it, and I'm wondering if you could begin to use I'm not sure that the placement of it's right, but you could begin to use, let's say that element in the ceiling or in the wall that would draw you through the space to get there if you felt like it was appropriate. Like as opposed to have it just being a terminal thing, 
something that would actually draw you through the space if you're trying to draw people further in? Um, yeah, I think those are all great comments uh, also. Um, I'm, I'm most fascinated with the, the your metaphor <clears throat> and how you enter the project or how you started talking to us about the project with this metaphor of shedding light over this company that is this kind of uh, black box, no? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then of course, in all the images it comes across as a, mm, probably the more also, also, also together with that, uh, those, um, I mean, probably the, the most uh, uh, impactful uh, design instrument that you're using uh, because the, those linear lights are, are very dominant, no? So, uh, and I think, uh, I think there's something uh, interesting there, even if it's a little ironic. Because, uh, but I, 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 I like when you were like bringing some of these notions in. Also, when you were talking uh, about transparency, you no, know, and glass, and people being able to look, so uh, but not listen. So uh, this kind of um, to, like questioning these ideas of what is transparency, what is shading light. You're shading light, but it's artificial light. So again, it's not really this modern notion of, 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 of legibility or transparency of architecture, but is you're actually concealing uh, the interior into using this new tectonic language, you know, that is very different from that that we see outside. Um, and then I wonder, uh, but then like just as experientially looking at this, so that's on the one hand, like these metaphoric uh, kind of connotations of, of what you're doing. And I think that, that uh, I think there's something interesting there if you continue to think about it um, and, or that it should be intentional no? uh, in one of these last uh, design studios. And then also, but then also with the like conditions, I wonder like in this like very cold environment, no, this, this happens in winter. Um, so uh, I think this kind of light that you're shedding on is really uncomfortable. I think like personally, like this very white uh, clinical light uh, that is kind of linked to those ideas of maybe of transparency, et cetera, or clarity, this kind of like, you know, the old uh, associations of white light with shedding light, like rational, like, no, eh? and this kind of thing. But then, but then at the same time, this, this kind of white light eh, is very cold, no, especially in a, in an environment like that is already very cold where, where you want is something eh, is usually the instinct is you, you want, to, you're drawn to the opposite, to some, some, some sort of warm light um, eh, that, that makes you feel, eh, that makes it feel more cozy, no, especially if you're trying to create, uh, if you're talking, uh, uh, and the way I understood it, there's a lot about creating uh, a sense of intimacy, no, between between the users. And then I wonder if some sort of warmer uh, light, or 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 how do you uh, utilize those uh, lighting conditions uh, in a, in that with light, just with a change of light, with a change of hue in the light, and with a change of intensity in the light the same space can feel so radically different. So I feel like exploring or exploding a little bit more since you had so many um, light um, uh, fixtures in the space. Uh, so being a little more intentional or, or exploring uh, some more uh, the, those kind of conditions, no? So how, how, do, how do we uh, change this uh, space based on these lights in that when I look at this, I don't know if you're familiar with this project by Philip Ram, where he reproduces an alpine environment in an indoor uh, gallery. Uh, he did this for a biennial uh, also in Switzerland. And, uh, and, they, and they use all these like um, fluorescence, a lot of fluorescence also coming from the floor to recreate that effect of being in the snow. And in a way, your image is almost like they want to do that. Like they want to, uh, in, a, in, a, in an artificial way, make you feel also like you're in this super wide space. And, and, and I'm, I'm just uh, talking about the things that, no, that I feel when I look at your images uh, in that, is that what you were after? That kind of like, what it were, like what this whiteness, no? Like uh, whiteness also as a symbol of like, probably of purity, clean, I don't know, like, <laughs> like there are these connotations, uh, um, not like from the clinical environment as well that, that we see that maybe are, is like, a, is that, a, was that an effort to kind of, uh, make this uh, this company like uh, no like um, yeah to, to make that the, the, to to kind of uh, make 
this illusion of transparency that you're trying to create of this company or 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 how how did you was that intentional or what, what were your thoughts about the use of light uh, and the hues, et cetera? Um, the hues of the lights, like the more widest hues were definitely intentional for us. We were focusing on color in the first um, design pass of the project and we were um, interested with the color blue because it represents um, trust and loyalty as well as white because it represents pure, like, um, being pure and also like enlightenment. So we wanted to include those colors throughout the space, which is why the lights are more wider. It's an interesting point though, because the white does, and especially with your design language, there's a futuristic vibe that comes along with that, I believe, uh, which is probably appropriate for the brand in, in the sense that it's, uh, you know, it, it's looking towards the future, it's a technology company. But Nerea brings up a really good point that you know, you're also fighting with this image that the company has in the past not had the, the, the best relationship with its customers, or there's this doubt about whether it's a, it's a trustworthy organization, et cetera. And so if you go into a clinical environment like this, do you feel like that that might actually make you less, feel less trustworthy to this company or should there be the, the transparency especially like, let's say in that meeting room, which I really appreciate that 3D visual. I thought it was fantastic. But does, do you lose in the process? You're still very interiorized there. You're brought in in multiple levels. There's actually no transparency within that room. Part of me wants to almost see between the fins and not have the light be so enclosing. Uh, do you feel like that you're actually making yourself less safe and, and again more it's a more clinical cold environment I think I think Nerea's point about it being a cold winter environment at the same time is really valuable um, it brings up a good point we didn't really think about it from that point of view but it does it definitely does make sense um I guess um, maybe this is a question for you know for you, Ivy and Lauren, but uh, it might just be a general question as well as, um, is it just uh, like, what is, how do you feel about this company? Like, is this, what's your like position on this company? Or are you just accepting that, hey, we're, we were given this project um, and so we, we have to make them look good. We have to, like, what is your, critical position on this company like do you really believe in what they're doing and you want to like help them with that or do you hold some criticisms and wish you could find a way to bring that into this as maybe a polemical project or is it is it just like all right we we accept we take them at their word they're trustworthy agents let's help them clean up their image Um, when we first started the research for this project, um, I previously heard how they were involved with um, Cambridge Analytica. So I personally came in with a more like negative point of view because I wasn't really sure um, what they stood for, like what they did besides that moment in time. But upon further research, we found out that they do, they strive to make positive change. So we really wanted to focus on in our design is changing that narrative, how everyone thinks that they are this data hungry company that only wants to like hurt people and how they're involved with um, other scandals like ICE and things like that. So for this project, we really wanted to focus on just changing that narrative from negative to positive, which um, is why we really focus on the idea of light and um, knowledge and enlightenment within the space. Thank you for answering that question. It's, it's you know, it's, it's really about your position as designers and like a question about how do you, how do you put your voice on, you know, the political issues around us into design and is that even possible at times? Do we even have that, do we, how much um, power do we have in, in that capacity when we're servants to power? And so um, I, I think it's really fascinating because you did do all this research. That's 
that's very complicated and um you know it 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 shows you like the good and bad of the this client so um personally i i would say like if your goal is to, is to like clean up that image i i think this is certainly a way to do it to use the the you know the symbolism of of light and and color and such to kind of work on that but at the same time i think you're you are i mean in a way it makes sense you're using the language of like tech companies how they present themselves like this word wall with this propaganda like for me as like an educate you know you're also educated people and we are critical viewers of things and i always look at anything coming from a tech company with like disdain so for me i might be your i mean i might be the audience you're trying to convince right i personally don't trust palantir i think they're like a greedy uh corporate corporation <laughs> run by like peter thiel who is a trump supporter you know all these things but um you know, I guess you could say, like, in terms of this, like, let's say you replace this company, Palantir, with any other tech company. I think the the language of this design would be basically the same. Like, blue is commonly used, like Facebook, um, LinkedIn, uh, Salesforce, blue and white. It's always blue and white. Like, those are the colors of tech companies. I think because of the, um, I think it's become a genre of expectation that that blue represents um also it represents trustworthiness it also represents like clarity or like it represents like um it, it represents like um like a sharp mind or something uh like intelligence or something it has all these associations and i'm I, maybe this is you know going off the rails here but i like if I'm going to take a critical stance on this, I would say I've not been convinced that I can trust this company <laughs> based on uh, what you've presented to me. However, I think it's a very competent and and real, this is a real proposal for a real pavilion. Like I believe that this can be done. I totally trust you as designers to do this. I think it's totally achievable um, spatially. And I, I think the ideas and stuff you have here totally work as a pavilion and, 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 and are interesting, like you're bringing light in. Um, as for the, I guess, our role as designers, larger position on like, did you convince me that I can trust this company? I would say no. So that's my measured response. Can I, can I take a moment to dive into a different level for a moment, which is just kind of talking about this sheet? Um, uh, as an example of the rest, uh, uh, you know, just for some comments, et cetera. So uh, I have a couple of uh, comments. Like, first of all, the image on the right, which is the evocative, and I think is very, uh, it, I, I, you know, I think it's very evocative and I like it. It's not quite real based on your drawing because you have a wall with a glass door right in front of it. And there's not enough space there for the really, for those people to be walking. I don't believe, like it's actually deeper. There's a wall and a glass in the way. And that changes the openness of that experience quite a lot. Uh, uh, it actually feels like it's more part of the public space than it really is in your drawing. The other comment, or a couple comments, this, the, this, uh, the, you've got the seating area to the right. And the technical drawing, it's not labeled and it's unclear what that triangle thing is off to the side. There's no line weight in that drawing. All of your elevations are still somewhat important to use line weight to communicate what you're trying to do what's in front, what's behind. Uh, when you first look at that drawing, it's really difficult to know what the triangle thing is. And then lastly, and, and more from an experiential standpoint, I don't believe the neon tubular light is gonna get you the effect that you're doing in the image. A neon tubular light is, is usually has a little thickness to it. It's tubular, it glows, it creates backlight. Um, it's, going to, it's not gonna be as clean as your image is right now. Well, uh, and so I think if you rendered it, you might not like it. It might have more of a funky look to it, a little bit more, uh, just a little less technical and clean than the rest of everything you're doing there. So you might actually want to design this in a different way where you've, let's say, routed out the letters and had the lighting coming from behind in a more evenly placed way, or maybe use Lucite or something like that to create 
the the glow to come through in a much more clean, crisp manner than the the neon tubular light that you've used. I think, I think those are. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was, I was gonna just going to mention that the seating right there, the triangle in the elevation is the swings of behind the, uh, in front of the executive office. Oh, no, I was able to figure that out by looking at it, but I would not have figured it out without the image to the right, right which seat. probably isn't in your technical drawings. Right. I yeah, I think that that's a, those are really good comments about sort of matching uh, the design intent with the communication of the line drawing. And so I think that those are really useful comments. And Adam, I really appreciate your um, standpoint. And I think that we have a good bar for measuring to this idea of this convincing. You did you don't have the benefit of like the, the weeks or so that Ivy spent um, doing the research and it was fun to see her jump into the research after the first day and then do her final presentation on that. So I think that will be really uh, convincing. And I think that um, I think that your standpoint of like, Maybe I'm a person who their branding needs to convince. I, I absolutely, completely valid. I think that's great uh, moving forward. We should move along. Um, and um, But thank you for the thorough feedback there. So Ivy, if you want to stop sharing, I think we can move on. Um, and Thanks. We'll it was really to... detailed. Sorry. Qu yeah. Yeah. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. It was a, it was a, a nice set. Nice, plan, nice project. Yay. Um, yeah. Congratulations, guys. Yes. So Morgan and Tara, if wh whoever is sharing and wants to drive, um, you could jump in next. Um, okay. And I, I'll just add, I don't know if anybody has the benefit of either another laptop or an external monitor, but the, the files are available on that box folder. And so you can always sort of follow alongside and um, click over to whatever slide you would like to see um, more of or in greater detail. Okay, so our goal for this project was to design a luxe pavilion that challenges the conventional relationship between wall, ceiling, and ground by engaging innovative uses of lighting and blurring the boundary between public and private spaces. Through the use of a dark color palette, whispers of bold color, and natural materials, the space provides a sense of raw elitism intended to represent the beliefs and goals of Palantir and leave visitors feeling like they're in on the secret. Did you, sorry, did you say raw elitism? <laughs> yes, I, think they did. I, I just, I really like that phrase. I wrote it down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> raw um, and then Morgan's going to talk a little bit oh. about talent here. Um, so, the, it's in Davos, Switzerland, the World Economic Forum. We talked about that. Um, and so we wanted the design of the pavilion to reflect the location um, in terms of like materiality, including elements like fireplaces to keep warm by, um, views, hot coffee things that make it more welcoming and inviting um, in light of Palantir's reputation. So kind of contrasting the hits and all that. Um, so implementing things from Switzerland, such as like white oak and other materials um, to make it more welcoming and inviting and homey. Um, we didn't change the architecture of the existing pavilion too much because they do reuse parts like Allison Sir was um, saying. Um, so we use the kind of current layout to or window placement and stair placement to um, kind of drive the layout of the rest of the space. So now if you look at our floor plans, there's a clear distinction between the public spaces to the left and the more private spaces to the right. Um, there is a vestibule used to enter the building in order to control the temperature and dirt coming in from outside because it is in the winter, um, it gets very cold and there's a lot of snow and dirt that gets tracked in. So um, 
the tile that we used in the vestibule is the Calcutta tile, which is um, a thick version of it that creates a uh, strong durability for a long lasting use. And the surface of it is also slip resistant, which makes it a great option for the transition space between the outside and inside. So after entering the pavilion, a visitor is greeted by the reception desk and a coat closet. And there is also a grand first impression created by the elevated ceiling after exiting the vestibule, um, along with a large white oak cave-like structure wrapping the staircase. Um, the location of the bathrooms on the left uh, were strategically placed to take into consideration the users of the pavilion being able to be hidden while standing in line. I know that was an important factor um, while we were designing the pavilion. Um, it was also important for us to create an open concept floor plan for um, the more public areas in order to merge the programs associated with each. As you can see, the demo space right here, the coffee bar space, and the present space and the presentation space all lack defining boundaries and seem to intertwine with each other. The demo space also shares a fireplace um, with the conference room behind it and the fireplace is see-through in order to act as the connection between public and private areas as well. There's also a set of seating nooks located here for more private seating that is integrated into the walls. This is a space for visitors to work in a more confined space yet still be surrounded by everyone else. The flooring located in the public space is white oak flooring, same as the cave-like structure. However, carpet is implemented into the conference and office spaces to create a more comfortable and cozy feeling. And then separating the two uh, spaces is a paneled door that integrates the same paneling that will be used on the ceiling and walls. And as you move towards the private area, there are two major conference rooms located here and a lounge area along with a office space for the CEO of Palantir. And the open concept continues down to the lower level and is strictly for staff of Palantir only. Um, and this also includes several seating spaces, another bathroom, mechanical room, and the kitchen. And then as you look at the RCP, we can see how our ceiling system brings together the entire space. We have designed for there to be wooden beams extending from the cave-like structure, and it is used as a way to make the building feel like a whole. Between the beams, there are LED lighting strip panels that are placed along the walls to light the entire space and the lights are integrated between the wooden panels in order to have the focus on the ceiling and the cave-like structure rather than on, arti rather than on artificial uh, hanging fixtures. The natural wood used for the cave-like structure and the wooden, wooden paneling blur the line between floor and wall and ceiling and establishes a hole. Um, so we wanted to create a special moment in the space um, and in thinking where to do that, the staircase seemed to be a good place uh, to kind of um, mask the stairs to kind of um, yeah, so since downstairs is mainly for staff. The goal of the structure was to be a focal point while also enticing people, like not enticing people to migrate downstairs in groups. Uh, it seems counterintuitive, but it worked out in our favor. The structure, we kind of nicknamed the cave. Um, it became central to the design and it influenced the rest of the space. The construction um, with panels with slats for interlock interlocking perpendicular members um, for a secure structure. We use lines from the vertical panels as leading lines to help define areas in the open and main area without built walls for a more open um, relationship building area. Um, when you're looking at our sections, 
you can get a better understanding of the relationship between the cave and the two levels. As you can see, the cave floats down into the bottom level and kind of just stays around the ceiling rather than coming all the way down to the floor like it does on the first level. And you can also see the difference between the larger open spaces um, versus the more private conference rooms and how they interact and intersect. And these are some of our interior elevations that we've done. Um, this is the fireplace that is seen here that connects the demo space and the conference room. And this is a little lounge area located um, at, as the between point between the public space and the private space. And then these are our nooks, which also integrate the paneling as seen in this render. And then this is an example of one of our conference rooms. And then this is a white mode render just to show the lighting and the spacing um, throughout the first level. And that's it. Do you have, Tara, do you have a, a, an image of the coming from the stairs, looking up, coming from downstairs? Not from downstairs, no. Mm. We have this one that's kind of looking down into it, so you can see how the cave kind of opens up like a entryway into downstairs. Mm. Um, wh where is the fireplace in plan? It is right here, connecting this demo space and this conference room. Mm -hmm. it, there is a render of it right here. Just a note on that fireplace, that was a uh, late in the game um, curveball I threw all of them as a challenge to whichever groups would like to um, implement, try to implement the fireplace. And it could just be a linear gas appliance. There, it just we didn't have time to cover the code on doing full masonry wood burning fireplaces. Um, and so this, you'll see some projects chose to be up for the challenge and see if they couldn't implement say a linear gas appliance um, essentially, which is what that fireplace would be. Um, in reality, they would probably implement a steam fireplace, but for purposes of our studio um, and for examination of different kind of code requirements, they it would be a gas. Regardless, there would be a little, there would be some more depth to it probably. Uh, and not, it wouldn't fit within that thin wall, I don't think, right? Probably. Probably, you're right, yes. But I, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, I mean, congratulations uh, to you both uh, in the in in that I think, uh, given the 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 level of technical resolution that you need to achieve this semester, I appreciate that you also took this uh, geometry challenge, no, in figuring out that uh, kind of intervention in the stair. Um, I think, uh, and 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 it's it's. Uh, it's interesting insertion in the space because obviously, I mean, its geometry is um, doesn't want to be there almost, no? <laughs> and the way it is located, and I think, uh, meaning with everything being so orthogonal, and I think you guys did a pretty good job in in then expanding those kind of uh, like letting it uh, expand radially and then disappear without other treatment on the walls because it is uh, uh, where it changes direction where it is quite challenging and it's a not an easy transition to make and 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 it's uh, probably you guys struggle deciding where was what was it starting and what was it ending no because at some point it had mm -hmm. to end um, but I do think it works in um, in uh, in organizing the space. It definitely is a very powerful move that uh, organizes the space around it. Uh, and uh, 
So I wish, uh, and I don't fully understand how, I mean, I would love to see that view from underneath um, and how this sculptural object is kind of uh, suspended there. Uh, but also maybe to, to use it for more than uh, just circulation. So that where if it's really like the heart and uh, maybe if it could also incorporate the, 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 um, the what's the name, the, the fireplace in some sort of way or how, how do you make more out of it? No, in, mm -hmm. in that it's, it's such a, it, it, it is a huge move, but right now is uh, uh, it does. Uh, I mean, maybe it could it could combine more functions than just circulation. That's what I'm saying. Um, uh, in in the way that you could continue to uh, manipulate it or um, uh, no uh, uh, refine the, its geometry to allocate maybe other uses as well. And it does have the thickness where you could maybe host uh, the fireplace there somehow. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's, that seems to be where you've put uh, no, most of your effort. Uh, I think the, the um, in any, and I think the project does communicate this kind of warmth uh, in, in this uh, like very uh, cold environment. The, uh, I'm more bothered, for example, with the floor uh, in that then it's like then defaulting to wood uh, as if, um, I, I, I think it would have been more interesting if you, maybe you look at other options or maybe you, you defaulted to it by thinking, okay, we're already using wood. So we're gonna use wood at the bottom, but it's such a different kind of application that is so, you know, this kind of uh, veneer, like a uh, very, very generic, you no? Know? Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's, uh, and, uh, but at the same time, almost if it was literally different, if it was some sort of stone or something maybe, or if it being the same material, I feel like the dialogue would have need to be more uh, direct between these two worlds that are confronted against each other and are using the same material, or then, then maybe you could have considered a, a radically different material if you wanted to avoid going there. But I think you're using the wood, the, no, the timber uh, flooring or, uh, in a very generic way that I, I, I don't think um, makes justice to, to all the effort that you're doing at the top, you know, it's so banal mm -hmm. uh, in comparison. And, and I think it would have been easily avoided if, uh, if uh, just by even using like a, like a carpet, you know, like that, 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 that problem already wouldn't be there. <laughs> I, I find it strange that you like spend all this time doing that at the top and then that uh, that then you have this uh, finish in the floor uh, but that's like a minor thing I mean it, and, it, and also has a very easy fixing no like yeah. um but yeah uh, great uh, great work guys thank you Michael you're you're muted there uh I, I really appreciate the fan-like uh, nature of the cave and the way you've used that as an organizing principle as well. Uh, just to follow up really quickly in the image on the right, I think uh, and following up with Nerea's comment that, you know, to integrate more of what's going on with that cave-like element, I feel like the area and the seating, uh, that's where it starts to break down a little bit. Those two feel like elements that have been detailed in a different way that don't integrate with the cave area that well. Uh, they're just they're just done. They're they're they have a density to them as well that in act, actuality might detract from the centralizing aspect of the major cave move as well. Uh, so when you see those fan like elements in the ceiling and then they uh, they hit that rectangular elements on the side, I think that's where the language could be further developed and pushed. Okay. Uh, and a small technical comment, uh, you would never use the wood hatch on the floor in your drawing for the finished floor. You would either indicate the plank pattern if it's a finished floor plan, or you might even in this situation leave it blank because of the busyness in the drawing, but you would not, that's, a, that's actually a detailed wood hatch that you use. Okay. This is an FYI. Um. Yeah, I, I'm still fascinated by this idea of the raw elitism. Um, could you expand on that? Um, well, Palantir is a whole concept, or not their concept, but like 
the goal of the pavilion was to leave visitors feeling like they're in on the secret. So I kind of, we kind of wanted to incorporate everybody, all of the visitors into the pavilion. And we wanted to make them feel like they were also at Palantir's level and um, kind of interact with the company. Yeah, yeah I think that makes sense. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure if there's a tinge of irony in, in that phrasing, but um, I find it, uh, you know, if it's not ironic, then I find it to be maybe just colluding with like the uh, elitist, elite class solidarity in like a, in a certain way. I, either way, I, I find it compelling as like, um, as a position because it's like, well, this is kind of what we're asked to do for companies like this. We're asking to collude with their ideologies. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, f I find that as like, you know, just take that as a conceit to work with and maybe, um, I, I think that it does do that. Like I feel the raw elitism, but I actually feel like it could get more elitist perhaps okay. like, um, like maybe using more precious materials, for example. I mean, white oak is a very expensive material. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was just, you know, as a, it's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful wood. And I'm just wondering like, you know, okay, you've got some like copper elements, like what are ways that like, are there more, just like lavish things that you can just give these these elitists you know like mm -hmm. you I, I really like i mean i i like the warm materials and stuff like you know commenting about feeling like you've arrived in a different place from the outside um right. which is cold yeah. um like what are what are more like lavish things like could the coffee bar like serve very rare, it's like like the rarest, most expensive, like coffee that is like you know fair trade, organic. Um, you know, uh, is there? I feel like there would be like full concierge service, like like there would be like full full like like overwhelming like service, like beyond just like the one person at the coffee bar and, and the person at the front desk, I feel like they're like each person entering would get their own personal butler, you know, and there would need to be space made for those butlers. You know, there could only be a certain number of people in there at a certain time. And like, it's full concierge service, like maybe mm -hmm. thinking about like how many people you're actually allowing in there and making a very exclusive exclusive like VIP experience you know like when you enter it's all about you it's not you're not just another person with a badge you are the center of attention you know like it's like oh yeah like I don't know it might be I mean just to like play up that that like raw elitism that like super yeah, yeah. VIP status um like um I don't know, like they, maybe there's like a massage room. <laughs> there's like, um, anyway, but I think the material choices are, are, are interesting, but I wonder about like the practicality of using, I don't know what your position on the white oak is. Like, is it actually white oak? Is it a veneer material? Like this has to be like a pop-up project. Mm -hmm. So. Right. So we were, all of our like the cave structure and the panels are going to be um developed off site so that they would be able to be built in the time constraint on site if that makes sense yeah okay but also related to his comment like you chose the language that you use for instance with the stone entryway was about durability long lasting all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff uh, aspects of materiality that are not quite as important in a in a pop-up space right 
Um, Unless you have a plan for, for low, full life cycle use of it and repurposing right. it, et cetera. Right. Yeah, in that, uh, uh, I mean, if, even though the pavilion is usually reused, no, I assume the interior, because it has to be thematic and it always has to be no, uh, fresh, is probably not reused, right? But um, but then it's also I mean I think thinking of the afterlife no of the proposal because this what you're proposing is so customized so to try to think of ways where how this this intervention could migrate um, somewhere else uh, or, or reused in some sort of form uh, I think it will make your project a lot stronger too no okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's really good feedback there. The, uh, we should we should move along. I, uh, just something of note too is that they um, they do you know they do have a local storage facility, and so items are reused whether it's interior application or um, you know the exterior shell of the building. They're all being stored offsite, um, but they are stored locally so that they reduce their transportation costs. And so I asked the and so. In reality, they actually are using the same furniture package over and over again and sort of trying to reinvent it by positioning in the spaces. But for the purposes of our project, I've asked all of our students to re-envision the entire interior. And so um, so that was that's something that's totally fair well, comment. <laughs> yeah, because this interior would be hard to do, uh, to reuse, unless it was going to be reused exactly the way it is, it would be hard to reuse it uh, in a different format. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, Okay, Tara, if you want to um, stop you. sharing, I'm going to have Jenny. Thank you. In. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll be thinking about raw elitism for a long time. Adam, I think you're starting to get the vibe, and I'm going to nominate you to go to the World Economic Forum and regulate <laughs> how many uh, billionaires get in the door at a time, and you have to go tell them that they have to wait in line outside before they can come in for yeah. coffee. You could, you could be the <laughs> new Greta, Adam. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I actually... Can I just say just one came more and thing? yelled at everybody, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I thought it was interesting that you started with like, you know, talking about public and private separation. Sorry, I'm talking to the last group now, but um, if you look, if you think about the city and this exhibition, this is no, there is no, there is no public space anymore. The entire okay. town is a private, um, is a private event. So it's, it's just an interesting condition that they're in this situation inside and outside of the building even with that you know everything is private like and it's highly controlled i just think it's fascinating but thank you yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. okay hi um my pavilion is designed to highlight the achievements of palantir and their positive impacts the spaces um, assist in developing the connections between Palantir and their clients and create the opportunity for bilateral and trilateral connections. There is a connection between Davos and Palantir made through the use of local materials, materials, Swiss craftsmanship and the use of technology within the design. Swiss design is known to be reliable and trustworthy and shows precision, dedication, passion and integrity, which are all things that Palantir um, wants to convey. The contrast between these analog and digital methods of design works for the use of parametric design, CNC fabrication, AI, and the focus on traditional fabrication details and methods in Switzerland. I also use Grasshopper and Rhino in my design process when designing the ceiling. Um, the ceiling is visible upon entry. This first render is what you would see as you come into the pavilion space. So it's really meant to draw visitors into the space and then draw the eye upward to the line of the mountains, which is above the apartments that you see and bring the eye upward. These are my materials. So there's a lot of focus on locally sourced uh, materials and things that are available within Switzerland. And then my color palette is uh, pretty neutral, but with navies to show that color that symbolizes um, loyalty and trustworthy. And then this diagram shows my ceiling plane and how I um, began to thought of, think about how the ceiling would be divided up and certain areas receiving different treatments. I'll walk through the plane on the next slide, um, but just really thinking about like the main spaces, something a little bit different, and then there's an exclusive event space and how that is a little bit different and more intricate and feels a little bit more special. 
so um, the main space, the entrance is here. And then I've combined the uh, lobby area and the front desk and then the lounge to make the space feel a little bit bigger. And then I have different levels of closure. So this main space that's open to the public can be closed off with movable glass walls that are here and here. So that creates a way for the Palantir employees to be able to set up in this exclusive event space that's over here. There are conference rooms and offices along this wall and everything um, that we talked about being seen and not heard, they have glass walls. So the um, clients can be seen in their meeting, but um, there's a textured glass on this wall. So it's a little bit more private. I have um, the coffee bar here, which you're seeing in this render. And then um, on either side of the coffee wall, which I'll show in later slides as well, there's the demo area and then there's this winds wall. So as you're waiting for coffee or waiting for the bathroom, which is over here, you have opportunities to interact with different people and the Palantir employees in different ways. Um, and then my lower level has the production office and then the kitchen with employee seating areas um, where assistants and other Palantir employees can come down um, and get away from the public and have little areas to just relax. My um, reflected ceiling plan shows the different areas and my final design of the ceiling and connecting um, the columns and creating this visual connection between the line of the columns throughout the entire space and drawing the eye into the exclusive event space. Um, it represents a flow of information and the security Palantir provides to its customers. And it's really enforcing that idea of the connection, but then the privacy with these movable glass walls that are within this space. Um, then this axon shows how the mechanical systems are placed um, in the floor to make it um, more energy efficient. And then the ceiling plane that hides the electrical conduit and the sprinklers that are above that level. My column design, um, you can see really well here with that, what I was talking about with the flow of the columns through that exclusive event space. It fans out here with this screen for the stair. And then um, here you can see it's a worm's eye view of this, um, this flow of the ceiling then being interrupted by this screen where there's this flexible event space with movable walls that has a skylight above that lets natural light into a space that doesn't have windows available. Um, so this page is um, showing again that winds wall and the coffee bar. This is my stair screen and seeing that view outside and the mountains above. And then this is where I have the textured glass that is into the conference room. And then the office is here that has curtains for um, a layered assembly to just add an extra level of privacy, even though there is textured glass. All the furniture items that I selected all have rounded forms that um, are similar to that of the columns and the organic form that I use for that. And then the lighting fixtures that I selected have um, pieces that um, are similar to the fins on the ceiling as well. And then this is another view into um, the conference room. And then this is showing with the closed partitions into the private event space and how you can kind of see and maybe wonder what's going on in those spaces that's exclusive invite only space. And this is the view in this um, exclusive event space and just showing that it's something that's a little bit more intricate and um, special in that space. This is um, the lower level. So this is for employees only. So creating a space that has lots of seating options and this built-in nook where they can log into computers and just have a quiet space. There's acoustic wall tile in here to um, limit the noise. And then there's a custom screen pattern of the Palantir logo, which this glass is into the kitchen. So I wanted to provide light into the kitchen while still hiding any sort of messiness that was in there. And then um, this is my coffee bar. So the design allows for the um, coffee machines and espresso machines on this back um, portion and the rounded form of it, again, kind of echoes what's happening in the ceiling and the roundness of the walls in the corners. 
This is another view. So this is the coffee bar and this is the front desk and this is the demo wall I've created. And I wanted something that was interactive and allowed if there was a line for coffee or um, something like that, then it wasn't frustrating. There was something to kind of do and interact and then creating a conversation between the Palantir employees and the visitors here. This is my staircase. So this is where the screen is. So I wanted to create something that blocked the view from the public while still allowing light into the spaces. There are windows along this side, which is cut off on this view. So the light does filter into the space still because of the way that they're, um, the slats are done. Um, and so for my conclusion and wrap up, um, as we were asked to think about COVID and just the impacts of the um, World Economic Forum next year, I was thinking about how to create a space that makes visitors feel safe and comfortable and how to change the space that addresses the concerns of safety and how to make the occupants still feel protected. I feel like there's a missing link of personal connection these days. So that's why I was thinking about this demo wall and if there's a way to show current visitors and past visitors and connecting them in a way that's um, a little more socially distant, it wouldn't require actual physical touch of the wall and so something that could be implemented in that way. Um, and then probably, possibly there's some sort of occupancy um, changes where less people are allowed and things like that. I don't know the answers. These are all things that I'm trying to work through. Um, and I, in my space, I think the level of closure, which you can see where it's open here, you can see through the entire space, and then where it's closed off, I think that begins to start that kind of a conversation where you could block off areas and the Palantir employees could be in here and feel a little bit more safe and anyone that's in here could be blocked off in the exclusive event space, but is that enough? These are all questions that I'm trying to figure out. So, um, and then I'll go back to the first slide. So I do have this QR code. So if you do want to use it on your phone, you can, you can take a photo of that. I also have it on my web browser, but I think it might make people a little dizzy. I tried it. So I can, if you would like me to. Um, I find this to be more trustworthy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think in particular, what I like is just the lack of branding. Like on this first floor level, I know there is like branding above the, the reception. Of course, you're going to need some branding, but I'm, I'm really glad that it's not just like on every surface, like in my face at all times. Like, I think like, you know, if let's say you don't like this company, you don't want to see their branding all the time, but you're like, okay, I know that the company did this pavilion and I just enjoy this space. It's a pleasant space. It's not in my face. It's not trying to like push itself on me. Okay, maybe they're not so bad. You know, may, may like, let's say you just broke up with someone and now they're like continuing to call you again and again and again. You don't want to hear from them. <laughs> but if they just send you like, you know, like a package of chocolates, just like their initial on it, Maybe maybe you'll get over it or something. I don't know. Sorry, that was a horrible <laughs> analogy. But um, Swiss chocolate. Anyway, I Swiss I, I like the I like the minimal branding on it. Um, and you know, it, it, the downstairs like it's for employees. It has a lot more branding. You know, they already work there. Like they already they already know where they work. I I wonder if it needs so much branding on on the the employee floor level because the employees work there already. They, they know that they work, they work at Palantir. So um, I'm wondering if it needs that much branding or if you can kind of tone down the amount of branding there too. Um, but I think it's just enough. And it's like more, I don't know, it feels, it's like everyone knows that they're at the Palantir Pavilion. You know, like you only need to see it once to know that you're at the Palantir Pavilion. Um, and then you can just enjoy the nice space. And I actually like the space. I like how it's open. And I like I like your choice of materials a lot. Like I like the green, which is like a soothing and calming color. 
Um, and it just kind of reminds us of like being in nature, I guess. <laughs> so I, I think it's a very strong project. Um, and it's actually just like the view is like, that's a pretty pleasant space, you know? If I had to go to this, uh, this forum, I would, I, I would sit on that couch. I like that couch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you go to the uh, Jenny to the to the to the um, reflect like the axon that is looking towards the ceiling? The sun? No, it's like in. Well, it's not an axon. Like more like a perspective. Oh, this one. one. Yeah. 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 I mean, I really, I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I really enjoy this treatment, like this very, like this uh, kind of almost fabric-like, uh, no, uh, the um, texture that you have, uh, no, that, that you're covering the columns with, no? Uh, I really like the, the columns. Uh, and uh, the, uh, there's a certain playfulness to it, no, that is not trying to be natural, but it does, uh, it does seem a bit like a fabric, like some sort of drape, but that draping system, that's why I really like that drawing, uh, looking in the line drawing, looking from below. I think that's a very strong one to, that captures that kind of quality of this kind of fabric that is kind of uh, uh, revealing and concealing. So it's um, the natural association maybe is because of the wood, but it doesn't, the truth is uh, maybe it's more fabric-like than, than topography. Or than or or no or, or natural in that respect no because it is it is very uh, obviously man made and obviously uh, versus other kind of projects in this vein no that we've seen over the last uh, decades uh, there's something uh, very playful uh, and in your in your proposal that is not trying to. Uh, a mimic a, like a natural topography, but that is something else. And I think that's uh, that's kind of uh, yeah, that, that that's one of my favorite drawings that in your in your project. Um, it's very well executed uh, throughout. No, I think it, it looks like it works uh, very well. Of course, we're seeing it like uh, fast, so <laughs> it's difficult to to catch up on everything. But um, I think, um, yeah, like uh, Adam was saying, the color palette, et cetera, um, seems uh, to work together very well, no? Uh, what we're in the images that we're looking at. Um, and uh, yeah, so congratulations. Uh, Thank you. I, yeah. Uh, I, I agree with the prior reviewers, but I'm gonna, uh, I'm going to push back on a couple things. Like I, I really like the columns and the way that they're detailed. It, to me, they're the most successful part. Even as a standalone object, they just have a level of resolution that I don't see in, let's say, the wall around the staircase or even in the ceiling. Uh, and related to that, uh, I also feel like your way of describing what you were trying to do with the ceiling ribbon going down the middle fails in the middle when it intersects with structure that you decided not to hide. Um, I believe those are structural beams and structural columns and the two walls of the meeting rooms uh, uh, where, the, where the beams kind of hit. Is that true or not? That's, uh, that's where the movable walls are. So it comes down to meet and it would have the track for the doors. Uh, all right. So that might be there. difficult to resolve. But part yeah. of it, like, I think it interrupts and then you shift it for the light. And I understand what you were trying to do but I actually think you lose the power of having that run straight through by not like having the track, let's say, which isn't used all that often, be kind of like you could see the ribbon going through straight uh, and then you have the track kind of hidden by the ribbon that's cross setting it. So it would actually intersect and the ribbon would win in that situation. And related to that, I also kind of feel like there's one or two moves too many uh, like, for instance, I'm not sure you need the part around the staircase as much, even though it's doing a good job of hiding it, because then it detracts from the successfulness of the ribbon and the staircase going through. Uh, the last comment I wanted to make is that I thought your downstairs and your entry desks are sober in relation to the exuberance of the rest of the design. Sober, I want to say, in a healthy way for doing successful interior design in the corporate world in the future. Like, there's super successful elements that I feel like are gonna work 
uh, in, in many different kinds of spaces. It's this area you were trying to push it out of the box that I feel like didn't, as good as it is, the columns are the most successful part to me. I just feel like there's an elegance to the way that you did the uh, breaking it into the quarters and having the rhythms different that are the most successful part of that ribbon going through and that the ribbon itself needs to be highlighted. You could still have the light coming down through the middle section. I think that would be the break that you would notice as the ribbon's going all the way through that would highlight the entrance space that you were trying to, to show off. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Um, it, congratulations, I think it's, it's uh, kind of spot on. It's almost like Michael knew you spent weeks and weeks developing that was like pre COVID. So Jenny has all of these like beautifully printed iterations of this column. <laughs> so, so I think that that is true. And I think that it really did play out well in your project. Um, that does conclude our presentations for this morning. Um, I, I, um, I appreciate the uh, gesture towards what do we do with all this information if it's just straight up irresponsible to have a population increase by 5x, <laughs> um, you know, in the age of COVID. So thank you for starting to tackle that, Jenny. So trying to think about how do we mitigate, um, you know, how do we make personal connections if in a pavilion that's about making connections? How do we do that if it's not safe? Um, so I think that's a, an interesting um, beginning to that conversation. But um, thank you very much for our re to our reviewers. We have just a couple minutes if any of you have or wish to share any sort of parting comments as we go on our ways to go get lunch. Um. I, would, I would like to highlight the, 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 the design efforts were all excellent and I really appreciate the thought in the designs. I believe that uh, the, the amount of drawings, et cetera, were a good step in the right direction too. I found the axonometrics or the perspectives, the most helpful drawings in your set, which is a bit of a disappointment. Like I still feel like legibility in the main drawings is key and it's important to remember uh, as you moved into the professional world that that needs to happen. Small comment, like the one drawings, uh, the one set was all in blue. I get it, it's pretty, but it's not, you need to learn how to design well in black and white because it's still cheaper and and uh, more easy to reproduce in the, in the field and all that, that it really should have been in black. And then I, again, there's a lot of extra lines, a lot of difficulty and depth that needs to be brought forward. But I'm willing to look past all that definitely in this class because it's the, it's, you're learning and, and doing the volume of all of these types of drawings and you will get better. That's what the work world will, will teach you. So kudos to the, all the projects. Yeah, and I'll say I'll say to that they, by the way, also learned how to use Revit this semester. <laughs> Another example, like when you cut <laughs> elevations or interior elevations, yeah. you don't so, know where the boundaries are. It's all right. great. You'll, uh, uh, yeah. uh, it's just a, a way to look at uh, what to keep an eye on in the future. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I just want to congratulate you all too. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the, this review in the, the, the project. Uh, and, and I think Alison did a, a great job in selecting this project in that uh, even it has like the, it has a good scale for the kind of uh, diving into detail that you guys need to uh, work on uh, uh, for this kind of uh, studio. Uh, but then she also provided a background no, that, uh, that um, that ask from you to take um, a position and put you maybe in a difficult position, no? In that uh, <laughs> as client, as no, as as um, as designers uh, for this corporation, uh, where uh, it puts you in a, and and. But this is something very interesting because it's something that we have to face all the time in our profession. Because of course, like it's. Uh, uh, it's often that uh, that uh, one person that has the most funds for design as well. You know? So we often find ourselves in this kind of uh, situation, and and I think to start thinking about that, uh, uh, it's important early on. You know? um, and um, but yeah, uh, the yeah, congratulations on 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 great work. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm I'm very impressed by the the amount of work and detail that you all did. Like, really, I mean, to do this in school 
um, with no consultants, <laughs> um, with no one to really, I mean, you have, you have Professor Gaskins to turn to, but, you know, producing this kind of drawing set would be just in a, you know, in, in the profession, like it, you have a bunch of people around you that you call, you, you talk to the product consultants, you talk to HVAC, you know, structural engineer, blah, blah, blah. You talk to all these people. You're not just like alone designing a construction set usually. Um, so it's very impressive that you were able to do that. And for a site you can't even go to, you know, like, um, and very quickly. So I'm very impressed with that. Um, I guess it, it would be interesting to like, if you do this again, to like, think about like assembly, like literally like the logistics of assembly, because this is a pop-up in a pop-down thing. And I guess they're reused over each year in some way. Um, and so it would be interesting to design, I guess, more specifically like an understanding of, okay, how would this be assembled very quickly? Um, I think some of you have addressed that in certain ways. And of course, it's very hard to, to think about these issues. But um, I think like maybe diagrams about how would this be assembled and what order would these things come together? Like what tools would you need? Um, what expertise would be needed to put this together? I mean, it would just be interesting to like think about that because it is it is a temporary pop-up uh, exhibition essentially um, that's also building. So it's, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and thank you all for dealing with this very compelling complex um, client. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you for the comments. And actually, I think that's a great note about that assembly and disassembly. I think um, we certainly uh, would have loved to be in person to part of what we do is we actually develop a very detailed model and they have to think about connections and think so that they start to see how pieces come together. Um, we were, of course, removed from the world of gravity once we went online. Uh, which was too bad. Um, so that was that was disappointing for for all of us. But um, I uh, want to apply. I'm excited to see the rest of the projects today. Um, and congratulations to the three of you. And I want to commend all or the three groups, um, all five of you on your accomplishment for this semester. It was an enormous undertaking. And you did it all with smiles on your faces, which I sometimes just didn't understand. So <laughs> um, Please go have lunch. I'm going to take this. I'm going to do our little on hold screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our reviewers for your time. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day on other reviews, Nerea and Adam and Michael. It was so good to see you. And thank you for your contributions as well. Okay. Thank you much. Great thank to be you. here. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much. Right. It was really cool. Okay. okay. All right. Bye. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our review to the students. Welcome outside viewer students. Hannah Goldstar, thanks for visiting us. Um, and then welcome to Clay and Pierjana and Ellie. I'll introduce you shortly to the students here. Um, we had a great session this morning. Um, we ran a little bit long. Probably my fault for the long intro, so I'll try to make the intro br briefer this time. Uh, but you'll notice over to the right, uh, I just wanted before we get started, Anne and Ashlyn, um, as inspired by seeing Tammy Glass's studio, <laughs> they did all their presentations using um, Mural. And I don't know, Clay, if you had a chance to, if you registered, or Pierjana, if, if either of you have registered um, at Mural and signed up there. Uh, but I did include the link to their presentation. Um, okay. It's a nice way to interact with the student work while they're presenting um, and, and then actually while you're getting feedback as well. So they were able to quickly pivot and incorporate their presentation into that format. If so, that's the link there on the right in the chat box. Um, if that's something that um, comes up and you want to participate in. Otherwise, all of the student work is available in that box folder. Um, online and you, you should be able to open up their PDFs um, and follow along. You'll see they have three 
documents in each folder that have the presentation document, um, their construction documents that they submitted, um, what seems like forever ago, 10 days ago, um, and then um, also a job book. So a, a, a book that really contains all of their uh, fixtures, furniture, and other kinds of equipment that they've incorporated into their project. The construction documents in the job book, we won't really cover. They really were asked to pull from that to create their presentations. Um, it can be a little bit difficult just given our time constraints to really just review a straight construction set. So I was asked to really incorporate the experiential and the theoretical uh, concepts that they've employed um, to develop their designs um, for their presentations. So before I jump in and I'll share my screen to introduce the project directly, um, this is our technical studio um, in days of your, it used to be called sound building. Um, and so we have here a mixture of um, design six students who are undergraduate students and our technical students who are masters of interior design students. Um, today we'll be hearing from in the second session, um, I think two masters students and one, one team of, um, of undergrads. Um, and so we'll get to that shortly. Um, before I go too much further, I want to introduce to everyone, in case you don't know them, our reviewers. Um, we have Clay Odom here from at the School of Architecture. I'm sure you all know Clay, especially since you're in his studio last semester. Um, most of you were at least. And um, so Clay's part of the interior design faculty. And then um, we also have joining us uh, Pirjana Mazoka. I realized today I've never said your last name and I'm really sorry that I probably said it incorrectly. It's okay. Okay. So Pirjana is um, with us at the School of Architecture as an emerging fellow of design. And um, we're really lucky to have her on our review. We tried to get her on our mid review. And I think um, in that crazy week where everyone was having reviews, we missed her. So I'm, I'm really happy you get to see the projects um, after all. So that's really great to have you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very um, happy to Thanks with for us having me. From Colorado. As, um, yeah, like side, side note, she's super smart, professional, and really like talented, and also one of my favorite people in the whole world. So Ellie Mirheb is here joining us. Ellie is a graduate um, of the master's program in architecture here. She also has a, she did the historic preservation program as well. She has a vast amount of professional experience, uh, both in Austin and is now a principal of her own firm in Versa, uh, called Verso um, out of uh, Boulder. And um, we miss her very much. <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> but she is joining us today. Um, Ellie with, uh, has a background, like I said, in historic preservation and in architecture, but she's also done, she's been fully immersed in interiors. And so uh, knows and understands um, design at many different levels of scale, both in uh, tangible scale and time scale as well too. So it's really nice that we have her contributing today. So welcome. Um, so for our project, for our reviewers to briefly get you in, briefly, um, I don't know if you had time. I only got that email out to you after yesterday's reviews, um, but I will, I'm going to jump over and um, share this other screen here. Sorry for the delay. Okay, we good? Um, this is just a really brief intro. So our um, so our session, second session here, we'll be featuring, we'll start out with Anne and Ashlyn's projects, and then we'll follow up with uh, Jing Yu and Megan's project uh, right after that. Megan, your last name spelled wrong here as well. I'm so embarrassed, I'm sorry. Um, So our project site, just to give you a taste of the context, this is very much an interior design program, but the context of the site um, is so important to the information of how we outfit the interior here. Um, so what we are focusing on is 
a pavilion. It's really a pop-up pavilion um, at the World Economic Forum. It's been built in um, succession a number of times now. Um, and it is for, it's a US-based technology firm. They, have, they now have locations all over the globe. Um, but they, along with the other leading tech firms, host a pavilion on site for both meetings um, and then also just for amenities, whether or not they host private invitation only um, events or open presentations or just um, are open for coffee and refreshments as well, just so, as an added amenity at the uh, World Economic Forum. Sorry. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Um, we have someone who maybe should not be in our meeting. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry for that delay. That hasn't happened to me before. Um, so what we're looking at here is a picture of Davos. It's in Switzerland um, and it's located, it's a small resort town, ski town, really located at the base of two ski areas. So there's one ski mountain right here and then another one right here. This is uh, on a little bit on the outskirts of town. Um, this is taken in the early morning, close to daybreak the, at sunrise. Um, sunrise and sunset happen Sunrise happens a little late, sunset happens a little early because of its location in this valley that the mountains really block uh, the amount of sunlight it's getting. Uh, the World Economic Forum is an annual convention that's held in the later weeks of January. This past week, or this past year, it was January 22nd to 25th. Um, and it's a very small population for a town. Um, it, their general population is about 3,000 people. And I guess akin to the South by Southwest of what happens here, the town uh, rents out their apartments and they all leave. But then the general attendance for the WEF is about 15,000 people. And so it very much inundates this place and it takes it over. And, and nicely put actually by one of the earlier reviewers in the sense of public and private, the actual access roads into Davos are, are closed and uh, by military um, grade guardsmen who prevent anyone without a badge saying that they're registered to be there um, cannot come into this town. So very much this public town actually becomes entirely private. From there, there are sectors of privacy that then exist as well. Um, sorry, I'm sorry, we have someone who keeps coming into our meeting. Um, Um, something that happens central to the WEF is that this center Congress, and this is where all of the, the larger meetings are held versus the sort of breakout uh, meetings and presentations that might happen. Um, this building right here on the right, this is more of a permanent structure that stays here year round. Um, most of the other pavilions and other events are held rather in building takeovers, interior takeovers, or by pop-up structures of different sorts. Sometimes they're actually appendages on top of a building on the front or on the physical roof of a building, which is, is kind of interesting to see this world all of a sudden triple in size. Um, but what's key to note about this lar very large structure here, so when world leaders come and speak or when Greta came and sp spoke in January, this is the place where she would speak. Um, this main promenade is the primary functional street um, in uh, Davos. And it really is limited to pedestrian traffic. Um, and so very, very, very few cars are allowed onto that street. If you see a car, it is typically because it is housed by a um, world leader who needs special protection to move around um, in an automobile. So our site is located on one of the very first, you need a special color badge to get into this area in order to access the Congress. And so um, just past that, the gateway, the threshold is happening right here at this little, this little chalet. Um, and then I'll go to the next slide so that you can see our location. This is 
that building that I was just pointing at here and our location is basically the first spot right past that. So any kind of foot traffic after a talk has happened is going to walk right past our pavilion. Um, you can see on the, even Google Maps keeps it with a little coffee. They, they call it a cafe uh, because one of the things that's a, a huge amenity at the WEF is trying to go see what fantastic coffee or hot drinks Palantir is serving up. Um, a little bit more about the site. This is that building I just indicated here. So that uh, Center Congress is right past here. Our site is right along here. And when there is no pavilion uh, for most of the year, um, it is a very steep drop off from that sidewalk right here. So this is just standing in the opposite view, looking past. And then this is what it looks like when that pavilion gets put up. This is the exact pavilion that was built in 2017. This is the one that was here years past. The shell of the building is, has, does not change really from year to year. It's very much a kit of parts though. So it's a modular construction built with SIPS panels. And then the exterior layers are all applied. And so these wood slats here that you're seeing here were reused and just revisioned um, to be put on a diagonal just to try to freshen up that facade. The windows themselves can be moved around. So that was fair game for the students since they are of a certain quantity uh, and a known quantity for them. Um, Getting to the back side, you'll see so what looks like a small sort of uh, you know low profile structure on that front main level um, is actually gives way to a two story structure. So the building that we looked at was it did include two stories. It's roughly about just under three thousand square feet on that top floor, and the bottom floor is about fifteen hundred square feet roughly. Um, and they come in in the late weeks of November, early December, storms and weather permitting, and they come in and put these big flat, they don't even dig into the ground really, but they have these flat uh, platforms that they level this area here, which is what you're seeing. They put up scaffolding, this whole building is actually supported by scaffolding, um, and then they drop in those SIPs panels and structures, and um, then it's for this rapid turnaround, six to seven weeks total of construction from, from I would say grassy knoll, but really it's an icy hill um, to full outfitted functional building. So this is the underbelly that you're seeing here and some of the, even the mechanical feeds that are really uh, feeding into different rooms. So then quickly a word about the kind of structures we are looking at just in consideration. What we see happening here is what I was alluding to, whether it's an interior takeover uh, like uh, Amazon Web Services has a presence at the WEF and this was their um, you know, interface for meetings, for meeting clients. This was really a closed space. This was not so much of a um, you know, open forum walk in during the day, but they did have private events um, here. This, um, every, this is the fourth year that William McDonough has been there for the McDonough Foundation that um, to put on display this whole idea of assembly and disassembly, kind of as a building experiment. Uh, and the, he built right on top of this existing building here. This happens directly across the street from our pavilion. Facebook and Google also have a similar aspect of a pop-up pavilion, a very rapid construction, uh, but a building that is made to look like it's a permanent structure similar to our pavilion. So um, just a word quickly on the client, Palantir, um, they, they, so these big names in tech here, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, which we see in the news and we're all very familiar with because largely as the general public, we interface with them. Uh, Palantir is a not as well known tech firm um, because the product they supply really deals with a direct client relationship. And from the most fundamental point, what they do is they, they have a product, which is really kind of a software that is used to sort data uh, that is owned by their client um, so that they never, they never steal or mine data, but they take that, they're able to um, sort it, sort metadata to make it a friendly user interface for their client. That's the most basic level. It's been used to find terrorist cells, optimize shampoo distribution to, uh, to I would, so, so the, from a whole range of things. They also have a huge NGO sector um, where they're dealing with um, how to, you know, promote or deploy. They've, they donated their product to a company, Team Rubicon, to deploy first responders to figure out uh, to, and, and live update maps to figure out where obstacles were and how to get uh, emergency help to people and things like that. They've been doing um, other things to uh, help track homeless people who get lost in the system. 
and that they move from place to place and then they're not getting the kind of access they should be getting to the kind of support that's out there just because they're getting lost. So they do, um, they do certainly do help, you know, they also have clients like Goldman Sachs. So they do both. Um, so they, they work with everyone as a different way to interface with their person, with their, with their owned data that they have. However, um, because of these other relationships with the government or even in part of their relationship with the government is, um, as Ivy was talking about earlier, um, with ICE. They're not looking for uh, unemployed or undocumented immigrants. They're not trying to help the, they actually are working with ICE to help support the kind of proper immigration chains. And so it's very easily misconstrued or misunderstood because they primarily protect their clients' privacy so it's very easy to see headlines and um, uh, in the media, as I say, as I said in that write up, they're often sullied in the media because they have the power. They do have the power to do bad, right? They could, but they actually are very transparent about their intent of using tech for good. And so this was just a slide that Ivy, one of the students in the class put together about this idea of the general perception of who Palantir is. And so part of this building that they're asked to um, provide at the WEF is to help educate either future current clients or the general public, and by public, I mean the World Economic Forum public, about who they are and what they do. Um, and so this is their branding. This is their marketing. There really aren't any other avenues they pursue um, in order to have a presence to show who they are. So this is the, why they are willing to put a lot of funding into this building. This is just a quick uh, snapshot. This is their CEO, Alex Karp. He's the functional um, executive that attends the WEF. And so he'll be the, he's the sort of lead person in all the meetings um, versus the person you hear about a lot would be Peter Thiel um, was part of the founders, uh, one of the founders coming from PayPal. Um, and however, he doesn't have a strong day-to-day -day presence at, at the company. So as far as getting back down to nuts and bolts, um, the students were given pretty raw parameters from the client about what needed to be included in the building. And I sorted it here based on the code that we employed, which I went ahead and, and asked them to not only follow IBC, but uh, State of Texas and City of Austin codes for, for public buildings. We really fell under two major categories. The main level is really all assembly type spaces. And so you'll see all those different kind of um, amenities that are provided for the client. And then the business type spaces are really dedicated to that lower level, employees only. Um, it has a separate egress and entrance from the out exterior of the building if needed, um, as well as a connecting stair. But really the only people sort of traversing that stair would be employees. Lastly, um, I asked them when they were transitioning from their construction documents and their job books into their presentation documents. These are two questions I gave the students and I said, I really want you to think about your project in these terms. So how has your project exemplified the means of using building systems as an integrated design tool? Because that's a huge part in what we do. Uh, they are lectured and instructed to integrate and design with mechanical, electrical, plumbing, structural systems, et cetera, assembly logic. Um, and then how well have you addressed your initial design intent for your client, which is something that they established very early on in the semester with their programming documents. Um, so that's all I have for you. Let me stop sharing here. Before we jump in with the student presentations, they should be, they know their client and the building and the site very well. So they should also be able to answer any questions. Um, but do we have any questions from the reviewers before we proceed, whether it's studio parameters or expectations or anything like that? All right, wonderful. Okay, thank you for enjoying my brief, not brief introduction. Okay, Anne and Ashlyn, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. 
Lean chair. Okay. Okay, so um, Palantir challenges how leading institutions solve critical data issues, and they are constantly making technology-based connections, and the more connections they have, the more successful they are. And we can't hear you. Do you have your- Oh, you can? It says you're- Do you have your volume turned up? I can hear. You can hear me? I can also hear you. Hello now. Yes. Is it just me? Can everybody else hear Anne? Just yeah. me. No, that's not good. Okay, I'll work on that. Okay. Um, Palantir wants to show other businesses that they can be a backbone for their company. Our goal to rebrand and represent Palantir in these ways was to present Palantir as a backbone for connections. Emphasize that Palantir is a company that cares and to create a space where visitors feel established and connected. The pavilion is located in Davos, Switzerland and is divided into three zones. Upon entering, you approach the ambiguous space that is intended for social and informational connections. Adjacent to that is the impact zone where visitors will feel connected. And then deeper into the space is the business connection zone where privacy is more apparent. The overall feeling of the space, um, we wanted it to be Swiss, sophisticated, professional, inviting, and elevated. The design of the pavilion is intended to draw some mystery and make connections in a non-conventional way. And so that render that you're looking at right there is our demo wall. And um, to the right is the coffee bar. The demo wall is what you see right after you enter through the entry vestibule, which you'll see in the plan um, in a second. But um, before walking through the plan, we, yeah, we have panoramas and if you have mural on your laptop, if you double click um, the images, it will pop into another tab to show you um, them. So this one, I'm only gonna zoom up, so don't give everyone vertigo, but this is from the business connection zone, which is, oh, excuse me, the social connection zone, which is when you first walk in, it's where all the presentations and a lot of the mingling happens and you have a big view of the mountains. And then we have our impact zone, which has the coffee and the lobby. And so that is where like you feel invited and you get all the amenities that Palantir has to offer. Um, and then there's a big louver wall, which brings you into the business connection zone, which, um, Contains all the offices, conference rooms, um, a little business lobby. So that's like a little overview, but you can look on your own uh, computer so it doesn't weird out everyone's eyes because it's so moving. But yeah, so those are our three zones. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the top floor, the main floor where you enter. And um, you enter up over in the top left corner, that's the entry vestibule. And we decided to pull it out so that it wasn't flat on the north facade because we wanted to emphasize the transition of coming into the pavilion so that the, it felt kind of like the users were being let in on the secret. And then um, throughout the entire space, you see a central circulation, and we wanted a central circulation because uh, that's where we had it acting as the backbone for the pavilion. Um, and then, so once you enter, you first see the concierge desk, and right to the right is that demo wall that I was talking about. And so that's where you kind of enter into this ambiguous space where you have the presentation that can hold night events and um, 
like informational sessions and then during the day people just can sit work hang out drink coffee and then we have the bathroom in the back so that no one could see you going to the bathroom which um for the people that are at this event is um something important to them and then over in the middle impact space is the coffee bar and behind the coffee bar is the stair um, stairs down to the bottom floor and we chose to hide that because um, the only people using the stairs are the employees and we didn't want uh, the users to kind of be curious what's going on down there and so we just got out of sight out of mind and then across from the coffee bar is um, our connection lobby um, that's just where you can sit and drink your coffee uh, hang out just a public space and then once you're following down the central circulation there are curved louver walls and we did a curve because it just when you're in this space it alludes like there's more depth and it's not like a scary just long hallway of wood and so the curve kind of added something extra to it and it also kind of brought back our intention of bringing mystery and like it makes you want to go down there and so the, on the north side, that's the private executive office for Alex Karp. And then to the right of that is our large conference room. And then uh, across the way is the small business lobby that we kind of just had so that if you're waiting to go into the large conference room, if you have to quickly take a business call or something. And then to the left is our smaller conference room, which is it's not fully walled off, but it was that wood screen that you saw in the panorama. And then when you're exiting, there's another exit vestibule, which is enclosed by, again, wood louvers that are etched in with the counter logo. And so then the bottom floor, we wanted, we first had like a lot of the space, the layout was, um, kind of designed for us because it came from, we dropped the louvers from the concierge wall and the wall going down to the stairs, the louvers are floor to ceiling um, throughout the entire building, just in those two spaces. And so that first kind of enclosed how we wanted to map out the bottom floor. And then we wanted to mimic the language of that central circulation on, on the bottom floor too. So we also kind of have that but um, when you first walk down the stairs, that kind of back corner is another bathroom and a telephone booth. And then there are just open seating areas for employees, employee workspace. And um, the louvers for the concierge wall that drop down actually wrap over and create a serving table for um, the employees lunch and dinner. And then the other two rooms to the right. The top is a programming office um, for maintenance and then the bottom is a commercial kitchen. Um, so we created an installation since our design's intent was to enforce the idea that Palantir is the backbone for connection. We decided our design should mimic the same dialogue. So this installation acts as a backbone in the design which connects the three program zones um, because we wanted the different zones to have their different purposes but still allow program mobility and not have it closed off. And so in order to do this, the installation is centrally located in the plan um, and above the circulation space that we made. Um, it leads occupants through the space and adds an aura of mystery as you're not sure what's behind the installation or what it leads to, but it still communicates um, a central theme of circulation and connection. Um, the materials used in this installation is injection mold plastic and purple glass. Um, the colored glass and a few gla gaps in the installation allow light from the ceiling extension and um, some hidden lighting behind the installation. So it creates this interesting lighting condition with 
and like colored light and such. Um, and then we have some details showing how it's put together and how it's attached to the building within the space. So the installation is suspended from the ceiling by wire cables. It has double clip um, joints that hold each piece together. And um, that's attached to a wire suspension cable that connects to the ceiling, as you can see here, um, which um, kind of makes it look like a floating um, object on the ceiling. And then also um, it connects to the louvers in some places where it extends down, which you can see in section view here, it kind of peers down a little bit, which is just screwed into the wood louvers. And so that was the intent behind that. And then we have our ceiling. Um, so the extended ceiling Ashton was just talking about, we did that because we wanted to kind of, like for the same reason we pulled out the entry vestibule, uh, vestibule to like emphasize an importance. We wanted to pull out the ceiling uh, to emphasize importance. And so, from the exterior of the building, um, if you're up north on the north Davos and you're up on in the mountains, other pavilions that are on higher levels can see um, that there is this one pavilion that at night time you're seeing like purple glowing lights and um, you are wondering what that is and it just gives uh, the Palantir Pavilion kind of more of um, a hierarchy just um, in Davos alone. Um, and so also this detail below just shows that we chose to have the light, uh, the glazing run in channels. And um, that's how we chose to assemble that. And then another aspect with the extended ceiling is that we wanted to utilize the natural light coming in. And um, you can see that the, we chose to have acrylic in the floors, acrylic bridges in two places, so that if you're on the bottom floor, light is coming in from the natural light and reflecting down into the bottom floor, which doesn't have a lot of natural light. And so that's how we chose to implement some more light down there, as well as you can see up into the installation. And um, light also, natural light coming from the back of the installation also reflects, which you'll be able to see in some renders, like triangulated shapes um, all across the space, just depending on the time of day. Um, it ends up looking, having a cool effect. Um, and then, so you can look at our RCPs. Um, they demonstrate our lighting placement and selections. It also shows the different ceiling heights. So in larger, more public spaces, we have 12 foot, three inch ceilings um, that are made of two foot by two foot ceiling grid with black high fiber density board. And then in our smaller spaces, we have 10 foot ceilings that have um, wood paneling. And so it just kind of like uh, divides the space. And then we have some of our selections. You can kind of get a general idea, but um, uh, all of the lighting is placed kind of in correlation with furniture or the installation or the general geometry of the room. And then if you see the bottom floor, we have all eight foot ceilings and wood paneling um, material application as well. And so for this, for the studio, our design specifically thought a lot about the MEP because we needed to have it integrated into the floor, which has acrylic cutouts and the installation. And so the first thing we started with when designing was the lighting and the sprinklers and where that placement was going to go without messing with the installation. And then when it came to integrating the mechanical, we wanted to avoid ceiling uh, problems with the ceiling. So we did run the HVAC through the floor. So there are only floor registers and users. Um, and then on the bottom floor, again, like the lighting, 
um, kind of the lighting on the bottom floor came more from where we wanted furniture and what type of program it was. And then the HVAC for there is, is the ceiling. And so they're, they're ceiling registers and diffuser. Um, but the main part with that designing that was the acrylic and having to run it around that. And so these sections represent our space long, longitudinally <laughs> facing the north walls and south walls of the space. Um, the, this shows the length of the installation and kind of what, how it dips and where it's uh, dipping, which was kind of based on what program was going on. And then you can see kind of the louvers where the louvers drop down from the concierge um, into the bottom floor. And then kind of how the business area is kind of significantly more, um, is like different from the middle and the beginning because there's less black paint and black um, finish application. It's more um, just wood louvers. Um, so diving more into our louvers, the louvers were created to divide program space in a cohesive way that allows for varying levels of privacy, which is very important for a data company like Palantir. So visibility of the user or visibility um, differs as you walk by the different thicknesses. So you have thin louvers, which are two by two, and there's a lot of transparency between um, the programs. And then we have the sides of the thin louvers are painted purple to kind of have more of a branding moment for Palantir. It also creates a dynamic view as the user walks by these because you see more or less purple depending from what angle you're looking at within the space. Then we have uh, thicker louvers, which are two by 18 inches. Um, these louvers have less vi visibility for most angles, but not total privacy. These louvers are for spaces that need more of a barrier, like between different program zones. And um, they also double as structural columns, which is something that helped us in space planning. And then the thick louver wall that you have on the bottom here, these are two by 12 louvers with a six inch wall behind them. And this allows for complete privacy acoustically and visibility wise for more protected spaces that require that, um, which is typically with the business zone because there's a lot more um, intense conversation happening that shouldn't be public. Um, and then if we just go into the elevations, they show um, various spaces with the louvers. So this is the concierge desk, which have the thick louvers. So um, there's less visibility. So there's more of an entrance threshold. This is the main circulation looking into the business zone. And so there's not a lot that you can see beyond that louver wall because you're trying to create more privacy. Uh, this is looking at a view from the circulation in the business zone. So that would be Carb's office that you can only kind of see through and then the conference room to which the louvers block from the outside um, and some other just office views creating that. So in this, this render, um, basically this render shows the louvers are creating a visible threshold, which easily noted by the user and silently communicates the barrier between these programs. The, the corner of these louver walls are filleted in order to create a softer boundary that mimics the curvature of the installation right above it. And then if you go into the conference room, this shows the louvers within a space. They act as a privacy barrier between the inside and exterior street setting beyond this window. We wanted to have natural light within the space, so we put windows, but um, the louvers allow for privacy even with windows and it gives a little frame to the street view. So, um, 
So our furniture plans, um, we just kind of, our selections consisted mostly of wood, black steel, uh, and most of the upholstery was wool because we did want to stick true to the Swiss vibe and um, kind of mimicking the site and where they were, but we also wanted to elevate it and so um, have the furniture be elevated yet Swiss and natural and comfortable. Um, another aspect that we wanted to implement into our furniture was that we wanted some custom furniture because we wanted to kind of have the idea of exclusivity and that you could only get it um, at the pavilion. So this is what we call in our ambiguous furniture. This is a metal form that has varying heights so that the user controls how they want to use it. Um, and then another aspect that we designed was our concierge desk. And the concierge desk, this is a millwork drawing, but our concierge desk has two desk heights, um, primarily that was for ADA. Uh, and it has various materials, concrete panels, brushed metal panels, white oak wood, and wood louvers again. The wood louvers are um, in front so that we could, we wanted to cut into it again like we did at the exit so that when you were coming into the space, the first thing you saw was um, the logo, but we didn't want the logo to be kind of obnoxious, so we wanted to implement it into our design as much as possible. So we just did that by naturally just etching in to the wood louvers that we were already having. Um, but that's pretty much all. Yeah. How did you come up with the two different systems, the ceiling and the wall system? Um, like design-wise? Yeah, and the, the goal for both of them. Um, well, the ceiling was made in Grasshopper. Our initial design, um, we had it in it where it looked like an actual backbone and we didn't want it to be like a, a cheesy metaphor. So we wanted to distract it a little bit more. And then a lot of our space is very linear and um, like organized. And so we wanted to kind of ha contrast that with kind of a chaotic, more geometric ceiling. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and so we started with the louvers and we kind of made a lot of iterations of it. And we're kind of trying to find what we liked because we thought it represented kind of the Swiss vibe that we wanted to implement even while having like the intensity of Palantir. And so we thought the ceiling installation kind of like contrast each other to kind of emphasize the purpose of both, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I think it's a very mysterious vibe overall. Um, I think the use of black and the darker colors create this uh, yeah, mystery or data world, um, almost like a behind the scenes that you don't get to see. So I appreciate um, that aspect of it um, and the sort of the, the um, ambient you're creating. And I think the two systems are very successful on their own, but I wonder, I would like to see them integrated a little more. I don't know how you would do that. Like, I don't know if um, they, they would share more of the same language, like if the ceiling system then became wood as it turns vertical, but mm -hmm. you keep some of that same geometry, or I don't know if the skeleton that would hold the triangles in place is what comes down from it, just so that there's a little more integration between the two because they're they're both so strong, and this isn't a huge space. So then I I would that's my only <laughs> my main critique is that I would want them to be a little more integrated so that it um, it was softer and more communication between the two. But both of them are great. 
Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, that's I think good. I think for me, like one of the, and it builds on that that point because I feel I, I think um, uh, Ellie's point um, about the the sort of discontinuity between them. I mean, there's a few discontinuities. It's a, there's a formal one. There's sort of an interface one, like how they come together or how they touch or don't touch each other. Um, there's a material one. Um, there's a sort of performative one. And so like, I think, you know, it doesn't have to be that everything blends together. I think they can be their own thing. But I think the, the question is, is when they come into contact, when they come into closeness of relation to each other, how can you sort of either play up their discontinuity um, or merge them or find some interaction between them, either formally, spatially, materially, uh, uh, through luminance, uh, whatever it might be. I think that's the that's the part kind of is a little bit unresolved. I think um, there are some there are parts that are super resolved. I think I think the the clarity of the of the louver system is I think you've really thought through that and how it sort of works and operates. I would like to see that same thought come into those interactions between them. I mean, even in this one, you see it kind of like the frayed edge like I don't think I don't think your scheme that you would have an edge that's sort of frayed in this in this particular you know scheme that you're kind of playing around with which is about sophistication and clean and sort of really sort of like tight um, conditions uh, or, or resolutions of, of materials or systems um, and so either that or it needs to be a lot more frayed and a lot more textile a lot more sheet skinny uh, kind of like uh, detailing at the edge maybe. Um, but I think that's just a point. I think I, I actually appreciate the sort of idea of introducing this sort of quasi parametric kind of system into the, into the overall. I'm a little unsure as to its scale, you know, the scale of the, of the tessellation relative to the overall scale of the space. I think you could play around with that a bit more and how it interacts and interfaces with the other pieces. Um, but other, uh, otherwise, I think it's, I, generally it's the right, maybe the, a good idea to play with, but I think, I, think you, I think it just needs a little bit more attention. Um, the detailing, how it, you know, is a drop ceiling, it's pretty conventional. You know, it's, it's, you know, even in this image, I see the, the ceiling grid on the, on the, on the, on the black uh, uh, acoustical ceiling beyond. Like you would really go to pains not to see that in this. you want it black so it goes away, right? And so like, even if you fake it for your, for your image, you wouldn't want to see that grid, even though we know that you sort of went to the, to the uh, trouble of, of modeling it and it's in your, you know, it's in the drawings and things like that. And so I think it's just, in some ways, there's a little bit of like art direction that could happen. Um, and, the, and a little bit of like refinement uh, of the overall, like even the, you know, the Pete's coffee board to me seems like totally out of left field for the high end quality that you're going for. I know it's, it's sort of a representation of like, here is like where tea would be, but I don't, I don't think these people would be serving Pete's coffee. You know, I think it's going to be something not to be snobby about it, but I think it would be something a little bit more elevated than that. <laughs> Yeah. They actually, the I think two, oh. <laughs> two, two years ago, they actually flew in baristas from Phil's Coffee out from Palo Alto. They flew in. Yeah. 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 I think, just, you know, I think it, it's, it's just my snobby, maybe coffee snob in me, but I, I just feel like even if it was Pete's Coffee, it would not be that logo. It would be like a refined thing that would be, you know, it wouldn't be like, I don't know. I think it just. Yeah. Just a little thing that's like a tell in terms of like the quality, you know, some of the questions, of the quality of the overall space and what do you want to, what do you want to show? Um, but other than that, I think, I mean, generally, I want, I like the scale of this project. I think, Allison, you've done a, a good job to give them a, a scale that makes sense for having to get to this level of detail. So I appreciate that because um, I've seen these studios in the past where it's like, you know, 30,000 square feet and, so, you know, it's impossible. Um, and so I think you start to see how much work has to happen to, to sort of resolve these projects. But, you know, I think I applaud the, the general planning, the overall thrust of the project. Um, I think some, some little, little small planning issues like the, the, the seats next to the, the door on the right hand side of the door, or the left, your left as you're coming in, it's kind of, you kind of see one of them back behind uh, 
this woman at the at the coffee bar like those seem weirdly spaced in that in that little nook i mean they're little they're little kind of issues like that that i have but i think overall it's a it's a it's a nice project and and uh well well thought through yeah and i really love um that split on the floor and the skylight above the fact that you're thinking about how you see the building at night and this glow so that it's not just the inside you're not just crafting the inside you're also crafting a bit of the outside experience yeah. and then bringing yeah. it all the way down i feel like basements are always kind of ignored or like oh it's a basement but so i really appreciate yeah. when you can bring in light from all sorts of places yeah i also just one other comment and then i'll shut up but like i think the one thing about a project like this is like what i like is that there's there are lots of things like lurking underneath the surface of this uh, both being in Davos and being, you know, th these kind of companies that sort of like claim, you know, uh, you know, it's the sort of um, techno utopian model. Like we're doing, we're going to make the world a better place, and it's, and it's like Facebook, and we're like harvesting, you know, information and all these things. And so, and I think it's okay. You're going to work for companies that you may or may not, or that may or may not have the best of motives, or the, you know, that ultimately they're not, you know, you're not working for Mother Teresa all the time. But like, I think, I think. If I were you, I would come back to the project and just sort of start to question a little bit of like, who is it for and like, how critical can you be in that in, in a model of, you know, where you, you know, we talked about this in, student, in um, professional practice, you know, like, who is it and, and what is my relationship to that? I, I still need to build and I have to have a firm and I have to do awesome work and all those things. But like, it's, it, it's hovering underneath the surface. I don't think we need to get into it so much, but I just wanted to bring that up because it is lurking in the sort of like, um the, the 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 prompt here so yeah um i think that um that was going to be part of my 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 comments um i mean i thanks for it for the presentation and yeah i alice and i love the setting uh for the studio you know like also davos it's you know the setting for an amazing novel by thomas mann uh, the magic mountain so I, I, I appreciated like all of those aspects that how they come into place into the, you know, uh, setup for the studio. Um, but also, I mean, I think you guys started, um, Ashleen and Anne, talking about mystery uh, right uh, after Allison is t t telling us about like how this particular company is struggling to be presented or like how the, its image is presented to the public. So uh, I, I thought like, oh, so, <laughs> to a company that seems dubious and, and a little bit, you know, uh, dishonest, it's, you know, presented to a public or a larger pro uh, public with an aura of mystery. So I, I don't know, like, how much I can agree with that. Um, but at the same time, like, um, I'm just curious, you know, like, uh, how far, this is maybe not a question, just a comment for you uh, to reflect upon. But it's just like images of technology um, are presented to us every day, right? Like from movies to TV shows to even the interfaces we interact with uh, when we are using, you know, digital platforms, right? Um, so there are many ways in which future or, you know, futuristic representations of the world are presented through those images, right? So I'm just curious to, to know a little bit what is it that you see in the future or the, the type of future that your images are creating? And, and to think about, you know, what is the, then the role of technology in, in that vision of the future, right? Like every project is just like a little, you know, um, mirror through which we can glimpse into that possible future, right? So, and I think like the future that you guys are presenting is, is borrowing too much from the past, if I may say. Right, like the fact that you know, uh, because it is a digital company, then you have to rely on the aesthetics of digital architecture or what digital architecture was at the beginning of the twenty uh, first century. All the language of parametrism and and all you know, also its baggage, the the, the inability of control it or the inability to actually translate it in its all material capacities. Um, so, and you know that this relates to Clay's. Uh, um, comment re, re, uh, regarding like the scale of the tessellations, right? So like at, to what point were you guys so much in control of the images that you were creating? And if those images actually, uh, you know, 
give us uh, the effects that you guys are, you know, really pursuing to introduce us to. And I think uh, that, that means that created the systems would have made it more successful because I think the wood is so warm and soft and um, approachable, and then the the ceiling grid is kind of the complete opposite. So then it almost highlights that um, contradiction between the two. Yeah, I understand that. Um. I mean, sorry, like, I, I think like you don't really have to answer me now, but but I think it would be interesting as you guys progress in, you know, in your education and as you become, you know, practicing uh, architects and designers to, to maybe reflect on that, like in what ways you contribute to our visual culture, right? Uh, you know, like when um, Stanley Kubrick created like the first ideas of, you know, the future inhabiting space, right? Like he created this very iconic images, right? of what the world could be or like what the future could look like, right? And every time you guys are, you know, making these renderings, it could be interesting for you to reflect a little bit more about that, right? Like not only what it means to this particular company that, that obviously is, you know, trying to create or to use the spaces as a, as a means of, you know, branding their identity, um, but also maybe, you know, how you guys think the future might play it out. And I think like those are interesting questions to have also, um, not only, you know, um, from the perspective of, you know, uh, theory, but even a, a, as the perspective of practice, right? Um, which I think it, it's very interesting. So, you know, um, the only warning that I would give you guys is, you know, to, to avoid relying on the, on the stereotypes of those images that we have already seen. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think there's like a lot of different iterations that we could think of and that's very thought provoking. So thank you. I think it's, a, I, I, I really appreciate the comment from Jana because I think it's, it's one of the things that we um, initially intended to try to encounter because one of the themes of the World Economic Forum this past year was, um, they called it tech for good, but it was the power of artificial intelligence and, and really what, um, really what Palantir is putting forward, they're saying it's not really artificial, it's augmented because the human interface is really important and it's actually the key component to that. And so that requirement in there, and I actually appreciate this project as a nice way to bring that to the forefront because of, um, we were talking about conflict or, but really um, one of the ways that I think that um, Anne and Ashlyn have really continually questioned their project was from an aspect of discord and where how mysteries arrive. So they use the word ambiguous a lot and this amount of discord of we were kind of in a position and maybe it's not too, it might actually not be a future thinking, um, you know, proposal. It might actually be about questioning our present. And, and I think that that's very valid and it's quite compelling to do that. And so it, it comes up in a matter of these places of the, all of these areas crashing together. These, this really sort of like as, as um, Clay put it like this, pseudo parametric piece, but it's actually been put together in quite an, an analogous way and then screwed to a wood wall. Like I think it brings the question how we implement sort of um, the, the proposal between say a set design and you know, what is performance and what is a, you know, function. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of discord that happens in the project uh, continually to the point of, um, almost to the point of discomfort. You know, we talked about there's sort of this one, that one where the wood wall goes down to the employee area with the opening of the floor, it's sort of this glorious moment of connection. And then we see it repeated by the coffee bar and it's a place of discomfort. And so I think that there's a lot of questioning happening here. Um, and so I, I, I applaud you um, and, and Ashlyn for putting forward that proposal that creates that amount of discomfort and discord. Um, and I would encourage you to keep thinking that way and be able to really um, develop a clear um, and articulate uh, presentation that puts forward that that idea at the forefront of what is it uh, what it what does it mean to present a mysterious proposal or a proposal about mystery um and because i think there's, there's really a lot to work with there so thank you yeah i think that's a that, I, I think when you when you you know through perjana's uh comment and then yours uh, allison i mean i think what i think maybe what's un, unclear is that if it is about dissonance 
or discordance um, of systems and the crashing together of, of low and high um, mm -hmm. technology, but also methodologies of, of construction and materialities and things like that, then it, then it's then it's not quite it's not enough there, right? Yeah. Like, Yep. It's, it's so close that it becomes ambiguous to the point that's not helpful. Like actually, mm -hmm. in some ways, if you're going to go there, like there would be, ha there would have to be some moment where it is unambiguously discordant, right? Rather than frustratingly discordant, which is where it kind of is, in, at least for me right now, like it's, it's discordant in the way that seems like accidental. Whereas I think you want to be like, you don't want to be too ironic about that sort of position, at least for me, like I would like just to be straightforward about we're questioning the role of technology relative to human experience and the larger world and how all this data flow might come through these different systems. And here's a representation of data and here's a representation of humanity and here's how they come together. You know, like I think you could, I, I think if that's the, the thesis of the project, then I would really go there a little bit more, you know, and which is, yep. You know, in the context of having to figure it all out too, I, I get why why it would be not not quite you know you wouldn't that's because that's a theoretical kind of like problem. But I do like really fundamentally believe that that ideas do come through materiality, um, and they do come through form, and they do come through the interaction of all these things with people. And so, like you can have a very complex, high-minded idea that does come through like screw placement. You know, and and like how that is, and I really fundamentally believe that. And so you could look at different projects where you have a a, a brute uh, kind of uh, like detailing mixed with a high end super. You know, and I think a lot of OMA's work kind of rides that line, for example. And so um, you know, go there and start to think about that because I do think it is a timely kind of like um, criticality, uh, but it's just not quite there yet. But that's that's okay in, in yeah. terms of the rest of the all right. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Ian and Ashlyn. Um, if you want to stop sharing the uh, Jingyu, we can jump right into your presentation. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Is it okay? Um, okay. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Jing Yu. Um, my design idea is based on creating a delightful space for a high-tech firm, Palantir. As a high-tech company with data science as its primary business, has a prominent increasing influence on the development of the world economy and science. The Palantir's pavilion at the Davos conference is designed to eliminate people's negative imp impression of high-tech and data science. Um, such as the sense of coldness and insecurity. This design started by discussing the privacy of meeting and office spaces. Usually people will gather in the big public space through the reception area, which I show here in this privacy diagram. Uh, uh, they will gather in a big public space through the reception area for large scale socialization. And then they will be this proceed to semi private or private spaces of, in of interest for talks. So the private space is wrapped around the central public space in this pavilion. Also, my design concept is from the snow mountain at the site. Uh, I want to simulate the soft shape of the snow as it melts in contrast to the steep exterior landscape to give people the experience of worms and nature. Uh, here are the main floor plan and sections. Uh, in this section, uh, you guys can see the white form that runs through the first to second floors to simulate the melting process of snow. Waves of different size, from space and volume uh, from the ceiling to the level. On the one hand, it contrasts with the steep snow mountains and cliffs at the site, even the experience of warmth and security to people. The soft and fluent shape, on the other hand, reflects the blurring of the boundaries of different interior spaces, creating more 
ambiguous and shared public spaces and promoting interpersonal communication. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, the circulation on this plan. So basically here is the, uh, the main entrance. So people uh, come, uh, come in from the outside. This is the reception desk. Uh, and this is the restroom and ADA restroom. So when they come in here, they, go, they can go uh, see this demo area here. And then they come into uh, through this door to two uh, semi-private meeting room. Or they can choose to go uh, this like kind of narrow hallway and then they can enter in the most public area, the lounge located at the center. And um, here's a coffee bar and here is the uh, semi-private presentation room. And uh, on the right, here is the private meeting room. Um, and they can uh, choose to go to the circulation area and then uh, leave the space. Um, also, I want to say a little bit about this meeting room three. Um, the wall of the semi-public meeting room near reception is made of bamboo with the flexible acoustic fabric covers on it also provide the sense of more security for people. Um, so this form will dig down to the lower level as a staircase here. Uh, and there is more space such as IT support, um, staff office and kitchen for employees using here. Uh, talking about this, um, this form, uh, the organic form can be achieved well by large scale 3D printing technology. Meanwhile, using bio-based plastic re represents the net natural and sustainable characteristics. Bio-based plastics are made in whole or partially from renewable biological resources, which is a good alternative because it is more uh, environmental friendly than concrete. And I also um, have some, uh, uh, the, like the different size of circle holes on this shape. Uh, one is to um, get more lighting, uh, like the, uh, uh, the natural lighting. Uh, another is to um, kind of simulate the, uh, the, the snow. And here are the uh, two uh, detail section. This one is to show how the form connected with the ceiling. And the lower one is to show how the, uh, that bamboo part connected with the form and the ceiling. The axonometric view shows, shows the integrated and fluency of the space. Uh, here are some perspectives here. Um, this is the reception with demo area, which is here. And the second one is the hallway. And here is the bamboo, uh, that bamboo meeting room. And this one is the uh, staircase. The th third one is coffee bar, which people are, um, um, have different activities in this the launch, the most public area. And this one is the presentation room and the wall is made by uh, acrylic sheet. Uh, this is the uh, lounge and coffee bar perspective. This perspe 
perspective represents the contrast between the steep snow mountain and the soft streamline of interior form. And also um, um, the bamboo fabric glass and white plastic shows the different materialities and gives people a sense of different hierarchy of space of privacy for them to choose. And on um, standing beside the staircase uh, provides a good view of the outside. Um, this perspective, I think, also shows the contrast between outside and inside, uh, and also um, uh, the soft shape. Um, and uh, this shape has the function of kind of wayfinding and blurring the space boundary at the same time. Um, the interior green area um, have the like the organic elements of the space and the natural landscape of the site and at the same time has effect of improving the interior air quality. Um, here are my uh, reflected ceiling plan. So um, those spot elevation shows the different heights of the ceiling, which matches the wave of my form. Uh, about lighting fixture chosen, uh, I chose like very uh, kind of concise and simple style uh, to match like that, um, uh, the concise form. Uh, I have a, pa a pendant lighting here, uh, right uh, about the coffee bar. And, uh, uh, and at the, this, uh, the reception area. Here are the life safety plan and some general notes. Uh, these are the furniture plan. Uh, about furniture chosen, I choose most like uh, furniture made of uh, uh, wood, like cherry wood and oak. And uh, the color of other uh, sofa and desk, I choose like lighter lighter color to match the um, uh, the main like white uh, uh, color in the space. And this is the uh, panorama. If you guys scan this QR code, you can uh, be immersive in the space. And that's all, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Jin Yu. Um, I just have a, a question. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify it. Um, so, so this structure that is embedded as part of your ceiling condition that you know uh, punctures and touches the ground. Um, how do you think it's going to be assembled? Um, did you also thought about like the process by which it comes together on site um, and those sort of ideas? Because it seems seamless, right? Like there, there doesn't seem to be a seam anywhere. So I was just curious to know, like, in what ways do you think um, this artifact can, you know, come on site? Also, like in terms of its dimension, right? Like if you were to think about its transportation, right? Like um, the size of, you know, um, a truck bed, you know, where these things would come into um, the site. Um, if those sort of reflections also informed its form, but also, you know, how it gets assembled. Um, uh, yeah, I, I researched that uh, in, the, uh, in the Europe, 
or actually more about like in North Europe, there are a lot of like large scale 3D printer uh, research and projects there. So uh, I, th I think like uh, people can do it there, like, and uh, it will print as one piece, the whole the whole, the, uh, the whole piece, or um, like the, only the part of the, uh, the dig, dig assemble without sealing, and then they can connect it the sealing with the, those parts. That's closer. Is still you're never going to print that ceiling in one piece. That piece on the this piece coming down that you just pointed out, you can print. You can do that. Uh, the ceiling you would you could print it too, but you would still have to make it in parts. And so you know the interfaces and the seams that that Prajana is asking about is actually a good point because it's. It, I think it would actually help the project in some ways to start to have and track and you know coordinate those seams to do some other work for you. But uh, yeah, I think again, it's not a. I mean, the 3D, the utopia of 3D printing, <laughs> seamless, massive things. I mean, you can print pretty damn big stuff, but you can't print like that. And even on site, you would still have to print in parts. And so, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I'm working on a 3D printed project right now that's 20 something feet tall and five or seven feet wide in spots. And so, and that still has to be printed in like four chunks, you know, and that's using big big scale, massive printing, uh, you know, technology. And so, you know, I, I'm, all, but I'm all for that, but like, you really have to get, get real about what it can do. I would actually say that the ceiling needs to be not 3D printed, but would, would need to be like a stretch ceiling, like Barisol or Ferrari or these kinds of tech, technologies that, that really could do that kind of figure uh, and would probably be easier, more transportable and would look better. Okay. I was thinking so, that that it could be if it was just thought of like a tensile fabric or something that's lighter that then would have could also be used later used in other installations. I think that would make it more versatile. But aside from that, I think it's a beautiful idea of connecting the outside and bringing it into the building and using the clarity of the site um, to give the company <laughs> that clarity and um, kind of transparency uh, in a way. Yeah, it's just like the reason why I ask is because I, I, I mean, we, we always, you know, dream of having, you know, like a seamless architecture <laughs> there where like things just come together by, you know, some sort of magic. Uh, but there is a lot of stress um, in, in joints. There is a lot of stress where, you know, two materials meet. Um, so, so I think that um, it could be interesting to understand also in what ways, you know, um, the seam can become, you know, uh, an important, um, um, an, an instrumental um, tool within your design, right? Um, and also, because I think like, if you think also about the manufacturing processes, right? Of, of what you're designing would also allow you to, you know, not only make them seem more real, but also will expand, uh, you, you know, what you know about form and how certain things are, you know, made. So yeah, whether, you know, you go for te the, a tensile structure or, you know, a, a thermoform one or a 3D printed one, I think it is, there's also something about, you know, the process of making and the register of that, you know, uh, uh, manufacturing process um, embedded in the form itself that could, you know, also reveal so much about your intentions uh, as a designer, but also what, what the impact of new manufacturing techniques are in the uh, configuration of interior spaces, right? Like if you think about, you know, the architecture of the, uh, of the, uh, the decade of the 90s, right? Like where everything is like a sort of melanin that it's applied everywhere, you know, to hide materials or to make materials read as something that they're not, right? Uh, that created like an entire aesthetic vocabulary for that particular, you know, decade or like even in, during the 80s, right? If you think about the work of Memphis and all of that, right? So you have this opportunity of play with this, you know, manufacturing techniques uh, to reveal, you know, this sort of new conditions about, you know, not only space, but also of how we, you know, uh, build things together, right? How things connect. 
And I, you know, I, I really liked the way you introduced plastic, right? Like whether it is in the form of, you know, a 3D printed product or something that also relates to plastic in with a different uh, manufacturing technique. I think it is very interesting uh, because of, you know, contemporary concerns related to, you know, sustainability and, you know, our responsibilities as designers and stuff. Um, so, and I, and I think that, you know, instead of having plastic somewhere, you know, <laughs> uh, thrown away, like I, I do believe that, you know, if we could use more plastic in our buildings, uh, I, I would think like that is a positive thing, right? Um, I mean, then this is my personal note, uh, by the way. Uh, I'm not you know, a sponsor, but any sort of plastic manufacturer to <laughs> say this thing. Um, but, but I do think that it is really interesting uh, to note that. And the reason why I'm also bringing this up is because if you think about the seams, like every seam in architecture or like in the configuration of interior spaces are always sealed you know, by, you know, caulk or, you know, by a sort of silicone that also comes from plastic, right? Also the wood in your renderings are, you know, compressed by a layer of plastic that comes in the form of glues or et cetera, right? So I don't think plastic only appears in that piece, right? Um, I think it appears everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And it could be interesting to, you know, like uh, be more honest or more clear about you know the importance of that and especially in a, an environment such as this one in which insulation it's so vital you know for like the, the super cold temperatures um so i think like it could be interesting for you to maybe expand on on you know on, on that reality of you know a materiality and manufacturing i think it would give you a lot also to play with uh, not only in terms of you know the aesthetics of the spaces that you're designing but even more as you know how let's say what is your agency as a designer in this more you know uh, broader um, disciplinary concerns yeah uh, I agree with that yeah that's um yeah because I uh I think a lot about uh the the material of this 3d printing form um at first I even want to use concrete but like, uh, it's definitely like not, obviously not environmental friendly. Then uh, Alison and uh, suggest me to use the bioplastic, uh, uh, a bio-based plastic. And I researched a lot and found it's really interesting, um, but uh, it's the only the material, but the manufacturer, the skills is the, the most, is more important, I think. So um, I, will, I will research more about that. Thank you. I think it's I think it's encouraging actually uh, Jingyu to watch your development over the course of the semester. I admire your relentlessness to put forward this ambitious um, proposal, <laughs> all the while trying to figure out how to generate it uh, in Revit as you were trying to learn how to use Revit. So I really appreciate your your steadfastness with putting forward. Um, this really amorphous shape, and I I think that you should take the feedback about. Um, you know, the fascination that you, you developed late in the semester with this, having this amorphous shape collide with sort of vertical walls. So what does that mean? Um, and, and how you really start to enjoy that. And I think that you can get even further detailed uh, with your studies to think about even the simplest acts of cutting a door in a wall. And I, and I think that that comes down to the, that notion of the assembly pieces and um, starting from the manufacturer is a fantastic place to be down to the installation um, and then I think with that thorough knowledge, you, you, you can really make fo your, your ambitious proposals come to life. I, I think we started to see that a little bit in that one room where you cut away the ceiling and you, you revealed the structure behind. That's actually where you spent a lot of time in your good, your very strong design mind, thinking about how I know the spirit I want to evoke and how can I build that? And you really invested a lot of time and energy there. And I think that's, that's probably the most successful part of the interior as a result. Mm -hmm. So I think that putting that kind of energy across the entire space will, will only help you and help your portfolio. So I, I mean, I, I commend you on your progress. It's really um, admirable. And I think it felt um, very comfortable, like the soft forms feel very inviting. I think there were just a few moments where I think at the entrance, the bathroom portion has a, a straight angle. And so I would be very careful when you have the amorphous form and the straight angles and then the existing form 
to maybe just the existing perimeter is what should be uh, rectilinear and then everything else that is your intervention then should have a softer uh, yeah. feel to it. I think that at the, the upper level, I think works really well, except that one, <laughs> that one corner uh, at the entry. And then the bottom floor plan does feel, um, doesn't have the same finesse as the upper floor plan. Like I would definitely want to be in this upper floor plan, the bottom floor plan, aside from the stair uh, enclosure, everything else feels um, very tight and constrained after you've you know, introduce this other worldly space above. I think that's a great note. I just was actually noodling around on, I mean, cause I think you could either do that or you could move those rooms, those, the two bottom rooms and the bathroom kind of wing and kind of just embed, embed that back, back into the base building, you know? And then, then you could let the ceiling kind of do its own thing, which I think that having the ceiling do a lot of work is, is I think, you know, I think it's really uh, interesting. It's disciplinary. It's damn hard because uh, there's a lot of crap that's up in this that has to poke through from time to time. And so I, I always like look at ceilings in projects and you can tell like who has mastery over what's going on and who doesn't with, just by looking at ceilings of projects because it's really hard to make a clean ceiling in, in any kind of built uh, project. And so I think starting to use that, and, and you know, we were kind of quibbling about the 3D printing capacity, but it, it and it's a little bit of that, but like, I think it's just kind of thinking through and being aware of other kind of systems to be able to do stuff is all will also come with time. Um, but the intent, I think, is super interesting. And I think if you take the comments from both Ellie and, and Pirjana and start to like really think about the rest of the stuff, like I think now like you could come back and think about the floor. I think the reveal that Allison pointed out is, is, is a super successful moment because it starts to kind of like become a little bit more um, less techno utopic and more about like these interactions of systems. I think, you, could, you know, even in the floor, I think it'd be super cool to, to think about um, uh, you know, some less refined kind of flooring, you know, if it was sort of like reclaimed uh, boards and, you know, a little bit more rough, at least in spots would start to be, you know, I think that sort of um, interaction of, of, of high, low would start to be pretty satisfying. But overall, I think it's a well thought through scheme with some with a couple of really nice moments um, that you see in the last render. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Jingyu. Um, if you can stop, if you stop your share, then we can um, invite Megan to share her screen. Thank you, everyone. Hi, what, guys. What was the thing you just shared? What was that? It, it went, I cleared it. Oh, in the chat? Yeah. Perjana gave us a great uh, reference here. I was just going to say thank you for sharing that. It's a uh, she just mentioned that um, the conference at Columbia a couple of years ago, um, Mark Wigley organized it. And the name oh, cool. of the conference was yeah. Permanent Change, Plastics in Architecture and Engineering. And so I think that, yeah, I think that that, that would be really interesting to see. I'm, I'm actually going to watch that and then see I'll incorporate that into my construction <laughs> class. Perjana, thank you. <laughs> no, you're welcome. It is very interesting. And actually, they uh, they made a book and the book is incredible. It shows like many, you know, uh, projects made only about plastic. Um, and I think it's very, very interesting. That's great. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, everyone can see and hear me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so in my design for Palantir's Pavilion at the World Economic Forum, um, sorry, there we go. Um, my mission was to create a desirable outward facing social gathering space for Palantir uh, where clients and stakeholders can be seen um, can see and be seen. The space should serve as a platform of regeneration for Palantir and instill renewed trust and confidence in their brand. Uh, Palantir offers the world's best user experience for data handling, which is a really intangible thing. Um, and they should also offer the world's best social experience and hospitality for their clients at Davos. That is something that they can remember um, and take away as an experience. So in my deployment, I focused on 
uh, three main prongs, rebranding, experiential strategy, and building systems. Uh, in the rebranding, I utilized um, a renewed color palette for them that would soften their image and apply trust and reliability. I used the color green that represents peace, growth, and health, um, black for reliability, sophistication, and experience, uh, and white that's simple, calm, and clean. I used a natural color palette of woods, um, metal, and stone. Um, and then for my lighting, I wanted to use low energy LED lights only with a focus on sustainability and integrate as much daylighting as possible and utilize glass partitions for transparency and light transmission as well. Uh, my furniture types, I sourced from regional sources, uh, designers and manufacturers that were focused on sustainability and utilize renewable, sustainable or recycled materials. And in my lounge seating, I wanted to um, make sure everything stayed open and inviting and the space wasn't segmented too drastically so you could foster open conversations and nothing was very closed off. Um, experientially, I wanted to create a coffee bar that would provide the highest quality um, beverage service in Davos, a space that you would want to linger that was really integrated um, and that had a local emphasis. Uh, in order to see and be seen, I wanted to create sophisticated, comfortable lounging uh, where it was very open and integrated and avoided really long, um, endless corridors in a really linear space. Um, as far as building systems go, um, I wanted to focus on the modular construction of the pavilion itself and create elements within it that were along those lines uh, by using interior curtain wall partitions that would be modular and reusable again. Um, the SIPS walls and modular window system of the pavilion itself uh, uniformly sized ceiling panels, uh, uniform wall panels, and flat pack um, capability for my design features. So there's a little bit of inspiration here um, that I drew from, very clean lines, natural materials, continuity and repetition of materials, arching and round curves, ballooning forms, and a simplicity in graphic and visual communication. And then in outlining the program of my space, you enter here through the northeast corner um, directly into the primary gathering space and lounge. And as you filter through that past the coffee bar, you reach the more private areas in the back. Um, this is a general overview of the building exterior, the front facade with an integrated fireplace that provides transparency um, from the outside in. Uh, these two views are taken from the entry. This top view is taken from in front of the concierge desk looking beyond to the coffee bar. And this bottom view is as you enter in the door. On the left here, you can see a more intimate lounge and gathering space that provides access to these two more intimate conferencing and telephone rooms. Um, this smaller back room would primarily be used by the CEO. Um, and then this concierge desk and wall provides an opportunity for graphic collateral. And there is Palantir branding on the front wall when you walk in. Um, an overview of the furniture types and finishes that I touched on in the introduction. Um, the materials I used, I wanted to focus on sustainable and reclaimed and natural materials. Uh, in the entryway, there are um, water and mud trapping floor mats for guests to wipe their feet on, practically speaking, because it's a really muddy and wet environment on the exterior. Uh, the main floor, in the lounge um, and common area is a textured stone tile that the color would disguise mud and water well and also provide texture for an anti-slip surface. And then as you move into the more private conference areas, it gets a little bit more luxe where there's a reclaimed engineered oak flooring. Uh, the ceiling and wall 
Treatment in the main area, um, they're covered in these slatted panels that provide some acoustic functionality for the space, as well as conceal any utilities that are above in the ceiling or behind in the walls. Um, and then where there is not an acoustic wood ceiling, there is a um, four by eight format acoustic felt tile. So moving into the coffee space, um, I wanted this to be the focus of the pavilion and really be that hub of socialization. Um, so I decided to create a singular design element behind the coffee bar that really contains that lounge and primary gathering space. So this fan is constructed of individual fins um, which are made by laminating, cross-laminated, cross-laminating three pieces of three-quarter inch ply in order to achieve um, a large scale singular feature like this fin. And those are all integrated um, and fanned out to create the design element itself. Each of these shapes was created using um, dynamic families in Revit um, with my, the ability to modulate um, how low they dip and how long they extend. Uh, this is a view from behind the coffee bar. Um, within the coffee bar, all of the millwork is open shelving below with the espresso machine on top and a fridge below. And then here is a section detail of the fireplace that um, integrates the interior with the exterior. Because it is deeper than the wall itself, I have bumped out um, the screen partition on the exterior in order to disguise that fireplace. And then moving through the common area into the private areas, um, I've shown a view of the larger conference room that can be used as both a presentation space and meeting space uh, with room for Palantir's branded collateral and a presentation video screen um, on the north wall. Um, and here I have a diagram of how all of the lighting is integrated into the ceiling panels by using a really linear format LED light that's dimmable um, and these ceiling screens. The screens can be cut to accommodate the light so that everything is really seamlessly integrated. Um, for the lighting in the common area, uh, there are these slab pendants that are a felt body with a glowing LED light below that integrate really well in between each of the fins and kind of become a cohesive part of the installation and create a really nice ambient light in that area. Um, in the conference rooms, I've used wall washers in order to highlight some of the graphic collateral and create additional um, light. Moving into the lower level, um, there is a stair along the south side of the building. Uh, when you enter, you have this view here, which is a common workroom where all of the Palantir employees and production team will spend most of their day um, working and collaborating and addressing issues as they come up. However, um, there is an additional conference room for staff down here that can also be used as an auxiliary conference room for um, the public. So I wanted to make this space cohesive with the upper level and I carried the ceiling paneling and lighting conditions down as well as the color scheme and furniture types. So um, the furnishings are similar in the basement. It's just a more limited um, and refined material and furniture palette. And then Professor Gaskins had asked us to address how not necessarily our pavilion would be converted to address um, the current pandemic situation, but how 
the overall scheme of a convention like this might change in the future. Um, and so I thought about how building systems might be used to better accommodate a gathering of this type in the future. Um, this example from iCrave um, in the David Koch Center for Cancer Care in New York is a really good example where instead of being one large gathering area, it's much more segmented into zones. And I think um, for design that that's a way things might be shifting in the future. Um, as far as conferences specifically go, I think there might be a shift to the outdoors or digital uh, and fewer gatherings of this scale going forward. Um, and then lastly, I think that building automation is going to be another big component of this where um, voice activated hands free or cell phone controlled technologies will be a big shift in common places. And that's it. Just to give you all the, the reviewers a little, that, that's what I, I, another curveball. I threw the fireplace curveball, I threw at them pretty late in the game and I threw them the COVID question also, because as Clay was talking, it's, it's a super loaded question, um, not just in the bigger picture, but actually how it might apply not only to the WEF, but to Palantir at the WEF, because one of the easiest things that we've been seeing implemented across the world is, um, along the lines of what you were talking about, Megan, the building automation, but it's really about the building scanning. And so it's about the temperature scans as you walk into buildings. It's about the um, inability to choose whether or not you're being filtered and, it, and, um, and what that means. And so for a company, some, you know, all of these uh, buildings, your, our pavilions could all be used if just in that vestibule area, there was a temperature scanner, right? But it's the uh, the messy issue, that muddy pool that we have to step into then again with Palantir about surveillance, about data collection against your will um, and how they're saying, we don't collect data. We use data that people own, but we don't collect it, but that's them collecting data. So it, it's a funny, it, they could find themselves quickly in a very, very funny place um, with respect to that. But anyway, <laughs> that's just, I like to throw the occasional weekly curveball to students. So we'll just, just to see what happens, so. Uh, ni nice uh, work, Megan. I think um, I, I just, instead of maybe in this one, I, instead of talking about bigger picture uh, I, thoughts, I think some, some I had some more granular questions to ask about just mm -hmm. normal spatial kind of relations. And one of them actually in the image that you just ended on, oh. um, it, on the, you know, on the left side, you have this conference room and you have this strange kind of wall, thin wall kind of jutting out. And then there's like this dead space behind it. There are a couple of moments like that where I feel like the, the basic geometries like don't quite match up in or and or in the ceiling how the ceiling is resolved at the wall at the exterior wall um so can you talk to a little bit of you know the the, the sort of relationship between this sort of circular figure the sort of undulation in the ceiling and then the sort of angular edges uh, of the of the support spaces Sure. Um, I mean, that was one of the issues that I struggled with most in space planning in the beginning was trying to insert these circular rooms into this square unadaptable box. Um, but I really wanted to push and see at least how far I could get in that. Um, with the fan shape, I initially had some more ambitious ideas where all of the fins came down to the ground and actually created more of like a brise soleil and acted as kind of like a sunscreen for the windows or there were two and they somehow interconnected. But I did have a difficult time resolving um, both of those. And so in the end, I wound up scaling it back to one fan. Um, and really just kind of practically terminating the fins that were over the windows above the window and bringing these 
that were on the ends that helped to define the space a little bit lower just to create a little bit more of a cocooned environment. Um, and then where the fins hit these curtain walls and the dropped ceiling areas, integrating those um, slatted screens so that it became a little bit more cohesive and then it could carry and those screens could wrap down and around the ceilings and down the walls um, to create a more continuous. But even in that condition, does the grain like on the on the on the fascia of that uh, that drop ceiling as I go into the conference room, it looks like the that the orientation of the of, of them don't match up, you know, and so yeah, I just feel like there's some like moments of, of, of strange, strangely unresolved kind of relationships, you know, either geometric at a bigger scale or at a finer grain like that, that I think, um, you know, it's not so much, I mean, for me, it's just like a basic idea. Um, it's not, it's not about big picture thinking or anything. It's just like, how mm -hmm. do that stuff that I think um, I think you would have to go back and kind of like calibrate some of these things and how an arc hits an angle um, that then is linked up with other stuff. I just think I feel like there's some there's a little bit of of, of schism there. Um, overall, I think it's a it's a it's a has really nice moments. I like the desk um, here. I don't like this view of it, but I like the other view. Um, <laughs> coming in to see that I feel like the the, the undulations in the ceilings are, are more um, pleasing at that moment um, but you know I think you have to think about those um, conditions a little bit more um, as you sort of develop a project like this yeah it's such a strong move um, that it, it needed to not just end flat on a wall. It definitely needed maybe that idea yeah. that you had at the beginning of like bringing it down, creating some wall thickness with it as it came down. Maybe the undulations could have been simpler on the ceiling, but then focus on how it terminates and continues. It's almost like a line that wants to continue instead of just end so abruptly. Yeah. Yeah, or even it could extend to the outside, you know. I mean, not literally, yeah. but but figuratively, like extend beyond, and so you could have those things turned down and and become part of the the organization of the of the facade that you actually spoke to. Um, I think that's but, probably that's where I should have gone. Yeah, maybe I don't know. Who knows? But like those are those are things that I think as you, you and I know all of y'all. These are common you know, comments because you're, you're just tasked with sort of a level of resolution on projects like this, but that's where you can't, you know, I think as you get more sophisticated with your thinking and technical prowess that you don't, you don't pull a, apart like the idea from its resol from a resolution of a project, they actually have to get closer together as you move forward, you know, and so like I think for all of y'all that would be the the challenge um, is to see that the detail actually is in service of or in relation to bigger picture thinking about society and material flows and and ai and like all this stuff and i think uh sometimes it seems abstract but i think that that's the challenge and so like all of y'all have something like that to work on as you as you kind of move, move forward yeah, I, I think like um, the, the the strongest moments of um, of the project comes in and in, in realizing that how much potential there is um, for for this um, you know fan uh, and how it radiates in order to organize space. But I think it's just uh, you know a matter of like a geometrical problem, right? Like. How, how does a circle meet a box, <laughs> uh, as, you know, Clay um, just mentioned. Um, so that being said, like, I would have liked that, you know, if, if you if you started also saying that, you know, the, the coffee space um, is one of the, mo the, the moments that um, the users will end up using the most, right? So if it's that centralized gathering space, I would have wanted it to be everywhere, right? Um, I mean, just for the fact that yes, conference rooms and all of this important things that may be happening on, inside the pavilion, but it, but I wonder if you know the pavilion could have been just this element, right, that radiates all the way to uh, to the perimeter and actually, as Ellie and Clay are mentioning, you know, just also go down. 
And, you know, um, since you, you, you're using a, a, a waffle structure in the end, right? Um, so also how that, you know, waffle structure can manifest and create and built in furniture that also are, are, are tied, right, um, to, to, to this element or to the structure. I, I keep thinking, uh, you know, um, I will, one of your classmates, the ones that presented at the beginning, they did a very fascinating job with, you know, playing with the density of the, of the louvers, right? Um, so I'm just curious to know, like, in what ways, you know, this structure creates and formalizes independent and autonomous uh, programmatic spaces, but then how the elements that might go down start to define a sort of screen that, you know, um, that cr that creates everything out of one same system, right? Or it's just like expanding the possibilities of that one system as being, you know, a ceiling condition, but also a partition, um, which could be very, very interesting as well, right? And and I know that, you know, uh, at this moment, it's also, you know, playing with geometry, playing, as you mentioned, with, um, with the digital tools you have to construct these worlds, right? Uh, but it could be interesting to know, like, in what ways you can gain more expertise as you advance in your education to to don't allow, you know, like geometry to rule over you, that you actually you mm -hmm. master it in a way um, that you're able to be actually in control. Right. So that then you don't have to go back to the things that you can produce analogously to some, some things that actually by really understanding how things are simulated and, and produced digitally can help you and actually empower you as a designer to actually resolve those moments. I think it would be a very, very interesting position. Uh, you know, the questions are there, right? Yeah. Like, how do I meet a corner uh, when I, you know? <laughs> um, so, um, but then, you know, keep those questions in mind, right? Like that this is not just a problem that is uh, unique to this uh, particular project, that this is a recurrent theme, right? In, in architecture and in interior design and everywhere, right? Like. Seriously, how the two the similar forms actually meet and coalesce to create an overarching whole? Like those are always questions that we're always, you know, encountering. And it is very interesting to, you know, to allow a detail to guide also um, a project. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the fan is definitely something I wish I could have explored more. Um, I certainly had a learning curve with figuring out how to generate the form to begin with and mm -hmm. bring what I had in my head mm -hmm. into the model and um, onto paper and how to represent that. So um, I think now that I wouldn't say have, I've mastered, but I have a better comprehension of kind of those digital modeling tools, um, it would be really fun to explore how it could drop down and become a partition and actually create the entire um, form of the space. There's a very beautiful project that I personally like a lot um, uh, by Snoheta. It's like a reindeer conservancy pavilion. And it's very interesting. It doesn't use a waffle structure made out of plywood. Um, it is just like big pieces of lumber that then are, you know, machined with, a, I think, like a five axis uh, CNC router um, that allows for, you know, for this shape to be modeled. So it could be also interesting, uh, maybe for you to think in the same way as I did with my previous comment uh, to Jing Yu, um, to think about the manufacturing processes, right, um, that, that are at your disposition also. Um, that allow for, you know, the creation of this, you know, complex forms and how they, you know, how you can discretize them with, you know, standardized materials uh, or material, uh, building materials, sorry. Um, so, yeah, but it, it is interesting. I mean, yeah. you know, all of you guys are, you know, asking the right questions. And I know that, you know, it's, uh, it's easy for us to come and, you know, point the finger at, okay, <laughs> this is not resolved, but... Um, but I think that, you know, don't, don't get discouraged about that. Like, just keep pushing because, you know, it is all about, you know, becoming experts in, in, in this sort of um, um, moments, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The, actually, the furniture in this links up in this image, the top image links up with uh, the, the Snowheda project. Very mm -hmm. cool, yeah. actually, because it appears to be a milled, a milled uh, um, kind of mass. And so... 
I think that that's the project that comes to mind as well as a reference as a reference point. But I think also, you know, in many ways, this is a Baroque geometry problem. Like it's not a spline uh, problem of like um, of of sort of uh, parameterism. It's actually straight lines um, that are that are filleted or resolved in different ways. And so, like it's it's like you know what would what would uh, you know Bernini do um, to resolve mm -hmm. these, these problems? I think it actually because that's corner problem you know when a when an arc hits a, hits a hits a two degree curve you know like how do they resolve each other and i think that if you look at baroque architecture interiors they actually deal with this all the time the the oval and the circle and the square you know um the the, the and so like i think you could look at some of those references to resolve some of these issues and think about it spatially as well as sort of just as a geometric question Interesting. But overall, it is a very elegant scheme, and I think it has a very sophisticated vibe. And I feel like your your bottom level also um, has that as well. It's like the bottom level didn't become this dark basement cave. It, it has that same feel as the above. Thank you. Also, an interesting reference um, could be Barco Labinger. Um, they created like this plywood pavilion. It is just like a, a folded um, or yeah, folded maybe is the word. I don't know. Uh, yeah, folded plywood that then gets applied to a steel frame. Um, but it creates like a series of, you know, uh, not concentric because they don't belong to the same center, um, but like a series of, you know, uh, very organic lines that come together and create a three-dimensional space of something that you know is just a surface or applied as a surface so it is also very interesting maybe for you to think about um, how uh, with you know the same material different applications um, could be interesting as well for the creation of three-dimensional um, uh, objects so anyway that's it i'm going to shut up thank you <laughs> um I, I, I especially appreciate that notion of the Baroque because if you think about the Baroque in terms of it's kind of like the Victorian area that decided to have fun in a way. And that's a, a very much the vibe I get from your project, Megan, is, is um, you know, the, if you look at some of the early models of, and we did look at the early models of the Pelletier offices, they're very much that sort of stereotypical now tech office, with like cool bean bags on the floor. And, you know, so, and sort of like that whole, that vibe of like, we're, we're too cool. You know, we all wear sweatshirts and hoodies and all, all of that. Um, and this idea of Lux and this idea of actually time we all grew up a little bit. And I think that your pavilion really evokes that. And I, and then um, and I think that you really, really managed to figure a lot of the spatial and construction detailing troubles that you, that you manifest, made manifest for yourself. Um, and so that, that's really good. And um, I appreciate that the struggle continues actually at those perimeter edges and I think that I trust that you'll sort of continue to wrestle with that so yes my summer project yeah. <laughs> what else are you gonna do <laughs> um, so kudos to you on that um well it is just either that or just time. crop this image so I don't see the edge okay <laughs> there is that option. It. Just, just like some clever edit I'll just cut this whole part out <laughs> yeah yeah you can't show that Megan you know that Wait, at uh, our mid review at our mid review she went the other way she was like I could do this or I could do this and I could do this like she just showed oh my God. and everybody was like mm. oh so oh this gosh. is not it's not a new uh area of study for Megan the and decision I making is the hardest part for me <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at this image um, and just thinking, oh, how how can you um, reconfigure it? I almost want the verticals to be on the perimeters, and then it's okay. almost like the waves just create an oculus, like they just go into this empty um, oh, circle. Maybe it's a skylight, and so it, it comes from the outside in instead of from the inside out. It's kind of inversing the relationship. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Where was Ellie at the mid review? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, thank you, reviewers, for your feedback. I feel like the summary that you were giving, Megan, I was like furiously trying to take some notes. I think that it's all really good and um, useful for all the students to be thinking about their project with the, that kind of respect. Um, 
So um, thank you for the, we already, this one flew by, I feel like we, at the end of our second session. Um, thank you again to our reviewers. I feel like um, your contributions were so useful and educational. I feel like I learned a lot this for this portion as well. So um, thank you to our students. Yay, yes, Ms. Morgan saying. Um, <laughs> big hand claps for all of you. Um, and please go enjoy your break. And we'll be back again at three. So thank you Thanks so much, all. everyone. Congratulations. Thank you. Nice thank work. Thank you so much. Thanks. I've only done this a thousand times so far. Okay, and we're back. Um, well, let me introduce you, Michael, to everyone mm -hmm. and all of you to Michael. Um, our first two reviewers, um, our, our faculty members are um, Professor I Igor Siddiqui. He is the director of the um, hi, Michael, program. Hi, everyone. Hey. Um, and then Professor Tammy Glass um, is also joining us. She was the previous director of the interior design program. <laughs> we just pass it around. <laughs> just pass it around. Um, so we're, we're really lucky to have, maybe we got some heavy hitters here today. And our third heavy hitter here is Michael Bricker, who um, um, also a UT alumni from back in the day, uh, Masters of Architecture. His, um, I, I saw, so I was reading your bio, which is I guess better at keeping up than I am. Um, but you went on, Michael has served as a, at UT in the RTF school, but then also at Wabash, is that right? Yeah. Um, and then he's also been doing a lot of work um, for and set design and a mm -hmm. show that you, um, his most, one of his most recent accolades, you may have seen him in Dwell for his previous company, People for Urban Progress, he was featured in Dwell, but then also, um, won an Emmy for Russian Doll, which is yeah. amazing. I um, love that show. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Um, and so Michael is working in the entertainment industry. And one of the reasons why I thought he would be so lovely to have join us today is because of um, really what we're doing is understanding how construction matters and materials matter. And from the point of how we put them together, so just beyond the selection, but then as it, as it reverberates and they become accumulated in a space, the kind of basically the kind of vibe and the kind of message that we're putting forth, because this building that we're working on is the primary marketing tool used by this tech firm that we're we're featuring, and they've got a lot of marketing to do as far as branding goes, and they're trying to overcome a common misperception in the public and in the media about who they are and what they do. Um, and so they're using this building as this, this platform for information. And so okay. that's why it's, it's almost like production and set design. It Very is, yeah. It is, it, it, yeah. it, to the point of, it's a pop-up pavilion. And so it goes yeah. up in the course of six weeks, it comes down like five days. So manpower yeah. is, they're not short of manpower. Yeah. Like the, the, the crew show up, the crane shows up. Yeah. But um, the idea of that finesse of the assembly is to not create something that looks temporary, but very much is. So um, welcome. I'm excited to hear your feedback. Um, this afternoon, we will be, I'm going to uh, screen share my other screen here. Um, we will be hearing from our two final projects. Um, it's actually three students. And um, here on the, unfortunately, I'm here on the last slide. So let me go all the way back here. Um, we'll be hearing from uh, first from Mala, who this, this studio is a mixture of uh, graduate students and undergraduate students. And so Mala will be presenting to us first. She's a candidate. Um, um, for the Masters of Interior Design. And then Shay and Lily teamed up undergraduate students and they'll just be taking us home at the end there. So um, this is just a little detail shot I took of this year's pavilion at the World Economic Forum. Austin, I think you have the wrong screen shared. Oh, are you seeing all these well? so. You don't yeah. want to see this instead? You, would you like to see the screen then? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Oh my goodness, Jenny comes to the rescue again. 
let's see. Here's nice to see the backstage though. You know, my desktop, which is so clean. Thank you for stopping me, Jenny. Okay, better? Not yet. No? Why Not would yet. you do it? It's like it. Oh, okay, nice. now it's good. Now it works. I, I see the green box. Okay, good. Great, great. Thank you for the assistance. Um, so just this shot on the left is just a little detail image I took of this year's pavilion. Um, I did get to go to the World Economic Forum and visit the pavilion and actually spend some days uh, just sitting and observing the human, the human, I shouldn't say human, the circulation patterns of the people within the building, not the human, human trafficking. That's, that's different. <laughs> the, um, so it's really fascinating to see what this means to be in a, a completely public, um, entity like a you know public pavilion that really anybody can walk into however the credentials that it takes to get past the threshold to be a part of the world economic forum are so great it was this funny interaction of um, social um, studies really about how human behavior it's something that was completely new and foreign to me um, so to give you a little bit more background there Our site, again, is at the World Economic Forum, and it's in the it's little um, resort, a ski village resort of Davos. This is um, from the outskirts of town. Um, the actual forum takes place. We are very close to where this little steeple is here. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's about a five minute drive in uh, from the hotel we were staying in. But then uh, for the most part, this town is about 3,000 year round residents and they kind of clear out unless they're there to actually assist like run the re their restaurant in particular. And they rent out their apartments, something not entirely unfamiliar to those of us here with South by Southwest. However, the population blooms from 3,000 to 15,000 attendees at the World Economic Forum. So it's an enormous um, population burst on a very small place. Um, the heart of the event happens here at the Center Congress. And that's where all of the really, this is the very big convention hall where the big talks like Greta came and spoke here and all of the world leaders would come and speak at the, in this pavilion. And this, but this is a year round structure that stays built. Most everything else is either pop up or uh, a temporary takeover of existing buildings. So our site is quite nearby it's just on the outside of this photograph, actually. Um, and I'll show you on the map on the next slide here. But this main street right here is the promenade. And almost all of the activity for the World Economic Forum happens along that promenade. And so it's really cut off to vehicles. Um, the only and most of all the vehicles that you do see, they're either Audis or Mercedes Benz um, are sort of the two uh, vehicles that are allowed in. There was one such world leader who refused to not drive in an American car and was in a giant Ford F-150. But those are the only cars that you see on the street and they're, they're few and far between. But um, so that's just people, you know, you're walking down the street and Sheryl Sandberg walks by you and, you know, just sort of what is happening. It's a, it's a strange place to be in existence for just a few days in January. Um, so here we are, this is a Google satellite image here. And so this over here on the right side is the rooftop of that Center of Congress. Um, and then uh, along this promenade here um, is really where all of the foot traffic comes before and after uh, events at the, uh, at the Center of Congress here. And here's our location for our pavilion. And so we are really the first stop um, that people might come. And so for a place to bring in traffic uh, they offer free coffee and hot drinks, and they're um, well known and well deserved. The reputation of this phenomenal coffee and phenomenal hot drinks. They source all of them from local uh, places, um, from the oat milk, cashew milk, and almond milk that they were using in there. It's all very, very carefully curated. Um, the hot chocolate had this this phenomenal Swiss chocolate. Chocolate was melted in small batches in the in the pavilion to be served to guests. Um, so it, this very much is a place to be seen, to see and be seen while you're in there in a public sense of just coming through. They also bring in 
um, their clients or their potential clients uh, and invite them in for specific meeting times. So there's a prescribed foot traffic and then there's a fluid foot traffic that all um, convenes here in this one place. So just quickly on the site, this is that building I was pointing out here. And then this was this past year's pavilion. So they work on the same site. This is at the street level. This is, this is the main promenade here. And you can see back in 2017, same building, slightly different outfit on the exterior. The building itself is a full modular construction. It's built out of SIPS panels. Um, with a, it's, it looks like a parapet roof, but really it's just three-sided. Um, it slopes to the back. It's uh, brought in, they bring in the initial footings starting in late November, if the weather allows. Um, and then it all the way, they are working up until the day before that the, um, the conference starts in late January. So they have about six or seven weeks of actual functional working time to complete co uh, uh, the construction of this building. It is the same building, same parts, same kit of parts, same windows, it's all flat packed stored uh, nearby and they truck that in every year. You can see a little bit of that roof construction here in this site, but really this photo is to show how quickly the site drops off, but it is um, a sloping hill here becomes terraced slightly, um, but this retaining wall is at that street level. And this is exactly where that building gets planted right along this zone here. So what they do uh, in its true pavilion architecture, um, they come in with these platforms and then they go ahead and they set these, uh, this metal scaffolding right onto the ground, right onto the site. Since they have been there a number of years, they have been able to put a few posts in the ground, sleeves uh, for those metal poles to sit into so that they don't have to um, reconvene with these larger platforms that then kill the grass afterward. Um, and so that made, has made their construction a bit uh, more efficient. So just a quick word on the uh, nature of the other kind of structures that happen at the World Economic Forum. Some of them are true pop-ups. Um, this is William McDonough's building. He's done this is this past year was the fourth year that they've constructed this. They built it right on top of another building. Um, I don't have any good images of them, but sometimes some of them are just new fronts and they will like, you know, like an appendage right in the front of the building, build their, their pop-up right in front of it. Um, other times there's a complete um, interior takeover like uh, Amazon Web Services did here to conduct their private meetings. Very uh, present visually to the street, very private as far as access goes. Um, and then on the inverse, the full pavilion built temporarily made to look slightly more permanent than that. The other two big tech hitters are Facebook and Google. Google whose front was very much closed off. This woman stood here all day as basically a bouncer to let people in and out. Um, if you had, you could only really go in if you were, and people would stop and they're like, can, can we go in and see? And no, the answer is no, we can't, you can't go in. Facebook did invite people into this small lobby here and they were, um, they were doing a feature on small businesses around the world. So they had a bit of an exhibit space there. Um, so both of these are these pop-up pavilions. Um, the reason why I'm showing these in particular, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, is because they're those big tech entities that are major players in the economic forum and lesser known to the general public is Palantir. And Palantir was the company that we partnered with, or I shouldn't say partner, that we used as a case study um, for this project. And um, while they are also a tech firm, they're they really just interface with their clients directly. And because of their, the nature of what they do, which is basically sort metadata into a more user-friendly experience for their clients, um, they're often misunderstood because their great ability to sort that data, to really have that data reveal things and um, patterns and use that may not have been otherwise evident, whether it's from a terrorist cell, or I was saying they can also optimize the um, production of this shampoo company in Germany. So they, they really run the gamut and what they can do. Um, there's strong potential for abuse of that. And while they, they really may try to make public how they value their clients' privacy and they don't even reveal really who their clients are, um, they're often, often, you know, sort of dragged through the mud in the media because of their um, 
lack of willingness to show what they do and how they do it. So this is a little slide that we that came from Ivy's research. So just really putting forth what is the general perception out there about Palantir and her initial searches were rapid and shocking. <laughs> and some came up with a lot of sort of expletives and language that were, are out there in the media. And so this is one of the things that was presented as a, a hurdle to get past because at the World Economic Forum, what Palantir wants to do is bring in their clients and have them make what they call trilateral connections. So Amazon Web Services is in there and, and um, Salesforce is in the waiting room as well. And they're like, oh, you're here? Oh, you know, yeah, oh, okay. And they shake hands and then they, they can go and make uh, develop other business opportunities. So it's really a place to have these collisions of human interaction um, in the lobby and while people are either waiting for meetings or just in there for coffee. And so there's a big networking um, association there. They also want to take that opportunity to try to rebrand themselves. Um, Palantir got hit again in the news when Peter Thiel came out as a Trump supporter and donated to his campaign. And they made efforts at first to say like, he was a founder, yes, but he is not really a big part of our day-to-day -day operations, but then it just didn't hold water. So what they did was they go to the source of, of who their clientele is, and their clients are mostly these Fortune 500 companies and world powers at the World Economic Forum, and they go in this pavilion. This is how they do their marketing. The person on the right here you're seeing is Alex Karp, and he's actually the CEO, and he's the big active CEO that comes to the WEF, and so he um, really is quite the character um, in the place, uh, and he, they have this big Lord of the Rings uh, you know, analogy that they play through. Every year their company party is HobbitCon. And so they just, they do sort of fun, very like techie things like that. Um, and the whole idea here is that how can we put forward this pavilion of how can we show who they really are, who they want to be, and then how they can help other people. Um, and so for logistics, um, it's a relatively uh, straightforward program that we're looking at. This top main le level entry, um, I should add this note at the top here, but um, we went by just for convenience, um, the US IBC, we implemented state of Texas and then even on top of that local amendments made by the city of Austin um, so that the, the projects all sort of address that, that necessity to meet codes um, independent of say European standards. So um, what they were looking at was really a, an assembly type space on that top floor, which fell just under that 3000 square foot mark. Despite that, I still had them put sprinklers in. So it is still a fully sprinkled, sprinkled place or building. Um, and so they have a, a sort of a list of amenities as, as per request of the client. The lower level is really um, the business type space because that is where the supporting staff, employees only, the catering kitchen is located, the production team, which is the people who keep the pavilion actually running during the day just to make sure nothing goes wrong. Um, and then that's where all of that stuff happens below. It's really not for anyone uh, coming in to, to visit. So given all of that, I asked the students to not necessarily pr bring forth their construction documents, which they uh, developed over the course of this semester, but instead to revamp their presentations, um, to pull from their CDs, pull from their job books, um, and then use them coupled with some experiential um, illustrations to show how their project exemplified the means of using building systems as an integrative design tool. Um, and then at the end, really to sit back and look and analyze their own project and make sure that they are showing how they address the needs, um, the design intent that they set out for their client from their initial programming statement from way back in January um, that we went over. So that's it. <laughs> if uh, there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. I will stop sharing and I'm going to hand the torch over to Mala who will kick us off. If you do have any other questions, Mala can answer them. Why do we have two Malas in Zoom? One <laughs> you don't with the wanna... picture and one with the <laughs> You don't want to talk to the other one. 
Oh my God, there are two of them. I mean, that's great for us. It is, <laughs> it is great. Try to figure out how to, uh, you know, clone oh. our students. So that's great. The other Mala sounds like Gollum. You don't want it's to It's amazing to what Zoom can do. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, so um, just to begin off with, um, you know, from everything we've researched and learned early on this semester and um, what we've learned about Palantir is that it's a firm that's really just trying to do good in the world and have um, a positive impact. Um, their primary business functions, um, as, you know, Allison uh, mentioned as well, is like really with specific industries and governments and not so much with the general public. Um, their branding and general business philosophy is something I really focused um, on in terms of the design development and of this pavilion. Um, the pavilion serves as volunteers um, source of one on one interaction and connection with their clients and it also serves as an important pipeline for more business development um, and how visitors experience the space is really indicative of the quality of service and product that volunteer provides for their clients. Um, initially, um, I de started developing a programming study that looked at the relevant adjacencies between spaces that volunteer really requires within the building. Um, the main four will, um, will need an interactive space um, a cafe, a public accessible restroom, um, at least three to four conference rooms and executive offices. And then the lower level four needs um, a staff workroom, a kitchen, and dining room and restroom. Um, the main level is primarily public spaces, except for the executive suite and specific conference rooms. And the lower level um, functions more of a private back of house area. Um, some of the inspiration um, imagery is, is here. And really, I've um, branding, as I mentioned, really played a huge role in my design development. Um, the logo, for example, is the first impression a firm can make to anyone. And therefore, I was curious why Palantir's, Palantir chose its name um, and the associated logo for their company. And when I researched it, I found out that it's in reference to the founder's love for Lord of the Rings and the crystal orbs or um, palantirs that are found throughout the books. Um, the palantir represents this like two-way connection and communication that allows for information to be revealed and shared. Um, interconnectedness, freedom, and openness, knowledge sharing are the three main core values and concepts of the firm. Um, and my goal was to subtly pull in the form of the logo and this idea of connectedness and openness into the overall interior design development. Um, so on the main level floor plan, um, the public spaces are all um, to the left and center of the floor plan and the more private spaces are located on the right hand side of the building. Um, which is where the conference rooms and executive offices are located. Um, so as you walk through the space, you enter the building to the left, there's a concierge desk, um, you move past it, there's a public accessible um, restroom. There's also in this open area is the main um, presentation space. Um, and adjacent to that is the cafe um, and through the cafe, there is an entrance into the private stair stairway for staff only. Um, staff, um, we've been told, need to go up and down to usually get coffee and um, anything else that you know. Sometimes the executives might need, so the accessibility is right here. Um, and then past the cafe is the fireplace lounge, um, which. Uh, initially, it was just lounge seating, um, but then we were told 
um, but you know, a fireplace would be really nice. And so I've located it in the, the side of the building where there's some views out into the mountains. Um, so it's located here. And then next to that is the executive suite and conference um, areas. And there's also a private restroom um, for executives here. Um, and on the lower level is the um, staff lounge, which I also want to, um, you know, ideally would potentially serve as an additional conference room if needed. Um, then there's also um, kitchen, kitchen and dining space and the workstation. Yeah. So what I wanna do ideally is to kind of go space by space through my um, through the pavilion um, and the first area being the concierge area. Um, there would be a custom concierge desk, and behind it is a feature wall that is, um, again, like a subtle cue to the Palantir logo, and it'll be made of this um, Swiss pine, um, pine strip panels. And then there's these two glazed walls flanking the feature wall, and they'll be, um, and it's actually made of channel glass. Uh, I wanted visitors as they as soon as they come in um, to feel this like sense of openness um, and through that transparency of the glass. So they're actually viewing in. So this is where the glass is. Um, so they're viewing into not only the stairway here, but also into the public space. Um, so before I move further, one of the things I do want to address um, with my design is that um, is the use of color, texture, pattern, and material. Um, I wanted to showcase how the design with careful and intentional use of all of these things can um, allude to the business practice, service, and product that Palantir offers. Um, data isn't black and white. That's what Palantir deals with on a daily basis and is the crux of their business. Um, making some making sense of something of things that are sometimes you know an infinite level of data and information is a is a daunting task and to successfully filter the necessary from the redundant um, is or seemingly useless um, ones are is one of the main key things that Palantir does. Um, I see that same relationship in choosing color, pattern, texture, and material. Um, and I didn't want to present a monochromatic space because I wanted to establish that relationship that ties into the data and that the levels of complex complexity it offers. Um, I wanted to successfully connect these aspects of design within the space and distill what is distracting, clashing, or unnecessary and provide a more cohesive language throughout the pavilion. Um, Palantir's success has been their keen attention to detail and their ability to distill the most important information and weave together seemingly disparate um, and nuanced data sets into a cohesive story and conclusion for their clients. Um, and they go back and forth from big picture, um, big picture and impact to like the minutia detail. Um, and the goal was to do the same, um, same level um, within the design of the pavilion, where at a bigger scale perspective, everything can read very cohesively. At the same time, on a closer look, there's a level of diversity within the materials and action color choices. Um, the first space you walk into is the interactive presentation space. And it's one of the key areas of design for me in the pavilion. Um, I wanted the space to really echo the branding of Palantir, um, as you can see, um, with the circular orb and the diagonal line work underneath. Um, I wanted it to feel like a really expansive area where all the ideas, thoughts, and information shared can really feel like it has a bigger impact on the world than what's, you know, the than like the actual space in which it's shared in. Um, uh, the perimeter side of the space has clear story windows um, that start around seven feet high. Um, and the idea was to capture the mountains in the south side of the site and hide some of the buildings that would be more visible with the windows at high level. Um, the wall below um, serves as a digital presentation surface with flexible OLED 
screens. Um, and then the other interior perimeter of the space will be a uh, flexible scrum wall system that can close off the space at the same time can open up uh, to host a bigger assembly. Uh, the ceiling um, will have a suspended dome that also serves as a skylight to prov provide additional daylighting. Uh, the seating of selected was in intentionally chosen um, to have like, for example, a really low back. Um, the idea was to emphasize the scale and proportion of the space in relationship to other elements, since this is one of the more important areas. Um, these are some of my construction details um, in regards to the scrim, the flexible scrim wall. Um, the individual leaves of the panels are made of uh, custom acoustic panels and they are attached to thin brass uh, dowels and the dowels are then, um, um, the dowels are screwed, or screwed into a roller attachment that is on a track system. Um, and the track system is inset into the floor as well as the ceiling. Um, and this allows for this fixed angle of, of the scrim wall. And this is some of the experiments on what that scrim wall looked like. It, this is some of my last photographs from studio before we had to leave. Um, so this is kind of how I figured out how I want the relationship of the pattern. Um, and of the the scrum wall to be. It was actually really helpful to do like a one to one scale version of the model. Um, for the lighting, um, it's the lighting system was something I had to really integrate with my scrum wall um, scrum detail. Um, and it's the scrum detail is not only located around the presentation space, but also in other areas of the pavilion. And this in this presentation space specifically, there is cove lighting, um, cove up lighting actually. And I just wanted that to kind of highlight the circular form. And then there's also down down light like spotlights that are at an angle and in the same angle of the scrim wall to really um, again clarify the, the floor. Um, the floor line of the space. Then also around the more fixed scrim wall system, it's just cove lighting all around. Um, as far as my lighting fixture selections, um, I selected pieces that would really echo the branding and philosophy of Palantir. And uh, most of the fixtures have these orbs that are all interconnected and um, organic, organically balanced in some way. And this is the presentation space again, except in the, we were told, you know, in the evening they would do more private presentations and you would need um, furniture pieces that are stackable and um, movable and for the evening and can host more people within that space. And so this is just um, a furniture plan with what it would be like during the day as well as then in the evening. And right now I spaced it um a little bit more sparingly just um just to allow for viewing of the OLED wall right here but it can host um, more seating if necessary uh, this is the cafe and coffee bar which is right adjacent to the presentation space um, i chose uh, bar height seating um seating and tables for this space um, so people won't get to settled in with themselves and their laptops, and it would rather be more of a space to connect and mingle, intermingle with people, and have those develop these trilateral connections that Palantir really wants to achieve within the space. Um, there's also like there's this uh, bar ledge by the windows, and that's one of the key things that we were told were that visitors within the space really wanted to be seen. And so I felt like this would be a really good area to be kind of seen from the outside, people walking by and, um, and also people watch as well. Um, just some millwork detail of the back coffee bar as well as the front bar. Uh, I'm actually using an acoustical um, wall panel here for the 
um, bar detail, um, the front bar detail. And, um, yeah. and then this is just the back wall uh, or the north side wall with the, um, with the lead. And then, um, so this is the fireplace lounge. And um, I just chose pieces that felt warm and comfortable with high backs can really settle in and have a more meaningful, deeper conversation and also have these out into the south side of the site with the mountains. Um, and then after that, this is the conference room. And the conference room is, you know, it, it's pretty much, it'll be furnished the same way and be designed the same way in both the spaces. So I just, I'm showing just one of them right here. Um, it actually has channel glass that I've incorporated into several parts of my um, space. And I just wanted that verticality of the channel glass to kind of mimic this from wall. Um, and so that was one of my reasons for choosing that. And then um, it's actually, this is like a frosted glass table. So this is a, quite a tight space. And I just didn't want it to be a um, opaque surface that would feel like the space would be more cluttered. Um, so the transparency really helps in opening up the area. Um, this is one of the executive office spaces. Uh, again, you're seeing this from wall detail here, and then there's um, curved spotlighting all around. Um, and on the other side of this wall, so you're seeing this from detail on this side of the wall, on the other side of the wall will be um, a TV wall for presentations or you know, for the executives to just watch TV or play video games. Apparently, they do that as well. Um, so downstairs is the, uh, so now we're downstairs and we're in the staff serving and dining area. Um, this is probably the only space where I really like located the logo and it's not in such a subtle form anymore. Um, but this is again, just primarily for the employees and the staff. Um, and I just wanted to bring in some of those like design choices of color and detail into the ground, into the lower level, um, not only to like tie the space together with the upstairs, but also, you know, you don't want your staff in, in a dark place. So um, this is the staff workspace. I've um, located the workspace like up against um, the south side of the building and it has windows and enough daylighting. I want to make sure that it's a pleasant environment to work in. Um, and this is the staff lounge and conference room. Um, I wanted to create this um, space in a similar line as the executive offices so that if there is a chance that executives need to use this space to conduct meetings, it can still reflect the same design thinking within it. And um, I, and this, um, this is actually one of the, from their, from their reading material online, but this could also serve as like a lens roll right here. And I'm bringing in the channel glass again um, um, into the downstairs. I really wanted to make that connection to the upstairs for a wall. And, Finally, um, one of the things that Allison had mentioned to us was considerations for the future, and especially in a post-COVID-19 world, what that would look like for design thinking and design um, strategies. And um, I just initially, what I began with was like, what is right now like simple guidelines for individual space requirements? You know, um, we have these like established standards, but then these standards are probably going to change. They're probably going to, I mean, they've already changed at this point, but even after the direct impact of COVID, like there, there are potentially other, other things ahead of us. And in preparation for that, these standards and these individual space requirements may, uh, may need to be um, redistributed in that sense. 
Um, also, um, other options for that, you know, um, the occupancy load of buildings could also potentially change for permanently. Um, it's not just about fire and life safety, but it's also about, you know, just how much you can actually host people within the space in, and maintain a safe distance between each other. Um, and potentially that could lead to scheduled meetings and visits and presentations. Um, Palantir swag, which I've heard is given out pretty um, during the um, during the conference, like those can be measures of precaution. For example, instead of having like coffee mugs um, at the cafe, they could just give out um, um, like thermoses, coffee thermoses and stuff, and they can fill them themselves and drink it. And it, there's no, um, there's not a matter of like it needing to be cleaned afterwards and people can just take that with them. Um, another option is that, um, you know, there's just open air spaces, operable windows, and just additional ventilation. Um, and also I've researched a little bit, um, and there's apparently new studies in regards to far UVC light technology, which can really, um, UVC light in general is some is light that can um, eradicate viruses and pathogens and stuff, but their UVC light alone um, is really harmful for humans, but apparently far UVC light is not harmful for humans um, and it is not a carcinogen. Um, so it, it has the potential to be um, used while people are inhabiting and occupying a space. And according to the research, this can be integrated into the lighting system um, within a building and it can even be retrofit into uh, lighting fixtures. And that's, that's that. Thank you. Thank you, Mala. That was great, very thorough. Um, to our reviewers, um, do you have any questions or is there a slide you would prefer Mala to land on to begin comments and questions? I'll just mute myself. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> I don't know if we're supposed to see Mala, but we can't see her face. Sorry. <laughs> um, is I, I may have missed this at the very beginning, but um, is the the shell of the pavilion already designed, and the students are just designing the inside, or is this is this um, inside and outside? The, this is already um, pre-designed. There's actually, a, the building facade is um, much more orthogonal than what you're seeing in my floor plan. And it's, um, it's essentially a kit of parts, as Allison had mentioned. Um, but I've made the specific insertions out from the facade of the existing building, um, um, building parameter. Um, mainly to kind of emphasize this idea that these, um, the, the concepts and designs and um, ideology discussed within these spaces really, you know, even though it is discussed within a physical space, it has the impact within it is moving past that location and environment and past the World Economic Conference, the impact is much greater than that. And so I really wanted to physically show that in plan. Um, and then, of course, the circular um, form was, you know, in line with this idea of um, the logo and the Palantir being this, like, points of connection um, and communication. Okay. Thanks. Oh, just quickly, Michael, there's another window Mala exists in. She's she logged in twice. So if you see someone who with no audio but moving around a lot, that's Ma Mala wave. Maybe that will. That's Mala. <laughs> okay. 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 Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, I'll just jump in since uh, someone has to start. Um, uh, I, I think it's a really beautiful project, Mala, um, really accomplished. And I mean, I think I'm not super objective um, reviewing any of you, 
because I've been following your career since the first day of grad school. And I'm just so amazed by your progress, like creatively and technically, and the way that you're able to address, you know, like pretty complex design problems. And so I really commend you um, for, for this accomplishment. I think it's a really beautiful project. Um, I think, you know, I think it's a really sophisticated project. Um, and I think that at the scale of organization, it's very clear. Um, and I think at the level of detail, I think it's quite memorable. I mean, I love that when you enter, there is the, you know, the etching on the back wall that's reflected on the, the reception desk and that, you know, then there are sort of textural, um, kind of memories, um, some of the upholstery, like the light fixtures, the kind of it really carefully curated selection of kind of like small scale um, objects um, or design details and then also like memories. Um, I guess, you know, for me, a couple of questions just kind of conceptually in thinking about how the project captures the kind of the intention to market a company that is so impactful, but not visible. Um, so the first question for me would be with what you think um, is the most memorable um, part of the experience of visiting your project, right? Like when, uh, let, let's assume that it's populated and there's a lot of small talk and there's a lot of business talk and there's a lot of distraction and a lot of focus and you know uh after you're in that space what do you remember from it and is you know what do you remember from it in terms of what you did you know so you might remember um certain social things about it but what do you think would be kind of a consistent takeaway um, for each person that kind of enters this environment and eventually leaves? Like, what is the memory of that? And how consistent would that be from, um, from visitor to visitor? Um, and then my second question or comment, and I think it's maybe um, inspired by Michael's question about the, uh, the existing uh, shell mm -hmm. and your relationship to it. I really like your idea um, that there is something um, about going beyond the boundary of the given building that speaks to a certain kind of aspiration. Maybe it's a metaphor as a start, why not? Um, and I think that it makes sense um, in terms of in plan, it's quite clear. Um, but the question for me would be, what is the experience within those circles that mm -hmm. gives you a sense of you're no longer purely inside, you're somehow inside, outside, or what gives you a sense that you have kind of transgressed or kind of crossed the given boundary? You know, I think in a way, in the elegance of the project, you have kind of obliterated the difference between what was existing and what is, um, what what you did. I think it's very seamless. Um, but I wonder what that experience would be, like how you would be able to perceive where you are in relation to the kind of the given boundary of the building. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think part of the, to answer your first question um, of like how, what the takeaways from being in this space for the visitors would be like. Um, and I think one of the main spaces that I can really speak to, of course, is this presentation space. Um, but in, in, really, in reality, it's this idea of like, it's, it's multifaceted in a sense that like, it's, it's, it's the experience you have in approaching this seemingly like monumental kind of feature area in this um in the space as well as like as you approach it you're, there's like another level of detail that you're seeing of what the materiality of these um, specific um, details are and um, individual like textures and 
the qualities of that. And then also how the lighting um, plays and interacts within that space. And, you know, especially like there's not only daylighting affecting it and constantly moving the shadows throughout the space um, of the building as well as throughout the day of the building, um, but it's also, um, there's also this like fixed artificial lighting that's also creating this other level of like texture and detail and depth um, to this, the experience of um, being within it. Um, and um, I think, I'm so sorry, the other question, the second question. Yeah, the, the other question is like, if when you're in that space, right? Like, what do you think for each of those kind of uh, bubbles that that goes beyond the boundary of the building like how is that not just codified in the planning of the project and the geometry of the plan but also in the experience of being in that space what do you imagine that to be like um because you know like in this particular perspective view of this I, mean, I see that you know you see the edge here yeah right and so that's you get some sense that there is Kind of a difference between the kind of the the interior and then the exterior maybe that's the beginning of it um mm -hmm. but i think that that's an interesting condition um and i think you know uh, and then i i will let other uh, uh reviewers speak i agree that when you were going through your images that i was so grateful to see a, a really prominent um uh element in your project that was pattern because I think it was really helpful because the floor is quite smooth and, and quite monolithic and um, and some of the kind of textures exist at a much smaller scale. So I was grateful for that. Um, I would love for you to pursue this uh, screen further. Um, you know, my question is, for example, what is this edge really like? You know, because on the one hand, it seems very thin. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I want to touch it. But is it flimsy or is it hard? If it's hard, is it like a knife head, knife's edge? Is it, if it's soft, is it droopy? Um, mm -hmm. How, you know, so I think that that's a really important maybe next step where to really kind of figure out what that is. Because I agree that the, these effects are really amazing. And I think the overall scale of the pattern is right. Um, but I think in terms of what it's kind of technical uh, expression is in mm -hmm. terms of assembly, I think that that would be re a really great next step. Um, not to undermine where it is already, but for me, that would be like a design development uh, slash kind of CD thing to obsess over because I agree with you that it's important. Sure. And I actually forgot to mention, um, there's actually a panoramic view of space um, within this area. So you're actually getting to see um, the skylight um, as well as occupying that space. So if you actually go with your phone and with the phone camera and kind of, um, hover over that, this little um, Q QR code, code um, you'll actually be able to see it in your phone. And kind of experience the space. Thank you, Mala. So I'll I'll jump in here. I agree with a lot of the comments that Igor has um, has mentioned so far. I mean, first of all, it, it is a very accomplished project. Uh, it is quite beautiful. Uh, there are definitely spaces I would like to occupy and furnishings I would like to spend some time in and have one of those amazing cups of coffee that Allison was talking about. I wish I had one of those now. Um, and I, you know, there, there's a lot, there's a lot here. There's a lot of uh, pattern and texture, especially in the, in the vertical surfaces. I wonder a little bit about the horizontal surfaces. And I think Igor also, also mentioned that when I, I look at the expression of the ceiling with the exception of these sort of domed spaces. Um, there's, there's sort of a flatness to them um, and, and sort of a, a default to uh, kind of, you know, recess ceiling cans and those sorts of things. But then where, where you put your energy is really quite fabulous. So, um, you know, I kind of wonder how you could 
how you could address the other surfaces without having to make them feel overworked, but maybe not making them feel forgotten in the process. Um, there is, I also have some of the same questions about, about the screen and I may have missed the material. What, what are, what is the scrim actually made of? It's, I'm, I, I wanted to make it out of like acoustical, um, acoustical wall panel material. So it would have some sort of acoustical property to where I know that within a space, there are some acoustical issues in presenta presentations and stuff like that. So wanted to really like surround this area as much surfaces that could really absorb the acoustical problems that, or acoustical issues that could happen within this area. So would it be would it be soft? Is it pliable? Like what is the texture of it? it? Um, so this is kind of the mini detail of it. Um, it would be a really thin surface, but it would be um, wrapped. Oops. material um and so that that's the idea um it, well it would be a really um it would be a firm surface i'm sorry i missed that it would be a wet surface it would it, it would be like a firm solid surface. okay yeah i think i'm i think i'm maybe not completely grasping that because it it looks it looks reflective in the in the way the light is hitting it, oh, um, almost yeah. like it's sort of like has a like a brassy brass quality to it or something metallic quality to it. Um, so I I mean I think that there's so much potential there and so many different things that it could be. Um, I also wonder because you are you are sort of you know we're seeing the insides and the outsides and this this kind of interlocking pattern reverses and mirrors, I, you know, there could be something really fascinating about sightedness or color um, or reflectivity on one side, but sort of not on the other side. So, you know, I don't know if that was anything at some point that you explored, but I think it's a really beautiful element of your, of your project and certainly one of the um, kind of, you know, main features that is, that makes it so attractive. I have other things I want to say, but I want Michael jump in here for a few minutes here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think on 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 I'm kind of of two minds on this one. Like on the one hand, it is a very accomplished project. I, I agree with a lot of the other comments. Um, uh, the level of um, skill and and presenting the work and and um, the the level of detail is like just it's really great. You know, like you could you can get a sense that you could present this to a client and they would they would feel confident, um, which I think is strong. I think um, I would push back a little bit, like if you're gonna take this to the next level, like I, I do question how this is clarifying their brand um, because I, I think that a next step here would actually be um, some subtraction and some editing. You know, um, there is so much pattern um, on almost every surface, uh, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not clear how those patterns are enforcing or clarifying um, what, what um, Palantir is, is trying to communicate. You know, I think, I think about the, the other brands that, that we, that we were comparing to, right? So Amazon and Facebook and, and, um, Google and you could remove the logos from all of those pavilions and all of us could walk into each one of those and know immediately which brand we were inside, you know, and I don't, I don't feel that here, you know, um, I think the one exception is possibly the kind of domed space in, in the center, which I think there's some real potential there. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a commanding and, and probably memorable space that for me feels a little bit undone by the other circles in the plan um, and the and the kind of um, it, it it's 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 a plan that is is um, it, it's a balanced in plan but I'm not sure you would feel that in reality you know I think that it would it would feel um, 
I actually think it'd feel quite tight. Um, I don't think very many people could be in here at once. Um, and so I, I think that for me, I think that thinking about that dome space and maybe making it more of the, even more the centerpiece and dialing down the other, other spaces um, or maybe making the other spaces a little bit more flexible. You know, every space can only do one thing and a big part of these pavilions is that they have to be able to be a little bit more adaptable. Um, the last thing I'll say, I, 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 did, I did one of these actually for MailChimp. Um, it's the only one I've ever done and um, they are very expensive. And this, you have designed something that is at least a million dollars, like no question. You know, it is very, very, very expensive. You have, every room has different pieces of furniture. Every room has different um, flooring and different wall treatments and like, and I think that's great, but you also, eventually you're gonna have to get to a point where you have to think about modularity, you have to think about shipping, you have to think about packing, um, you have to think about how many, you know, it's easier to order 10 of one thing than, you know, one or two of uh, things like that. So, um, and I think that maybe fits under the category of the editing note, you know, is like, you have all these beautiful selections, it really is um, commanding work, now I think is the point where you should go in and be like, what could I live without? What, what, what if certain pieces fell away? Does that actually make the thing um, feel more cohesive rather than less? Mm -hmm. yeah. Michael, I appreciate your note about the budget. <laughs> Um, well, it, and yeah. all they have to do is get one client. And it's what? For, all, they, all they need is one client and it'll pay for 10 of these. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I yeah. Know. I mean, I was, I was, when I did this one for MailChimp, I was, sh I was shocked. I mean, I just was like, what? It's going to cost that much, but it, it really, it adds up in ways that you just cannot <laughs> imagine. <laughs> I think a million, I think a million is low. <laughs> and you're probably right. Um, yeah, you're probably I mean, right. Yeah. You know, I think Brett, Michael brings up a great point about um, how, how this is reinforcing or perhaps not reinforcing in some ways the brand. And I mean, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear Mala, you mm -hmm. explain other than sort of circles and, and those sorts of very upfront types of ways that it represents the brand. Could you speak a little bit to some of the maybe atmospheric qualities or, or sort of other things that, you know, how a person feels when they're in those spaces that you believe might connect to the brand in some way? Sure. Um, from my understanding of Palantir is that they're not trying to be this really well-known public thing brand or um, not like branding exercise in that sense, but rather an exercise to be more well known to their existing clients and really reinforce qualities of work and that they provide within those clients, like have that word spread just by action versus um, action and level, you know, and delivery versus. Um, you know, more the typical marketing strategies that other firms generally use. And so I felt like the idea was more in um, not having this like glaring um, or, you know, glaringly obvious like branding of their logo in places. And I know that's not what any of you guys are meaning in terms of like, how do you reinforce the brand? But rather I wanted it to be in the subtleties of like how much, um, my my thinking and approach to this was in how do I really reinforce this like attention to detail that they have with their work and um, their product and service that can be seen and can be visually experienced within the space. It's like everything has been chosen very specifically and intentionally um, and, you know, and and how that level of attention will, if, if it exists in this, in this pavilion, um, this temporary pavilion, then obviously that will exist uh, with their work if you are working with them um, and partnering with them. 
so that was that was my idea with it um but i i definitely i it's on the <laughs> it's not obvious that it is um volunteer in terms of i mean of i think another possibility would be um to kind of engage um Kind of art curation beyond a kind of a placeholder for a single painting you know i think that brands um love to kind of um reiterate their cultural capital by um kind of engaging with contemporary art contemporary artists i mean i can imagine actually i mean if we're talking about these crazy budgets that one of these circles is made by anish kapoor I could imagine that, you know, like, but really, or that the lighting scheme is done by an artist, you know, I mean, I don't know, they could, I think that, that that could be another layer mm -hmm. that has both cultural capital and that also has atmospheric impact. Um, so I think it could go beyond this kind of hotel art, you know, to something like really impactful. So you may not have to be the one who has to do everything, but you might have to be the one to connect all the dots. Yes. And sort of this alliance with other, with other, uh, not necessarily tech companies, but with other entities or groups or people that, that mm -hmm. sort of capture that same spirit that they're hoping to exude within their space. I mean, you keep mentioning, you mentioned the word transparency and and when I, I mean, starting with the concierge space, it feels almost like you're kind of coming into this like private club mm -hmm. and it feels very insular. And so I'm curious to hear you, uh, you know, other, I know the screens give us a sense of transparency and some of those things, but how might we experience transparency in other ways? I interpreted transparency, not only in like, the more obvious sense of, yeah, like there's these channel glass screens, but um, transparency in terms of. Um, oh. You know, something that they've struggled with is the idea that they're this like black box that. Very little sense. Like I took that and to, to, to show more color, to show more. Um, to show more materiality, to show more, to have a feeling of texture and those kind of qualitative aspects as, as my idea of showing that this is, you know, when you're working with them, it isn't this like um, closed off experience, but rather this like very nuanced and like a colorful level um, and, and diversified level of experience that you actually have with them. And it's, it's not this completely, um, uh, closed environment. Mm -hmm. and that's so you're trying to give them personality is kind of what I hear you saying that they yeah. okay. okay. Um I have to move us along. I'm sorry. Does anybody have any am I am I cutting anyone off if I move us along from Mala's project? It's the whole design for deconstruction part which we haven't talked about. <laughs> That's, but that's no, that's no quick question, so. Moving along. <laughs> I, I, would, I would really, you know, I know it's at the end of the semester and you kind of finish and don't want to think about this stuff anymore, but if you do continue thinking about this project, I really, because it's so strong, I do think you have to really think about editing and the, and the, and the, the real perception of the brand and the presentation of the brand, um, because I—that's the one, the one piece of this that I don't, I don't think is is quite there yet, you know. Um, and but I think this dome, this kind of center hive, um, is the strongest element. Um, so that you could imagine, you know, when you go to their website or you go to a meeting in their office or at a different conference that there's some element of this dome that you experience. So every mm -hmm. time you're engaging with this client or with this company, you feel like, look, we all come into this circle, there's a nice light overhead and we have a conversation. You know, that is a really strong um, uh way of, of, of the, a client remembering and engaging and feeling comfortable with the brand, you know? So for me, that's what I would, um, 
I would push you to pursue um, and let some of the other um, more complex elements of the, of the piece maybe fall away a little bit. So. And, but, and I think that this is also, uh, Maladi, just kind of understanding kind of formal um, typologies also. I think if the dome is really important and it has a, an oculus on top, then is it also the same device that offers a panoramic view? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that there is something a little bit um, conflicting about this volume. If, I mean, I think it could be really taken in the direction of it being a kind of a center with an oculus, mm -hmm. but spatially that has a very, very different, um, uh, that works in a very different way from something that kind of has this kind of panorama. So if it's both, which is it that's more impactful and more memorable? You know, and I think that this is where you can, these things are conceptual, formal, and then they become branding if those things work. Um, so I would just keep an eye on that because it's not just a plan. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's how these things kind of spatially resonate. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Okay. All right, we'll have a breakout session for designing for deconstruction and your lower <laughs> level. <laughs> oh. Okay, thank you, Mala. Uh, thank thank you, you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Very nice. Great job. Congratulations, thank Mala. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just for a little uh, pre presentation orientation. We're going to be using a Prezi presentation, which, which allows us to actually zoom into these parts and components and see how these things relate from a larger scale, um, zooming into these construction details. And so for some orientation, there's going to be a, um, a number at the bottom right hand of most slides if you need to reference the construction uh, drawings from Box or also the presentation handout from Box. Um, so just, um, just for your reference. Um, but overall for this project, our goal was to provide Palantir with a space that establishes different levels of privacy and personability to harbor these trilateral connections. And just to reiterate that um, Palantir defines these connections as moments where they can facilitate these interactions between clients. And we're going to zoom into these four um, different pieces that really kind of define this thesis for us. So the spatial organization, which we've laid out in this color diagram of our plan, um, it starts with a large public gathering space off of the entry, which turns into being increasingly more semi-private. And there are pockets of space in this area that the general public is allowed to in hopes to be intrigued by the meetings that are going on. And then the lower level is only accessible to the Palantir staff. And then this render is although you are standing at the coffee bar looking out into the main public area. And so our plan is defined and organized by this wall system that we have designed, which is represented in blue and will expand upon in the next few slides. And so when you enter the building, you're greeted by the concierge where your coat will be taken and then filtered into the floating seating area where you have the option to socialize or grab a coffee at the coffee bar. The meeting rooms are on the right hand side of the plan in order to collaborate with Palantir further. Um, in our RCP, we tried to use the lighting, especially alcove lighting and more dramatic fixtures in order to break up the rhythm of the space. And now we're going to take a deep dive into some of these systems and again looking at um, this overall plan view and diving into this wall system that Lily had mentioned. Uh, these uh, systems we are calling contours and basically what these are is um, three quarter inch CNC plywood pieces that are stacked onto two to create um, a stronger kind of um, condition there but the seam is offset so these can be wrapped around column conditions and also just in general um, have more rigidity. And then also accompanying that is a um, 
one inch by two inch for an inch strip that attaches to the wall. And essentially these contour pieces will be sliding into the wall and screwed into place. So looking more at these construction details, here you can kind of see this rendered view of the entryway and what the contours would look like against this kind of normal wall condition as they wrap around the columns and there around the columns is a um, another sleeve of kind of wood and white that helps in the compression of all these members together and as you can see as well um, is the details at the top showing the different um, kind of connections of the furring strip and then also two different conditions where at five feet, six inches and above, the furring strip would be at the top and at five feet, six inches and below, the furring strip would be at the bottom to conceal that view, but also allow for disassembly later or just um, easier access. And so these images show how the switches and the outlets get integrated in between the contours. And then in order to conceal our air diffusers, we have them installed in the floor underneath the bottom contour, and then they would be open at an angle for the air to flow out underneath between that bottom contour. And then another important feature of our space is the coffee bar, which is, is easily accessible off of the main seating area, making it easily approachable with plenty of space for the barista to make the drinks and standing tables off to the side for guests to observe this process while waiting or just have a conversation or enjoy their coffee. And so the coffee bar itself is made of a plywood veneer with a marble countertop because we wanted this piece to stand out from the rest of our typical contour construction that we used elsewhere. Um, and then we also work to fit and specify the cabinetry underneath the sink for storage. This next view is a view of the presentation space, looking again at the entryway. And um, similar to Mala's presentation, you can use your phone to scan the QR code or just look at this um, version on screen. But you can see here that we wanted to use this birch color contour wood color and then have these three-dimensional acoustic ceiling tiles and use two different colors of marmalium wood or marmalium flooring um, to shine, kind of show this um, procession into the more private spaces. And so these demo screens in the presentation area, there's six six foot by one foot LED screens with the logo on the front side when you walk in and then on the back side, a uh, winds well for Palantir in order to make the public aware of all the things that they're doing to help the different people that they're partnering with. The, the fireplace was another feature we really wanted to add. It was kind of a later challenge um, in the project, but since Davo, Davos, Switzerland can reach um, temperatures around 30 degrees Fahrenheit and below. Um, we thought this would be a great feature to serve as a gathering space and also to integrate within our wall system and the language that we've been using for the contours. And so now we're going to take a look at the transitions, adaptation, and materials of our project. And so starting with the presentation furniture, when we were choosing the furniture for the public areas, we wanted comfort to be our main goal, along with aesthetics, because this is the area that everyone who enters the pavilion would be seeing. So all of the seating is very cushioned and comfortable with the side and coffee tables to feel very grounded. Uh, and then when it's time for a presentation to occur in the evening, the chairs for this are also fully upholstered. Uh, this seating is meant for people to stay for a longer time versus the standing tables in the coffee bar where people are constantly being filtered in and out of it. Um, and here is another view. Um, it is also a panoramic view as well. That's why it's slightly distorted on screen. But this is standing in the back area by the meeting rooms and the lounge spaces. And you can see there's a slightly different use of materiality in terms of using this glass curtain wall, these fringe draperies to kind of give this semi um, permeability and visibility into the spaces. And then this is a view um, of one of the meeting rooms. In particular, we are sitting in the large meeting room. And um, here you can see kind of the material finishes that we're using that is pretty consistent among most of the meeting rooms. And we're also using these pendant lightings and we have screens for Palantir to project their uh, messages and do presentations during their meetings. 
And so this is a view when you're sitting in the lounge area outside of the meeting rooms. Our intention of them was to provide a harmony between privacy and visibility, which we used a glass curtain wall with draperies on the interior to still obscure this view slightly. And when considering transitions, we were really looking at the stairs as an essential part of transition, not only from the upper level to the lower level, but also a physical transition of level changes and also um, a transition between the assembly occupation of the first floor to the business occupation of the second floor. And in this, we were really considering to how the material wraps the stairs and want to create a customized nosing, even though it's a really small detail, but just to have the ma that material be really continuous as it goes from the top to the bottom. And so downstairs in the private employee area, there's a place for private phone calls and then places for various work opportunities or for meetings. And we wanted to brighten up the space a little bit in contrast to the upper level by making some of the walls uh, this color. And lastly, we just wanted to touch on some final questions and sentiment that we both feel really strongly about because uh, during the course of this project, a lot of a lot has changed about the world and the perception of space in particular um, spaces meant for work, production, assembly, and the consideration of how these spaces might never be designed in the same way. Whenever we first came into the project, looking at these relationships between inclusive versus exclusive and private versus public, the spatial definitions of these things have changed basically overnight, and even perhaps the definition of trilateral connections now. Now we are physically separated, programmatically converging, and technologically dependent. We also feel like this new format has opened uh, new doors to presentation types and creative ways of relating to each other, but we also wonder how design will remain accessible to those who cannot depend so much on this technology we also wonder uh, about the question of aesthetics versus function and how that will play a role in the future of design. And lastly, we wonder how these factors will define exposed, enclosed, and other kind of um, interdisciplinary terms. And all of this is seemingly out of reach to us at times, but people more than ever need connection, understanding, and empathy. And this is why we believe there's no better time to be an interior designer. Did you guys finish? Oh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> so I think um, to jump in, I think uh, you know another comprehensive project, which is great. There's so much to talk about. Um, but uh, just to to zoom out for a second, like um, uh, you're pitching to a client who has a lot of money you know, and they hear tons of pitches all the time. So you guys told us what you did, but I don't know why you did it, you know? So I, if you could back up and zoom out a little bit and, and maybe say a few words about why this solution, what, particularly the, maybe the wall panels um, is right for the brand of Palantir. I'll say that I feel like um, what we really want to try to do is bring something that also speaks to the um, kind of a more natural and Swedish vernacular in some ways, but also still has a very kind of clean, uh, clean lines and kind of unique forms that kind of bring people through the space and really pulls them through the space and um, kind of has a, a hybrid between the kind of tech environment and also like a natural aesthetic. Yeah, I think the contours were working for us in a positive way in kind of filtering people through the space. And then the way we built off of the contour to start designing the curtain walls and other aspects began to open up different opportunities for different types of meetings and interactions between the people. Yeah, I mean, but you're still, you're still speaking about the contours in terms of 
how people move in the space versus how they ref reflect the brand, you know? So, so getting to speak, a, you know, you touched a little bit on this kind of like um, Swedish naturalism or cleanliness or like that's where you're starting to get into language that a client um, can maybe better relate to, you know? So like, just to, you know, mention some of my own experience, like when I pitched the job for MailChimp, I said, your booth is going to be like putting on a set of headphones. You know, when someone comes in, the, everything else is getting shut out, you know, and I think that I'm still not clear on on what about what about these panels is what 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 is right for Palantir. I'm not disagreeing with them. I just I'm 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 not I, I just I'm not sure what what that why is. I think we were also trying to find a combination between like something that is beautiful and simple, but not overpowering with their logo. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, maybe you want to continue to answer this question or I can bail you out for a moment and we can come back to it because I think that it's uh, I think that it's important question but maybe difficult to answer on the spot if you don't have if you're not ready for it so keep thinking about it um, because I think it's an important prompt um, I really enjoyed seeing all your perspectives in one slide at the very end mm -hmm. Because I think in a way when those striations carry through the whole project, you can begin to imagine the experience of being in it and the way that it kind of adds up. Um, I would say that when you, um, and I should have prefaced this by saying that this is an incredibly accomplished project and you did a really good job and all of that. So please know <laughs> that, you know, we're being, I'm being a little bit nitpicky knowing that the project is in a really good place. I think you've brought for, you know, forward um, a, a proposal that um, has made, I think, a, a strong connection between, um, a, a, let's say, a kind of a design solution, a, a, a concept and its technical resolution. So I think, um, I think that that works for me. Um, and I think that everyone would agree with that. Um, in, in looking at your individual images, I question some of the material choices um, and how those material choices align with the intention of the brand or with the intention of um, being in this en environment. Um, like for example, um, when you mention like Marmolian, I'm thinking, are they talking about a kindergarten all of a sudden? <laughs> like, where did these material choices come from? You know, so on the one hand, I understand that it has to do with color. It has to do maybe with some ideas about sustainability. Um, but is it really the right pairing of material for the type of environment that this is? Um, and is it really right that it, 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 that the ribs are really plywood. I mean, why not? But at the same time, it's not Urban Outfitters. It's a, it's a different kind of brand. So I think that, you know, some of the, for me, some of the, the, the kind of the, the, the spatial um, definition of the project works well in terms of um, organization, in terms of patterning. I understand the assembly. But I would, I would question some of the material choices and how they kind of broadcast the connection to the client and the intention behind the experience that you want. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that made any sense. I, um, I think it did. Yeah, I, I, I'm following you, Igor. <laughs> I mean, Sorry, there's... it's been a long few days. <laughs> <laughs> there's plywood and then there's plywood, right? So, I mean, it could be it could be edge banded, it could be, you know, not, not the urban outfitter kind of approach and, uh, you know, not quite so raw, uh, depending on what sort of approach you took to it. But I, I think the ribs are quite, are quite beautiful. And especially when they're set against um, a dark background and you've got the lighting, the sort of picking up the edges of it. I keep wanting the ribs to do more. 
like I, if, and especially for thinking about them kind of circling back to Michael's talk about, or, or sort of comment about, you know, well, how do you really get a client to, to buy into this and how is it representing the client and, and the brand? I mean, there could be an idea about sort of seamlessness and about um, integration and about, um, you know, you can, you can sort of, you, it, it comes across as a certain, a certain feeling or a certain meaning to it. Um, and the more that it does, the more integrated that it becomes, I think that, um, and you, you are integrating it, like, you know, yes, there's the light switches and there's the, the AC and, and those sorts of things, but in terms of how is it integrated into the space, it does start to, to create, um, you know, starting to define space, but could it start to define datums within the space? Could it, I mean, you mentioned, you know, wanting the bar to be a separate element, but and maybe there are certain things that are certain things that are separate elements that definitely sort of stand out as different. But then, what about all the sort of in between things? Um, could it could it do more for you? And could aspects of it start to pull out and form seating or start to form, um, you know, some of these other spaces with a little bit more transparency? So that there are just fewer systems, like there are lots of different systems here that I think you could actually edit down into just a couple systems. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think there's there's something powerful about the, the wall system, but it's always full height, you know, it never drops down to be a bench or a counter or to have some slots missing where it can be where there's a monitor or something like, you know, um, and then it, system wise, you're right, it, it's like fighting a little bit against like the glazing or glass or screen system where the offices are, you know. Um, for me, like when I see something like this um, contour system, what you're telling the uh, someone who's coming in or a poten potential client is you're saying like, you're in our world now, like everything is now, um, connected, you know, um, everything is contiguous, like, you know, we have our own language, you know, and the, it, that language is about seamlessness and connectivity. And, you know, you could make up any story you want here with that. Um, but that that is the kind of um, the, the narrative power of making a choice like you've made. Um, and I, I agree, I think that it it, it just feels like a clever wall system versus something that is um, what the entire space is, is built around. Is that anything you all explored, um, Lily and Shay, at some point? Was it, has it always been to this extent or was it, was it less so or maybe perhaps more extensive earlier on? What's been the evolution of it across the project? It definitely has gone through a lot of different phases. Um, I think between mid review and now, we did sort of refine it and we did consider going in the direction to where the contour starts to become everything basically and it turns into the seating and it turns into the coffee bar. But um, we just decided that wasn't working as well as having the elements more separated. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps somewhere somewhere in between could be could be a really um, a really would be a really great next move to it because I'm I'm all for there being some separate elements. I just think a few of the systems, like maybe the ceiling system or some of the furnishings or some of those things, could be that are already kind of built in anyway, could be integrated into this. Um, and then I think you could spin, you could certainly spin a narrative around that, but I think it's more than just a narrative. I really think that you feel that, you experience that in the space. Um, I can already tell that it's very convincing from the, from the perspectives that you're showing. So, and again, I think it's a, it's a very, very accomplished project. I think for a detail that you've developed for Design 6, which is a very challenging studio anyway, um, you know, where we're asking you to resolve something, you've definitely done that. 
um, and in quite an elegant way. And you've really thought about some very small details um, that you know are very thoughtful. And so I, you know, I think our comments are really saying that because it is quite accomplished, we're able we're we're able to say we'd like to see even more of it, right? Um, so it's, it's definitely, uh, building on what you've already accomplished and what you, what you're showing us so far. You know, maybe just also, this is a moment for you to kind of reflect on the kind of the effects that your project is producing. Um, for example, I love the, the kind of the third, uh, perspective in the second row where I'm starting to get a sense of depth, like there is something in the foreground, and then there is this kind of vertical system in the middle ground, and then there is something in the background. And it makes me want to um, look at your kind of your ribbed, your kind of banded um, wall system in the same way in, re in terms of what's in front of it and then what's behind it. Because I think as a kind of screen, it promises this kind of mystery on the one hand, on the other hand, it's a datum, right? It's a consistent kind of element that you track as your body and your eyes move through the space. And so how do you know where you are along this kind of journey, right? You will know it by either understanding what's in front of the screen or what's behind the screen. And this is, I think, where you could continue to think about things like lighting and color and materiality, and maybe even question whether another system, which is vertical, needs to compete with it. You know, because I think, in a way, the most compelling thing about understanding kind of uh, in a kind of painterly way, right? This kind of like foreground, middle ground, background is the image where you actually don't have the system in the picture. Right. And so I think that that's you might be able to kind of edit the project from the point of view of experience and just kind of thinking about what is that screen revealing or concealing and what is it a data for. Right. How do you how does it help you know where you are within your project as you move through it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's interesting to think about. I also wonder, uh, building on what Igor is saying, how it might also be able to be a point of where some of these interactions happen. So, you know, looking at where the fireplace is sort of integrated in, you know, you know that's going to be a point of interaction. People are going to naturally gravitate to that to that section and sort of stand and, and sort of be nearby to that um, particular part of your of your rib system. So could there be other ways that it could start to, you know, I'm, I'm also imagining these sorts of places like, you know, this part of the world is like a standing cafe kind of place uh, where, you know, it's quite often to get your, get your espresso or your nice cup of coffee and not sit. So, and, and sort of use the wall system to undulate outward uh, where you could, you could sort of lean against it or you could put your things against it or on it. Um, you know, there's when you're at these kinds of things, it always feels like you need a place to put something. You know, where can I set my phone down? Where can I, where can I just kind of like stand and prop myself up for a minute? Um, and so, you know, even if you kind of took it into this place of like, okay, well, how could it help promote or prompt certain interactions? Because that's what this space is all about. You know, could, so I would just be, you know, when you develop these kinds of systems, because you put so much energy into them um, and, and a lot of, you know, manufacturing and fabricating into, into putting them into the world, push them to do what they can do for you. Um, not only from, a, from an assembly and sustainability point of view, um, but from an atmospheric point of view, from a functional point of view, um, programmatic point of view. So just, you know, really push it and explore it. It shouldn't, it doesn't have to do everything. It doesn't have to be a Swiss army knife, um, but, but it can do a lot for you. And, and what do you accept that it can do and what do you let go of? I, thank you, Tammy. I think that that's a, actually a really nice um, summary comment for everyone too, about the level of accomplishment that we see here as far as bringing it down to the construction detail, um, but also still to always look back at that initial concept 
man, I mean, I'm with you, Igor. They're like, I can't help. Like, I really need to jump in and like rescue Lily and Shay are so good at just sitting and accepting criticism. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we had countless conversations about the why, you know? And one of the things I really appreciate is that as we talked about those things that were, they're very narrative driven. Like we were saying, like Michael, you were saying like you can say anything, right? Um, but they never, they never went to metaphor. And I think it's a difficult thing to walk that line when you're talking about establishing something that could be used as a brand um, to, not, to not use metaphor to sell it, right? And so this whole idea of taking a traditional wall system and pulling it away, at a point in our conversations, we became like, what if this is just a new brand? What if this is just a new thing? And it's so memorable, um, kind of like we were saying with Mala, it's, just, it's so memorable, you walk away like, that's what it is. And that's all that it has to be. And so um, they, I guess when you're on your final review, that's not a good answer. It is what it is. <laughs> that's not a good answer. <laughs> so only I can say that. Yeah. I mean, you're really like, you're saying we never associate wood with tech. Just a pure, like a simple association. Those things are totally. never together. So you're saying for Palantir, that wood and plywood, particularly, you know, a cheap wood is associated with a very expensive tech company. So if you're going to make that um, connection, it has to be really clear why and, and how you're in uh, maybe upending people's expectations of what wood can do and therefore what Palantir can do, you totally. know. So I think the, that's, that, great. that has to be, I mean, th th those kinds of stories are what these brands pay for. That is what it's all about. If you cannot answer that question, you can't get another meeting. Like that's just, it's at the heart of how these, it's just, it's just so important. <laughs> and, and I think that's such good advice. And I think, and I think that the, to do it well, so yeah. that later on, you don't have to hang a sign that says what the narrative is, right? To yeah. do it well. So that the, the last impression is the total buy-in of everybody working there and then therefore all the visitors. It's, it's one of those things too, uh, you know, just anecdotally, the effort that goes into this pavilion is so unique actually to the experience of, of these other pavilions there. And, and yeah. to the point where I was witness to a conversation of a CEO was like, you need to get so-and-so over here to look at what they've done. We need to do better next year. Yeah. Like that was that, and that was a very strong directive. And so it's, it is by and large about being memorable. And I, I think your advice is, is completely uh, spot on though about being able to not just show, but tell as well, so. Yeah, and you like, you know, one way to do it guys is to, to, to share this project with um, some people who don't know it and say, here's the logo, here's the space. What do you think this brand is about? And get and get that feedback, and you will see very clearly what people what people's impression of the brand is without knowing what they do. And then you can look at that list, and you can say, well, these are the areas where we nailed it. Yeah, we wanted it to come across as sleek, or we wanted it to come across as, you know, modern. But these are the other things that people are saying that we didn't want. You know, why are they saying those things? And is there anything about the project that we could edit so that we recalibrate? what the visitor, what the client, what the first time person is gonna feel and think when they come into this space. And I think that this is an interesting conversation that follows what um, the students said at the conclusion of their presentation, which is um, that you made this kind of opposition between function and aesthetics. And I think that this conversation illuminates that it's impossible to actually separate the two um, that there is the aesthetics of function that can actually be quite misleading. And then there is also the function of aesthetics, right? And at the end of the day, like the world does not need this pavilion. You know, this is not housing. This is not, you know, the world does not need any of this. And so it's actually impossible to be so pure about what is functional and um, and what is um, an, an aesthetic experience, right? Because the the two, the kind of the question of use and the question of aesthetic quality, those things are so intertwined. And in our world, it's impossible in some ways to 
disentangle the difference between the, what's essential and what's superfluous, right? It's so much more complicated than that. And I think that you might want to address some of the discussion that your project has inspired, which I think is wonderful, by kind of acknowledging that these um, kind of binary distinctions are impossible. And how can you kind of navigate um, making desi design decisions knowing that it's impossible to kind of separate one from the other, right? I mean, I think that that's where it gets, that's, that's where what you're doing gets really interesting. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Igor. I think that's nice. And I, 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 I think that it's, um, well, that sitting on your final reviews when you were not my students last semester and then into this semester as well, there seems to be a pattern of your projects spurring conversations larger than the seemingly the project that you presented. So mm -hmm. um, I, I really want to take this chance uh, to thank the two of you, the energy uh, the fun that you put into this, that you guys, I mean, I, I I'm, don't even have to tell the reviewers the um, enjoyment levels that, that Shay and Lily had collaborating on this project. They just, mm -hmm. they loved it. They ran with it and they said, can we do this? And can we try this? Um, and so please keep up your energy. Um, we, as, as a member of the rest of the world, need it to continue. So mm -hmm. it's, um, so thank you for your project. It's, it's really been, wonderful to see. Yes, thank you. Published. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for all the feedback. Congratulations, Shay and Lily. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. And then to our reviewers, um, I'm so glad we only had two and there was so much to talk about. Um, we would have been <laughs> after hours here. And especially now for real good morning to you, Michael. Now it's almost a decent Yeah, the sun, yeah. The sun just the came The sun out. has risen wow. in Australia. Yeah. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I hope you have a nice day and to our other reviewers, thank Thanks. you. And I hope you have a nice evening. Um, but uh, thank you for your feedback. The con I really enjoyed the conversation today. It's, it's we've 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 touched on all areas of what design can do from um, from branding and messaging to policy about when you should not design for someone and say no to your professor I won't design for that <laughs> entity to um, to just like lovely discussions about strategies of where you put mechanical work so I think that we've had a lot of nice uh, feedback today and it's it's really stretched the gamut of what we discussed. Um, over the course of the semester. So um, thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your time. And thank you for your time. And, and to the students, thank you for all of your time. <laughs> um, and I'm not letting the students go yet. I'm actually, so what, what we are going to do is we have twofold. I guess that I should have told everyone, but we do have another, I don't know if you can see in the gallery, we do have our um, Palantir partner here. And so I do, we'll, we'll let our reviewers go and we'll just chat with her a little bit. And then um, I do actually want to show them what the pavilion looked like on the interior. They've never seen it, what they built out this year. So I do want to show them. It's not the right answer. It was just what was built this year. I just so, wanted okay. to say one thing before we go, which is also, yes. Allison, congratulations to you. I think you oh, did a remarkable you. job with the studio. Uh, and I had a chance to see all the projects um, in their, um, you know, in the, in the, in the course folder. Um, what a fantastic studio. Thank you so much. Um, this is such a huge contribution to our program and such a huge contribution to the learning experience of our students, both undergraduate and graduate. And I'm really delighted to see all of this. So really well done. Well, thank you. That means a lot. And we have Marla here too. And I would be remiss to not say that she did not carry so much burden of our studio as well. So thank you to Marla. Thank you, Marla. Uh, thank you so much. Phenomenal. And thanks to the students for your beautiful work. Yeah, I definitely. want to know if, uh, if you continue to have your yoga sessions. There, she posts them on our Canvas page. I can invite you to our Canvas page. Yes, yes, Michael. So we did, instead of tea time on Fridays, we would have tea time and Marla would lead everybody in yoga. Um, because the idea was strong mental health this semester and just to get through uh, 
Thank you, Marla. Technical things, so. yeah. You guys are welcome. It was <laughs> yes. fun. It was good for me too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a it's a um, a fun studio to teach when you have students like this. So. Yeah, it was a great group. Awesome. Well, Allison congratulations, Marla. everyone. Great yeah, job, Allison great. and Marla. Thank you so much. And uh, I know the challenge that the studio presents both from the teaching and the student side of it. And you all did just such an amazing job. Yeah. Thank you. It's a, it's a tough, tough semester and such a strange one on top of that. So congratulations, everybody. Yeah. The students did an amazing job. I mean, it's, it's really amazing the amount of work that you guys put out and the amount of time that you did. So it's been a great experience. Um, well, thank you. And then just before we let you go, Michael, uh, can you plug your new show that you're working on? <laughs> um, kind of. I mean, the the one, um, there's one out now called Dare Me um, that, that is out on USA Network that I did that's, it takes place in small town, Ohio. Um, and then the one that I was four weeks from finishing on um, is called Hit and Run, um, which who knows when that will be out um, because uh, we didn't finish um, and we were shooting in uh, Tel Aviv. So um, um, we have uh, we have no idea. I mean, I, I think what's so interesting about this project is and and how the you know the students you know you really stayed in there because you're working in you're working on a project that is kind of impossible to execute right now, right? Like no one is going to events. Um, so I commend you all for, you know, continuing to um, uh, be optimistic about that coming back. And, you know, the same for the film industry, we're in the same boat. We just cannot um, work because it is, it's impossible for us to do our job right now. So uh, I can relate in, in that way, so. <laughs> Well, stay strong. Yeah. And you guys should actually all go follow Michael on Instagram because he's been doing this great thing for your past couple of feeds where he'll even just do a side by side comparison of the location and then the film shot. And then he'll talk about all of the contributors and the collaborators that make that go into that scene, just starting with like, I think the one scene was like from the football field and what it turns yeah. into things they look for the way that color impacts the space and lighting impacts the space. So for this crew in particular, I think that you would actually really appreciate a lot of. And that. we'll we'll find a way to uh, rope you into something when uh, we can resume travel. Yeah, yeah totally. that would be great. When you come back to North America, we'd love to have you uh, come visit us again. In uh, yeah, I'd love to. I love Austin. I'd love to be back for sure. Yeah, yeah. I know yeah. we will we'll, have. We'll to... make sure to make that happen somehow. I know we'll have to fight John Blood for him, but but I'm really strong and I'm not scared of him. So <laughs> we'll fight him. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys so much. It was great to Thank talk you, with you. Thank you, Michael. All. It was so good to see yeah. you. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah, nice Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you.